It's better. Okay, let's start. H hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for support along this this two years and a half after the first postponement postponement due to the pandemic. So, uh, forgot the pandemic. We are here. We are in the lad waves. So, uh, I I don't find another uh, better way. Open this, this, uh, presentation that is well. Thank you, Dr. Jose. We just is facing to the, to the west, are blowing from the east, and any, any chance. Any chance of, of swells is blocked. Any chance of swells is blocked by this, this salient called uh, Punta Carretas. Uh, over there, it will be the, the lunch and over there, it will be, the, there will be the, the conference dinner. So, uh, with a uh, wind from the east and, and no swells, no waves, no wave today at, at this point, but when we have uh, uh, winds from the southwest west quadrant, we, we, we have waves. Waves, of course, limited by fetch, limited by fetch, uh, 100 kilometers fetch, and limited by depth, depth in the, in the Rio de la Plata are uh, 20 meters depth in the outer Rio de la Plata, and then 20, 10 meter depths and, and, and uh, lower values if we go to the upper Rio de la Plata. So we have these wind seas, but when we have these this wind directions and strong winds, we have uh, these this, this waves over there, just a, a a, a, a few meters from here that can reach a, a significant weight height of 2.5 in extreme events like, like, like this one. So another uh, feature of this, of this environment is the, uh, the cohesive sediments. The, 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 the bottom is a, is a, is a mud bottom. It's a mud bottom, so I uh, recommend the the last talk of of of, of this of this day that is is going to to talk a little about uh, an, an experiment that uh, study uh, an experiment that that study the interaction between. Uh, current waves and this uh, mud bottom. So, if we go to the to the to the to the east, there are uh, some chances to to see swells. And today, with with uh, uh, eastern winds, we are going to to see wind seas. And this this probably. Uh, in this point or near this point is the first wave spectra measurements that we have in this area with a wave rider buoy. Um, 
uh, Walter Dragani that is here, work a lot with this, this data and in his presentation of, uh, I think, tomorrow, or 28, he is going to talk about some results on uh, how well it reproduces the wave height, right? Um, uh, but then it's uh, uh, it's a balance of all the source functions, right? So you can get the wind input uh, uh, off, right? Uh, and uh, if your dissipation is off by uh, as, uh, as much, uh, then the balance is okay, and you get the wave height uh, uh, more or less correctly, right? But uh, then it is not suitable uh, if you want to couple your wave models, which is a popular trend uh, these days with uh, uh, the uh, ocean circulation models or air interaction models or climate models, right? Because um, uh, <coughs> then uh, the fluxes uh, uh, which the waves exchange with the wind above them and with the ocean below them have to be correct if you put the uh, coupled uh, 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 <coughs> uh, if, if you put the wave models into the coupled environments, um, the fluxes have to be correct. And if your uh, validation of the wave models is based on bulk calibrations, you cannot by any means guarantee that. In fact, uh, in most cases, they are incorrect. And of course, as time goes by, right, uh, there, are, uh, there is a demand uh, for more accurate forecast and hindcast, which is also popular these days. People produce massive hindcast. Uh, databases uh, which are used for all sorts of uh, applications including climatology uh, right uh, so the models uh, have to be advanced as um, far uh, as uh, uh, far as we uh, advance our knowledge of the physics uh, behind them um, uh, and uh, if in the past um, uh, the main concern of the wave models was to predict some storm conditions right so you know what you deal with um, uh, in uh, bad weather but now uh, uh, wave models uh, used for everything swell for example, all right, may not be dangerous conditions for something, right? But um, it's uh, dangerous conditions for something else, uh, like tankers, for example, or dredges cannot operate in swell. So the models um, are used for pre uh, predicting swell as well. And uh, uh, well, if you use the same model to predict um, the swell in the wind-generated waves, and the swells uh, they were generated by the wind some time ago, right? But right now they don't interact with the wind; they don't break. So uh, performance of the same model, uh, if it's not based on solid physics, um, is questionable. And of course, uh, we went uh, now these ga days, we go all the way to predicting waves in extreme conditions uh, like uh, hurricanes or like a marginal ice zone. So the developments of uh, the uh, physics have to go on and have to continue. So the field experiment, right? And this is an old um, uh, field experiment. That's where uh, it all started, um, uh, funded by the uh, ONR, US Office of Naval Research, uh, in the 1990s, right? Um, uh, at Lake George in Australia, he's Australia, and Lake George is uh, near Canberra. That's how it looks like. And uh, on the east side of Lake George, we had this site, right? Um, uh, observational site. The uh, advantage of uh, uh, doing measurements um, uh, in the lake, you don't have very big waves, right? Um, uh, you don't have swells. Um, and uh, uh, you can use laboratory precision instruments, right, for in situ measurements. But uh, it's not laboratory. So the wind, uh, everything else is natural, right? It's, um, uh, it's in situ. Uh, and, um, uh, of course, uh, in the lake with the bottom proximity, we had uh, could have a very broad range of wind forcing conditions from U over CP1 to U over CP8. That's the ratio of the wind speed and the phase speed of the weights, right? Uh, and uh, large U over CP, uh, that means very, very strong wind forcing. Uh, now, the, uh, I said that um, it's possible to measure, right? And I will concentrate here uh, only on measurements uh, of uh, a, the a wind input uh, and um, a, the dissipation. Now, the wind input can be measured directly, perhaps uh, the only source function which can uh, directly be measured um, in laboratory. It's difficult in the field, it's even more difficult, but um, uh, it's possible to measure directly. With the dissipation, there are tricks, right? You have to think how you actually measure the di di dissipation, right? If the wind input, um, uh, this is uh, uh, what uh, you want to measure, how uh, much the spectrum changes uh, uh, in time, right? Uh, and uh, if you follow this um, uh, simple formulation, which I took from uh, the book of Yen Yang, basically you want to measure the pressure right at the surface, right? That's the pressure uh, induced by the waves uh, themselves in the air and uh, the slope of the surface, right? If you can measure that simultaneously, right? Then you can directly get uh, the energy flux or the momentum flux um, uh, from the wind to the waves. And that's what we call 
uh, the wind input. And uh, if you go do that uh, for waves with different scales, right, with different frequencies, you get the full spectrum um, uh, of uh, the wind input. What we are uh, always interested in are is this gamma, which is the fractional non-dimensional uh, growth um, of um, a, the wave energy density in the spectrum per unit of time, right? So we need gamma, right? That's what we put um, uh, in uh, the wind input in the wave forecast models, right? That's its uh, non-dimensional formulation in terms of the wave spectrum. And if you measure quadrature spectrum, right? So you simultaneously measure the pressure at the surface and the surface itself. But from the surface, you need the slope, right? So you take the 90 degree shift. So uh, if you do those measurements, you get quadrature spectrum. It gives you directly gamma, right? This is what uh, we need uh, for the wind input. Um, uh, and um, uh, that is possible to measure. Do I go forward? Yes, I go forward. And uh, um, how do I start the video? Can you click on the video, right? <clears throat> So that's the device, right? Uh, there is a pressure sensor right here, right? It knows where the surface is because there are wires which measure the surface elevations. That's uh, simultaneously the wave measurements. And you have these um, uh, simultaneous measures, uh, measurements uh, of the pressure um, uh, and um, uh, the surface elevation. So that gives you uh, the uh, wind input. And uh, uh, this is the picture of uh, me, 20 years younger. Uh, and uh, Mark Donalan, who brought um, this um, a wave follower uh, from the University of Miami to Lake George. All right, uh, now <coughs> we measure gamma, right? I, I told you we, if we have quadrature spectrum, we can uh, estimate gamma, we have it, right? The next thing is uh, to do the parameterization, right? So you have the measurements. How do you describe uh, the wind input, right? At the time, and until now, I must say, um, a, a, the gamma is considered a function of the wind speed, right? And typically it's uh, a, a presented in the, some form like that, U over C. U is the wind speed, C is the speed of the waves at the particular frequency, right? So if the wind uh, is much faster than the waves, it puts a lot of energy into these waves, right? If the wa wind uh, propagates with the same speed as the waves, right? Then for these waves, there is no wind. They propagate in the uh, still air, right? I, obviously, they can't get any uh, energy from this wind, right? That's uh, uh, um, expressed uh, kind of um, uh, uh, phenomenologically over here. U over C minus 1 is uh, the parameter, right? So when U uh, over C equals 1, so the phase speed uh, um, uh, of the waves is the same as the phase speed of the wind, uh, then um, this becomes zero, right? Then there is no gamma, uh, is, uh, there is no input from uh, the wind to the waves. And that's how uh, the uh, traditionally gamma is uh, param was parameterized um, uh, in the wind input functions, right? Now we have these uh, measurements, the data points. Clearly you can see that for this parameter you cannot draw any single dependence through these points, right? So obviously this parameter dependence of um, a, the wave growth on the wind only is not sufficient, right? So we introduced um, a steepness, right? Uh, so uh, the wave growth depends also, it's logical now that I, you know that, it uh, depends also on the steepness of the waves. So the steeper waves grow faster, right? And once you, we introduce the steepness, we still see that um, uh, the uh, data points um, uh, uh, collapse into different two different groups, but at least they make physical sense now, right? Because for each group, if you extend uh, uh, the dependence, it crosses zero when the wind is zero, right? So the wind's uh, input stops uh, uh, when uh, 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 the wind is zero, uh, whereas uh, uh, in traditional for, um, uh, parameterization, the uh, wind input uh, uh, it would stop uh, uh, based on the uh, observational data when the wind is still not zero, right? So obviously uh, this extra parameter is needed. In our case, uh, that was uh, a steepness of the waves, right? Um, uh, but uh, we still have to deal with two different groups, right? Uh, what is uh, uh, special uh, 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 between these uh, two different groups of uh, experimental uh, data point? These are moderate winds, these are strong winds, right? So. Um, uh, from uh, looking at that, you can conclude uh, that um, uh, at strong winds, the waves um, uh, still grow faster if the wind is, is increasing, but not as fast as if you just uh, extrapolated the measurements at the moderate winds, right? So uh, we brought those two group, um, uh, groups of data together through this um, uh, 
a, <clears throat> a heavy side function, right, which is kind of slows down um, a, a when the wind gets uh, stronger. And um, a, I a, don't want to go through all the details now, but there is explanation for that, right? It's uh, like when the wind is very strong uh, and um, I, the waves are very steep, there is full flow separation. The wind goes over the steep crest and um, uh, 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 separates, right? And does not reattach itself until um, it um, meets the next crest, right? So the uh, wind flow does not know that the waves are this big. It, it thinks that the waves are this big and that slows down relatively uh, the wind input um, uh, and um, uh, the wave growth. Uh, at extreme conditions when the wind is very strong. And ultimately that leads um, uh, to uh, the saturation of the sea drag as one of the reasons, right? There are many reasons um, uh, for the saturation of the sea drag, which is a big topic in the hurricane model and we all know about that. But this uh, uh, just happens uh, automatically once uh, you um, uh, uh, extrapolate um, uh, the parameterizations based on these measurements, um, uh, which we did at Lake George. So uh, I showed you just one uh, new feature, uh, uh, which uh, we found uh, in the uh, measurements uh, of the uh, wind input in this uh, uh, field experiment. And there were more new features. And the good thing about the observations about experiments in uh, general, right, that um, um, uh, you see these features which you cannot expect, uh, cannot predict if uh, you only uh, base uh, your model development uh, on analytical considerations, on the theories, right? This is like full flow separation. Now people um, um, have theories for that, right? But uh, until it's observed exper um, experimentally, nobody had that in the wave models, right? But obviously it's needed. The dependence of uh, waves on steepness uh, is needed. Uh, the uh, uh, slowdown of the wind input at extreme condition is something that uh, we need in order to um, explain what happens in the hurricanes and so on. So uh, uh, now in uh, ST6, um, we have this um, uh, wind input function, which has uh, these uh, new physical features, uh, right? And uh, uh, one thing which I, uh, I want to mention here, right, is like when people talk about uh, to me about uh, ST6 um, uh, and ask me, uh, can we tune down the uh, wind input coefficient, right? Because the waves which I, I see in this location compare with the boys are too big. Right uh, or the other way around. I tell them no, you can't do that. Right? These coefficients were measured, right? It's uh, uh, and um, uh, therefore, if you use a C6 package, the coefficients uh, are there. They are not subject to tuning, right? Uh, you just take it off the shelf um, and use it as it is. And um, uh, once again, the formulation for the wind input, right? Five minutes. I haven't even started dissipation fucker, right? So I'll have to go very quickly about that, right? So one thing which um, uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, remember uh, about here, the uh, uh, wind input um, uh, function, right, is the function of the wave spectrum. So if you have wave spectrum, you know what the wind input will be, provided that you know gamma, right? This, uh, this uh, growth parameter. And we measured gamma, right? Now, uh, in the past, um, uh, the uh, dissipation was designed in the same way, right? It's uh, like inverse wind input. It's proportional, pro proportional to the spectrum, but um, uh, with negative sign. It's inverse. So, it's, say, say, if the coefficient is 20% smaller, right, uh, then uh, whatever goes into the waves, 20% will stay in the waves, right? And 80% will dissipate. But that's not how the dissipation function works. And uh, in order to measure the dissipation, right, we had to go uh, through uh, all sorts of tricks because how do you measure the uh, amount of energy lost in the wave breaking process where the wave breaking doesn't even uniformly cover the entire surface, right? It happens, it happens here um, and there. We developed um, uh, two uh, methods uh, based uh, on the acoustic measurements um, uh, under the surface. Uh, the first method is uh, using spectrograms which is uh, in the uh, top right corner uh, over here. That's the sound from the breaking waves, right? Uh, you clearly hear the uh, breaking waves, right? Uh, and you put a hydrophone uh, in the water, you can measure uh, that sound. And um, when the waves are breaking uh, at uh, the spectrograms, you see the dark crests uh, like that, which means there is an uh, intensive sound uh, with the frequency from uh, 100 hertz to 4 kilohertz, something like that. So this indicates uh, uh, the breaking uh, indicates the breaking waves for us. 
And if you have simultaneous records of um, the surface elevation, you know which wave is breaking, right? And uh, uh, you can figure out uh, the uh, <coughs> a frequency uh, of the breaking of uh, occurrence, right? So you know how often uh, the waves break in, and uh, once we um, <coughs> uh, uh, looked at the dependence of the breaking probability, right? This is probability from zero to one hundred percent. We uh, see that um, uh, the waves uh, probability uh, prob uh, wave breaking probability has some thresholds. The waves don't break if the steepness is below some level, 0 0.055, right? It's kind of obvious. Right, it's because if you look at swell, right, uh, the swell en wave energy is not zero here, but swell is not breaking. We uh, all know that. But the wave dissipation functions in the past were not designed um, uh, to account for this, right? Uh, as I said, if the wind input looks like that, the wave dissipation functions in the past looked like the uh, negative version of the wind input, right? Still proportional to the spectrum, right? So for the dissipation to become zero, spectrum has to become zero, right? But uh, what about swell? Spectrum is not zero here, right? The waves don't break. So the, actually, you need a different uh, formulation for the dissipation function, right? Um, uh, <coughs> which uh, uh, allows for that. And then it becomes uh, a, a very different uh, from um, a <coughs> what um, a you uh, have for the wind input, right? Instead of proportional to the spectrum, it's now proportional to the spectrum minus some threshold value, right? Uh, <coughs> the waves don't break if the spectrum is below this threshold value, right? And uh, I don't have time to talk um, in details about that, but in dissipation, uh, there is also a cumulative term, right? Uh, uh, and uh, we found that, based on observations in Lake George, found necessary to have this, uh, this term uh, for the dissipation, uh, in the dissipation function to explain the behavior of the wave breaking. Um, uh, um, in the fields with the full spectrum and of the dissipation. Basically, what it means that um, if the, you have the waves this big, right, and this is the peak of the waves, right, there are no longer waves, the spectrum is still developing. They break for due to whatever natural reasons, the modulation stability, I believe, right? Now, if uh, in the spectrum you have much longer waves, then what happens to these waves? They still break due to whatever natural reasons, but they also break because they're modulated by these bigger waves. Right, uh, and uh, if as the waves develop, there are waves even longer and longer and longer, and these waves, right, at this particular scale, will be breaking because of their natural reasons and because they're modulated by waves twice as long, three times as long, five times as long. So the breaking at this scale uh, is an integral of um, uh, the entire wave spectrum, right? So we have a cumulative term, I uh, introduced cumulative term in um, uh, our physics um, uh, over here, right? And then uh, this dissipation function, of course, becomes very, very different to the, the uh, dissipation uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, to the wind uh, input function, right? And in order to balance them, uh, them you really have to get everything right. So these are my conclusions about um, uh, the uh, the uh, new features of uh, uh, the uh, white cap and dissipation. That's the threshold and the cumulative term. I'd better move on. Um, uh, uh, by the way, this is just a slide to show you that um, I, and uh, this is brand new paper, right? Uh, my student uh, has it just accepted in JPO a couple of uh, months ago, where we actually measured the dissipation function across the spectrum for the first time, right? How can you do that, right? Um, if uh, you measure the bubble um, a, a production by the a spectrum and you know when the breaking happens, the size of the bubble also tells you uh, how much energy the wave lost uh, when it was breaking, you put those together, you get uh, the uh, measurements of the spectral dissipation function. And um, a, this is a, a new paper, uh, and we compare that with what we have in ST6, and the comparison is uh, reasonably good, as you can see in this slide. But um, I want um, just very quickly, Paco, to go through swell, right? Uh, I, because... Um, <coughs> We have many more source functions um, uh, in the, the ST6 package, but uh, swell had to be treated separately because once we introduce the wave breaking threshold, right, uh, then dissipation becomes zero. There's no way, uh, white cap and dissipation if there is no breaking, right? And what happens with the swell? We're talking about um, the wave forecast models, right? The models have to work always, right? So if the swell is there, 
um, model has to predict this well uh, correctly also, right? And um, uh, uh, to <coughs> um, uh, uh, cut the long story short, right, we have the theory for an um, uh, interaction of uh, the surface waves with the turbulence in the water, right? Uh, uh, and um, uh, the ocean waters are always turbulence, right? So that will be mechanism for the dissipation for swell, right? It's uh, slower than the breaking. So if the breaking happens, it's still there, but uh, it's small, right? But once the breaking stops, uh, uh, that's the only dissipation mechanisms for uh, swell waves, which can propagate uh, across the entire ocean. And uh, then, of course, as uh, we always do, we measure that. With the satellites, right? Um, uh, this is an illustration of the satellites flying uh, across uh, the Great Australian Bight, um, uh, altimeters, uh, and uh, we um, uh, measure uh, uh, the uh, decay of um, uh, swell uh, waves uh, over the distance. We compare that with uh, the formulas which uh, you predict uh, um, uh, you, you saw in the previous slide, right? Uh, and uh, have our measurement coefficients um, uh, calibrated, and we put that. that uh, into the model. And uh, uh, finally, uh, we have to make sure that um, uh, I, um, uh, our source functions are correct, right? So uh, we uh, test our source functions not in the bulk parameterization, right? Uh, against the wave height when we put them all together. We know that uh, the integral of the wind input um, has to equal the total stress, right? For the momentum input. Right, so we have this. We first of all we test our source functions against this constraint. Then we have that in the actual wave model, and it's verified at every time step. And we know experimentally again that the integral of the dissipation has to be less than integral of the wind input, and we know by how much. So now from experiments, uh, independent experiments. So again, we test our source functions uh, against that uh, before, and. Uh, here we go, is uh, ST6, and we have the uh, <coughs> uh, now um, hindcast done with ST6 for 70 years. If you want to use, and this hindcast, apart from the wave height, has uh, all other goodies like uh, the breaking probability. That's over 70 years globally, right? Uh, uh, and for the Benjamin Fair index, uh, right, uh, that's uh, the indexes for rogue waves, uh, and um, uh, so on. And uh, that's other developments. We also have uh, terms for the wave bottom interaction uh, and um, new nonlinear inter uh, interaction term, right, which accounts for quasi resonant interactions in addition to the resonant interactions. Um, and we work um, uh, on uh, the um, directional spreading for the source functions on tropical cyclones, wave ice interactions, and so on. And uh, that's it. Paco, this is my conclusion slide, which basically formulates the uh, source functions in ST6, the new features uh, which uh, they exhibit, and these are all observation-based features, right? So you can't ignore them, right? It's, they really happen, right? In the theory, you may say, well, we may need this theory or may, we may not like this theory, but um, in observations, um, if you see, uh, uh, the effect you can't ignore it, right? You have to find explanation for that, parameterize that, put that into uh, your model. That's uh, what ST6 is like. Thank you, Paka. I'm sorry about Thank you. That. Thank you very much, Alex. <clears throat>dissipation. And on the other hand, you are putting a threshold there. Uh, it's not a way of uh, counting two times uh, for the fact that uh, a wave is uh, steeper or an, uh, because a, a steeper wave will be more like uh, windsy and will tend to break. And that's already accounted by the, uh, by the steepness. So in principle, the moment you introduce a threshold is like uh, you are introducing a discontinuity by 
but uh, normally waves go from wind sea gradually into swell. So this discontinuity, uh, I don't know how, how do you. Uh, I, I see like uh, two times accounting for uh, for waves that tend to break by the steepness and by the threshold. It's it's like that. Um, Yes, the threshold is just a switch, right? Uh, if the steepness is below that threshold, then there is no breaking, right? There is no contradiction with um, a, with the swell here, right? A, a swell definition is whether it interacts uh, with the wind or it's not, right? More or less. I, <coughs> I now, I it can still be breaking if it's still uh, steep enough, right? But if it's not steep, it will not be breaking, right? Yes, so think about that um, uh, in terms of laboratory waves, for example, mechanically generated. There's no wind, okay? So it's just excluded. We can call it swell from the very beginning. There's no wind, right? They can be breaking or they can be not breaking. That depends on their initial stiffness. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Alexa. Move on. Let's move on, please. <clears throat> Now, uh, next speaker is Carolina Villet. Carolina is uh, talking about shoreline variations and wave energy fluxes at southern beaches of Mar del Plata, Argentina. The microphone for you, Carolina. Thank you. Good morning. Hola. Good morning. So, um, I am going to present the work analysis of wave energy flux impact on shoreline variabilities of three beaches in Mar del Plata. The objective of this work is to relate the wave energy flux and the shoreline variations. Seguimos. Okay, so I'll be talking first about the study size. This is three beaches south of the city of Mar del Plata. Then I'll present some, some of the results that I obtained in my graduated work, especially the seasonal and long-term trends of the shoreline variability. Then I'll explain how I obtained the seasonal net uh, and net longshore wave energy flux from Wavery and Swan. And finally, I'll present a simple conceptual model with some discussions and conclusions. So Mar del Plata is the most, one of the most important coastal cities in Argentina. It's located at the southeast of... Oops, uh, it's located at the southeast of the province of Buenos Aires. It concentrates a large part of the tourist activity, especially in summer when the population can increase by 400%. Last season, about 3.5 million people visit Mar del Plata. The study is focusing on 12 kilometers of shoreline in, at the south of the Mar del Plata harbor. This involved three beaches, Punta Mogotes Bay, Faro Norte Bay, and Ensenada Mogotes. <clears throat> These beaches have a great economic value for the region due to the large of the beaches. On the northern sector of Punta Mogotes, we find the Mar del Plata Harbor that was built in 1922. And since its construction, it be considered the responsible for the coastal erosion at the north of the Mar del Plata city due to the interruption of the longshore drift. On the southern section of Ensenada Mogotes, we find <coughs> that erosion has been an historical problem. Um, for that reason, between 2012 and 2017, for the attached breakwater were built. So, to obtain the beach-wide variation information, we use COSAT. COSAT is an open source software that enables the user, the user to obtain the shoreline from a, any available optical image. This is an example of a shoreline detection in Faro Norte and Ensenada Mogotes from a Sentinel-2 image. Then we use 26 transects to obtain the beach-wide <coughs> variation time series from 86 to 2020. We applied tidal correction to the series and this methodology was validated with three in situ observations, surveys, observations. So we end up having monthly series from 86 to 2020. Um, from them we studied the seasonality 
In here I present the beach wide from each season, where green represents aggression and red represents erosion, and the scale goes from minus 14 to 14. So we see that in summer, the, uh, <coughs> the aggression is what we see. <laughs> And in winter, we see that the coast is dominated by erosion, but we find an exception. In summer, we find erosion in the northern area of Faro Norte, in here, and in winter, we find aggression. And Ottoman Springs behave as transitional seasons with magnitudes almost very low. The exception is the south of Punta Mogote and Faro Norte, Punta, the south of Punta Mogotes and Faro Norte that in autumn presents aggression and in spring erosion. Then we analyze the long term the long term trends of the beach wide from 96 to 2020. Here green represents positive significant trends and red represents negative significant trends. So we see that the area is dominated by erosion with the exception of the center of Punta Mogotes that we find aggressions with rates from 0.5 to 1 meter per year. And in the breakwater zones where we found more than 1 meter of aggression per year. The erosion rates goes from minus 0.5 meter per year to 2, <coughs> two meters per year. In order to study waves, we use the nearest node from the wave area analysis. Um, and our goal was to transfer the information from the node to the locations of the transects, to the surf zone near the location of the transects. So in order to do that, we use SWAN. Uh, we use a computational grid of 100 meters of resolution, a JEPCO 22 model bathymetry with a 500 meters resolution. And we perform a total of 253 stationary runs. In these stationary runs, we consider waves from one meter, periods from four to 14 seconds with one second step, direction from 20 and 240 degrees with 10 degree steps. And from them, from these runs, we calculate the shoal, the shoaling and the refraction coefficients near the, the surf zone of each transect. And we transform the wave significant height, periods and direction in this area, so we end up having time series of way high direction and period in each zone near the transects in the source zone. So we can think as the longshore wave energy flux as the ability of wave to transport sediment along the coast. So we calculate the PLS and we end up having monthly series of PLS. And from them, we calculate the, we analyze the seasonality of the PLS. Here, red represents PLS to south, and green represents PLS to north. So in summer, what we see is that the PLS is going to south with the highest rates in the Ensenada Mogotes salient, in Faro Norte, and in the ends of Punta Mogotes. In winter, the PLS is to north, with magnitudes similar to the ones presented in summer. And in autumn and spring, the magnitudes are considerably lower with PLS to north in autumn and to south in spring. Then we calculate the net PLS from the 96 to 2020. As we expected from previous studies, the PLS is to north and uh, with the highest magnitudes again in the salient of Ensenada Mogotes in Faro Norte and in the ends of Punta Mogotes. So if PLS is the, is the measure of the ability of wave to transport sediment along the coast, we must take into account the, the availability of the sediment that can be transported. So in here we can see that Punta Mogotes and the salient of Faro Norte has a lot of sand that can be transported, but the southern area is dominated by cliffs, by cliff. And if we go 20 kilometers southern of this area, the coast is still dominated by cliffs. So we are going to assume that in the north area, in our area studio, especially in the north part, we, we, we will have a sediment that can be transported, and in the southern area, we will have 
very low setting and that can be transported. So here I present again the beach wild of the summer season. And now we see that the PLS is to south. So in the northern area, we have uh, sediment that can be transported. So we have a longshore transport to south that is inducing accretion. And we also can see that in areas where the PLS induce divergence of the transport, represented by a minus sin, the accretion rates are lower, are even though in Faro Norte, we see here it's not good very much, but there is a slight erosion. And in the areas where we see convergence of the transport due to the PLS, the um, accretion rates are higher. The exception is the salient of Ensenada Mogotes, where we see divergence of the transport and a huge, huge accretion rates. In winter, what we can see is that the um, transport is to north, do, and we don't have sediment available from the south to be transported to the north. So this induces erosion, especially in this area. And in areas where we see transport divergence, this erosion is bigger. And the areas where we see transport convergence, this erosion are <clears throat> lower. And in Faro Norte, the transport convergence is producing accretion. So we see that the, in summer, in the salient of Ensenada Mogotes, we see a huge accretion and divergence of the transport. In addition, this area represents the, um, uh, the amplitude of the seasonal cycle almost twice the big from the other sections of the study area. So this salient has its origin in wave diffraction produced by the Arresting Alfaro. And at its end, it presents a sand tongue that presents seasonal landslides. So in winter, when the PLS is to north, we see that this sand tongue is at the north of the transect in here. And in summer, when the PLS is to south, this sand tongue is exactly in the area of our transect. So in order to properly analyze the, the dynamic of this salient, we need to increase the spatial resolution of the story. So then we analyze the um, net PLS with the long-term trends. So the PLS is to north, as we expected, and this PLS in the southern area, we don't have sediment available to be transported, so this is inducing erosion in the southern area with the section of the breakwaters. And in Punta Mogotes, what we see is, um, okay, first, that southward to our salient, this one and this one, we see that the erosion rates are lower, so we can see, think that the um, salient as is, are behaving as natural barriers that interrupt the longshore transport and producing lower erosion rates in southern of these salients. And then we can see that in the south of Punta Mogotes, we find divergence of the transport and erosion in the center of Punta Mogotes, we see accretion and conversion and convergence of the transport. And in the northern area, we see divergence and erosion again. So we can think that the center of Punta Mogotes is increasing or growing by expense of the sun coming from the south of Punta Mogotes. But in order to understand where the sun from the north part, we need to talk about the issues that the harbor has. Since its construction, sediment transport to the north has been trapped on the mouth of the um, entrance of the, and a sandbar developed across the access channel. And Cáceres and Perillo calculate the amount of sediment trapped in the mouth of the port being almost of 255,000 cubic meters per year. So it's a lot of sand that is being deposited in there. For this reason, Sun is constantly dragged from the mouth and dumped into an artificial basin here. And a private entity extracts the sun and sells it. They are doing mining activity in here. But also is public knowledge that when the tourist season is off, this mining activity do not goes also in the beach nearby illegally. So they take a lot of sun from the beach. So some conclusions. It's an established fact among scientists and 
Decision makers that Punta Mo due to the long short transport to the north, Punta Mogotes do not suffer erosion. And this is not true. Even though the center of Mogotes increased, the, all the, the both ends of the area, it's having erosion. And this erosion is probably due to the long short transport. So seasonal and long-term variation in the short line seems to be related to the PDS, but however, to properly understand the dynamics in here, we need to take into account any other facts such as the mining activity or normal wave energy flux, etc. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, questions? Luigi? Luigi, down here. Uh, okay, good, thank you. Carolina, uh, very nice, uh, clean presentation. Very, thank you. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, this is a world problem, erosion. Erosion. And uh, my first question, where does the sand come from originally? The erosion, the sand? The, no, in general, the in sand general, uh, that okay, you find so there must be coming from somewhere yes. on the time. The uh, sand, now it's coming from the erosion from the cliff. Ah, because the area. you mentioned that the cliff is mm. not, not a source of sediment. No, it's a very, very, source, very low source of sediment. But in the past, uh, these beaches generates um, like in the Holocene or something like that. Um, but now the sand came from the erosion of the cliff, but it's yeah, very low. It's very low the, the, in compared to the one that may came from the north when the now the system. problem is always the human intervention, you know. Human intervention, of course. Always. Yes. Everywhere in the world. Yes, the mining activity there is quite huge. Like you can go and walk through the beach in winter when there is no tourist activity, and they may take in like ten tracks uh, full of that sand. That's the concrete industry in the mm. world. That is, uh, sand mining is uh, one of the problems for the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We have another one with Alex. Thank you, Carolina. Interesting talk. And um, for the first time, it's very good, right? Thank you, Alex. Uh, Such an honor. <laughs> I, just um, I want to follow on what um, Luigi said about um, the human intervention uh, always, right? And um, the interesting uh, point also is uh, where the sand is coming from. Okay, you mentioned in your conclusion that there is a net flux towards the north, right? Yes. If there is a net flux, then sand should run out at some stage, right? Mm -hmm. Unless there is a constant source of the sand somewhere in the south, right? But um, I, I, just as a thought, um, I, something that I, we see in Australia, in the east coast of Australia, right, which is um, facing the Pacific uh, uh, Ocean, um, I, the cyclones uh, have changed um, uh, their path, right? So they moved uh, the traditional part of the cyclones moved a little bit further north, right? And that means that the waves uh, are coming in a different direction to the course, right? It's not big. 10, 20 degrees, but it's there. And as a result, um, uh, there are some um, uh, erosions of the beaches and accretions of the beaches in a different place, right? So the beaches move, right? Uh, and this reason, I, I suppose the climate change can be the, uh, also the human intervention, but in this case, right, it's not direct human intervention, right? It's, it's uh, at the bigger scale, something that happens out at, uh, in the ocean with the weather. Well. I, I didn't say in here, but there is some studies that in here also the waves are changing direction, directions, but in sense they are coming more from the south. So we expect as the net PLS is bigger or increasing over time. But I didn't analyze in here, I didn't see it in here, but there is some studies that they're saying that the waves are even coming even more from the south, from southeast. So. Thank, Thank you, you, Alex. All right. <coughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Let's move on. <coughs> Let's next speaker.
is Matthias Eden, <coughs> Eder, uh, presenting a study of the coastal dynamic of Union Beach in Chubut, Argentina. Sorry. Well, <laughs> this presentation is about a uh, case of a study in the coastal, in the southern Patagonic Argentinian coast, in the Chubut province, <coughs> and is uh, carried out by the young colleagues uh, present with me, uh, which has a, an, um, a study of the dynamics uh, of this play, and after that, a design of the protection and a Start uh, starting with the verification of the pro proposal protection with physical models. Next, please. Or, well, okay. This is Chubut Province. Plaza Union is located just in the mouth of the Chubut River. And you can see here the city of Plaza Union and the uh, Rawson Harbor with the jetties and the harbor inside the estuary of the Chubut River. Well, the problem was the destruction of the protection of the coastal road and uh, the protection uh, due to two storms in, nine, in 20, uh, 2020 and 2021. You can see here in a cenital view from a drone uh, how the line of concrete in the crow uh, next to the road was broken uh, in the last part of the storm, reaching uh, the the way, passing this line. Hmm? In here, we have uh, some information about the what happened in here. By one side, there were successive constructions to allow the income of the boats, fishery boats, to the Robson port with small jetties first and a larger ones after that. The nets sediment transport from south to the north. Then you can see the accretion in the southern beach. There are evidence of a sandbar which was increased in this part due to the sediment transport moving to, to the sea and an erosion as a classical erosion after the jetty in the northern part. This part was initially protected what, uh, with stones, and after that with a short breakwater in here. And the damage, the main damage, was in this part. Then uh, the study ha have two parts, one for local protection uh, for extremal conditions, and the second part 
for the general uh, stability of the beach of the Plaza Union City with um, breakwaters and a for medium sea state. The second part is not presented in here due to the time available time for the for the presentation. Then uh, we focus now in this part. Other thing that uh, can influence can influence this erosion is the diminution and the cut of the sediment transport from the river, from the Chubut River, after um, 73, that was when the Florentino Maguino Dam was built 90 kilometers from the coast. Sorry. In this part. Uh, it's interesting to mention that the main transport of the Chubut River is clay. It's not sandy river. Uh, is mats and, and clay. It's fine sediment transport, the main part of transport of the Chubut River. Well, there were different surveys of uh, bathymetric studies between 1996 to 2014. The, uh, there are a comparison of the trends of evolution of the bathymetric lines between this time period where is clearly noted, not in the quality of the images, but there are erosion in here and accretion in the northern part of the Plaza Union Beach. You can see here for the southern profiles has the, how the shoreline was moving to inland and for the next profiles, the shoreline is stable, or also in the northern part is moving to the sea. Well, uh, to analyze the general trends of the coastline, we use, we use different uh, satellite and, uh, satellital images from QuickBird, GeoEyes, Worldview, Econos, with, uh, between 2002 and 2021, and Landsat 128 and Centennial 1 and 2 mm, for uh, 2014. Uh, with this, we try to detect some trends in the coastal line, in the shoreline, uh, showing slow trends. It's not easy due to the resolution of these images. Well, in here we can see a, a picture of the events that I mentioned in September 2020 and in February 2021, where the sea reached the the, the the coast and destroy and destroy the protection. This is an example of how the gravel was removed, and there direct, uh, directly the armor blocks were removed and erosion occurred. In this aerial view. Showing at the beginning, you can see here the broken line, and after the storm, the uh, moved and a broken uh, concrete line. Then this part tried to obtain a stability solution for this part, combining different possibilities. Vertical was. Vertical walls were uh, discarded due to that the erosion will be increased in the beach, protect the way, but lose the beach. Then we move to um, 
think in other possibilities to stability uh, to stabilize this part of the coast. This second part uh, that I mentioned is not uh, detailed in the presentation, but include different uh, breakwaters uh, designed <clears throat> with a net sediment long transport from south to north and a uh, medium sea state computed for the 30 years series from, from, from uh, sea state data. Uh, to obtain uh, data for the study, we extend the um, 20, um, no, two decades of data available from the province, uh, obtained from the Copernicus project from the European Union with a high cast of 30 years from 1990 to 2020 for seven points in front of the uh, Chubut coast. Um, this uh, amount, uh, huge amount of data were wind and waves when one hour time step during 30 years. From this uh, data of wind and waves, we start to the selection of the design parameters of wave height, significant wave height period, and directions. This is all of the data for this period, for all points. In here you can see the uh, distribution uh, of wave height to different return periods from different points and different wind directions. We will design for this condition with winds from the south east selecting the point two in here. Stronger winds are coming from the continent to the, to the east but the generated storm that we simulate take these lines, no? When, uh, winds for, uh, waves from the generated for winds from the southeast. Well, these are the three directions that the, we analyze, taking point two as the longshore condition to propagate the waves, sorry, then for point two, located uh, 90 kilometers to the coast, just in front of the Plaza Union Beach, the significant uh, wave height is seven meters, point six, and the period 10 seconds, point two. Yes, uh, we use for other studies waves higher than 10 meters, but in Tierra del Fuego province are very, very large waves. Uh, and in Tierra del Fuego case, we can use data from the uh, oil stations from the United Kingdom, but it, like, uh, unfortunately in here, there were no measured data. Well, uh, for propagate the spectrum, we choose the John Swap spectrum, and for the long short transport, we estimate this medium sea state. Well, uh, this is a, a view of the three dominium for the propagation of waves. The red one is the largest, the blue is the medium domain, and the orange, the small one, in here as a grid of 10, 10 meters by 10 meters. And we combine uh, 50 years of return period and different uh, level tides. For the extreme conditions, uh, we assume the worst condition, which is the maximum high tide, obviously. 
<clears throat> using uh, MOPLA and SMC models, we propagate uh, the spectrum to the, from the point two to the coast in this uh, numerical bathymetry, and these are the results of wave height and direction. Well, with the wave parameters, period and wave height, uh, in front of the coast, we proceed to design a standard uh, protection, trying to reduce the volume of the complete uh, uh, structural packages in a way to reduce the cost of the province due to that the Plaza Union is a small a touristical city, has not the resources from Mar del Plata, for instance. Previously, we did a study for Mar del Plata with this, uh, without this the economical restriction. Then uh, we increased the slope of the structure to the maximum are possible according to the standard recommendations, which conduce to verify after that in the model. Uh, previously, <clears throat> uh, three armor units were on, were compared: the tripods, cubes, and Akmon armor units. Um, <clears throat> that uh, were developed uh, in the 60th centuries by Delft. There, okay, okay. Um, in here you can see some similar blocks like of these were used previously in Chubut province. And, this, uh, the, um, and they suggest to use the similar uh, armors where the way they are used it before. Uh, in the first design or pre-design, uh, there are two layers of Agmon uh, units, two layers of cubes and in the first inner layer, and uh, two layers of the cubes, smaller cubes, in the third layer. These are uh, volume, weights, and size of each unit. And this is a detail of the toe protection, which is a, a talon de Achilles of the structure because uh, the structure he filed is starting here. Well, uh, this is a, a present images, uh, then we are just uh, nowadays uh, uh, starting with the design, the printing in a 3D printer, uh, the units, uh, <clears throat> very fine density. Uh, we selected a, a, a fruit type model with a length scale of one in 15. Then to reach the size, sim the weight similarity, we need to introduce an iron uh, piece inside each Ackman unit. Um, and it was necessary to also to build a bottom over the channel bottom to obtain the breaking condition according to the previous numerical design, uh, simulation in front of the structure. Well, as you can see, the first part of the verification without tow construction, without deflector of the, for the overtopping. This is just the structural package with sand in a scale to the gravel, to the natural beach, geotextile, grave, uh, simulating the small cubes, cubes in the, in the second layer, and two layers of acne. The red ones in, uh, below the white ones. Uh, after to calibrate the absorption of the wave generation system, we start to uh, to make the, the experiment series. If you can, if you can come, please. And you like this video, you can see. The movement of this piece. Well, this allows also to test different 
types of collocation in a random way uh, or in an order way. And this needs to be discussed with the company which will will because there is a cost associated to the local conditions to positioning. Uh, if you put in a exactly position each block, you need a machine that in Europe or in Delft is cheap, but in the Patagonic coast is more expensive than the structure. Then in here, we need to make a lot of uh, testing. Uh, then we are carrying out this experiment. Thank you. Uh, this is our case of study. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question? Questions? Comments? We can talk in the coffee break. Right. There is one. <clears throat> Good, good, very good presentation. Uh, congratulations with uh, with f physical models. Uh, it's very uh, uh, very good to see. Try to to combine physical models with with, with simulations. Right. Um, the chemical yes. To yes. discuss with the company which is doing this, still the protection, and in the middle we try to represent the real conditions with experiments. It's not easy, but it's engineering in real life. Yes. Uh, my question is related because uh, in, at the toe of, of the structure, uh, it's common to see infragravity waves. And did you check that in the, in the design? No, 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 this condition will be not uh, reproduced in the wave flume. No. Mm -hmm. And there is also an, an hypothesis. Uh, the wave flume is a 2 dV uh, geometry and realize the 3D. Uh, then the short waves, uh, infragravity waves, uh, are not real. Can appear in the channel, but due to the bad absorption uh, function. Do you understand me? Yes, yes. But uh, are, this is a, by other hand, we have not direct measurements uh, of what happened during the storm. Uh, we just have videos where can allow to us to to measure the period which are uh, over ten seconds in in the beach and estimate the wave height breaking in, in front of the coast, but no allow to measure uh, long waves that without a doubt exist in the Plaza Union Beach. You can see casps and a lot of geometry or bathymetric effects that show you that there are different, different uh, type of waves acting, but not in the point where I uh, designed the, the local protection. Uh, but if you want, we can talk about the toy design uh, after the, uh, after the, the coffee, coffee break, break or during yes. the coffee break, because we have a thousand doubts about how to build it, mainly due to the, the uh, tithe it's a semi-diurnal type, then the company that should be built the tow need to work underwater, which is so expensive, or use very, very short time a window to work there. Then we design a tow with minimum excavation, with <coughs> introduced uncertainties, we need to be verified. Right. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, we we come to our, our last speaker of this uh, session one of the four symposium on Latin, Amer Latin American symposium on water waves, uh, and which is Rodrigo Alonso talking about automatic calibration and uncertainty quantification in water dynamical downscaling. Rodrigo. Hey. Thank you, Paco. Uh, hi again. Well, I'm going to present this, this work entitled Automatic Calibration and Uncertainty Quantification in Waves Dynamical Low Scaling. Previous presentation used uh, wave dynamical low scaling. They obtained data from the a global Heincast 
and propagate this data to the to the site of interest using uh, uh, Swan in the case of Carolina, using Oluca in the case of, of, of uh, Andres. So the idea is to uh, apply, propose a methodology to uh, uh, automatic calibrate and also uh, quantificate the, the uncertainties uh, related with these, these results. So uh, a typical content of presentations going to introdu introduction, uh, coastal engineering, coastal scientists uh, uh, used to need long-term and good quality wave data series in, in our uh, study points. So, and also the probabilistic designs in, in, in coastal engineering is becoming a, a common practice and we need uh, to quantify uncertainty associated with, with the data. But the common situation is, uh, is what happens here in Uruguay or in, in Argentina and in many, many, many places is to uh, don't have this, this long term and good quality uh, wave data series in our point of study. So we have to downscale, downscale uh, the, 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 the series from the from the global hindcast. So um, we we have uh, we can use statistic, statistical methods to do that, or the most common is to use a, a wave model, uh, modeling the, the, the physics uh, as, uh, behind the propagation and transformation of, of waves be, be between the, the offshore points and the near shore points. Uh, this this equation Alex uh, talked in the in the first uh, 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 in the in the first presentation. So, um, but in this in this process this 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 process of of uh, downscale uh, uh, um, um, downscale wave data to to the coast is a typical model we can think on on this process as a typical model calibration pr uh, problem, and there are uh, our data. Uh, uh, if we if we have some measures no, and compare our data, there are we we probably we, we find errors, and these errors uh, uh, have different sources sources related with, related with the with the inputs, also related with the epi epistemic errors related uh, 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 with the with the model. No? Also, uh, er errors related with the set of parameters, set of values of the parameters that, that we choose. No? And also, uh, our, our, our observations are, are, have, have errors, precision errors, and sampling, sampling errors, or sampling problems, or, or, or whatever. So, a typical calibration problem is to, is to, is to compare our our estimation with with, with our uh, uh, observations and then correct the parameters in order to look for a best fit between our results and our observation this this uh, we, we use only to look in the parameters not don't look on model structural input and observation errors and uncertainty in our, uh, of our results are not quantified so um, there are statistical tools to address a model calibration problem automatically, and that allow estimating the uncertainty of the model results. They are uh, wide, widespread uh, usage in other branches of, of science, of other branches of in engineer, but it, it is, it, it, they are not used in, in, they are not common in, in coastal engineer. So the idea is to, to, to use them. One group of them is based on Bayesian inference. A little background of what what I, what I, what what is it? Um, if we have um, model parameters, a, a set of model parameters, uh, we use the parameter theta to to, to refer to the parameters. The, this 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 method variables, not as a deterministic variables. So, in in, in a, as a difference with a, a, an optimization method that we look for a, a, a specific value of the parameters, this method looks for a 
probability distribution of the parameters, of the parameters theta, given the, the, the evidence that we have, given the, the data that is uh, y, no? the data is, is y. No? So uh, how we obtain this, 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 this distribution, this probability distribution? Okay, one, one, one way is to apply these uh, algorithms that they are called Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, the idea is this, this Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo simulations visit different regions of the parameter space pro proportionally to their probability. So uh, uh, we, we obtain the, the we, we, we don't ob ob obtain the, the analytical a function of the probability distribution. We obtain a sample genera generated with the Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, so this bias theorem is, is here, and uh, uh, the idea is to, uh, uh, to, to, to estimate, we, we know that the, this uh, uh, probability distribution is, is proportional to the uh, likelihood of, of, the, of the observation given a set of parameters. So this we can estimate uh, with, 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 our, uh, compare with our errors. So the, the, the general objective is develop this methodology with this dual objective, automatic calibration and uncertainty quantification. But there are some specific objects that uh, the calibration thinking in, in wave without scaling improves improves uh, the the model perf performance in, in 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 directions and, and periods not 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 only in terms of, of significant wave height so um, include uh, errors that comes from the input forcing errors so the idea is to uh, define some uh, correction parameters to the to the boundary conditions and include the parameters in the in the in the set of, of parameters to, to be calibrated with the model parameters and 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 then it it it, it involves a Monte Carlo simulation so we are thinking in a in a tool for for coastal engineering so uh, it it can be uh, needed to be the computational demand uh, ha uh, has to be low, no, in order to, to be feasible. Uh, so the proposed met methodology, uh, the, the step zero is to, in order to think in, in, there are a lot of simulation, optimize the the way model in terms of, of of spatial and, and and time resolution and also the discretization of the spectrum. But the the second, the first after that. No, Opt optimize the, the model uh, without a compromise in, in on its results. After that, uh, the selection of the calib cal calibration data subset uh, that is implied excludes mis misinformative data, data that are not coherent between the input and the observation. We we, we have to exclude it for for the for the. Uh, don't give it to the to the algorithm. Then apply. Uh, we select a, a subset of the of the of the of the of the data to be included in the in the in the calibration. For that, we suggest to apply the the MDA algorithm is maxi maximum dissimilarity algorithm. It's an algorithm to to for, for a, 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 po a population. Uh, choose a subset that is statistically representative of the total population, but apply the MDA considering uh, wave systems. So uh, uh, the population, each uh, wave event is uh, represented not for total integral parameters, not for a, a, a complete spectrum, but by the uh, uh, significant wave height, uh, peak and direction uh, uh, a, a, a peak period and direction of each wave, wave systems. So if we have n systems, we have a, 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 a vector of a three times n a dimension that is normalized, and we 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 
we measure the Euclidean distance between the, the different wave events to apply the, the MDA algorithm and, and select a, a representative a, a subset of, of the population. So, uh, the, 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 the step two is to de define an, an error measure. Um, uh, so, we, we, in order to not so, uh, improve results in terms of period and directions, uh, we, we uh, propose to use a, a spectral, what we call a, a spectral error, that is the difference between the the, the model, the spectra estimated, the, the and the spectra observed, the spectrum observed, in terms of, of uh, absolute values, in order to, uh, when we are overestimated in some part and, and underestimating in other part of the spectra, it don't compensate this. this. And if we assume that this this spectral error is a uh, IID, uh, 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 we can uh, uh, calculate the, the likelihood with this expression. So, uh, the, the, the step three is the selection of the calibration parameters. We, we, we propose to include model parameters and also input correction parameters. So, for the, the, the model parameters uh, are the ones of, of, of the model instead of, of uh, um, and and uh, and the and the input correction parameters we define this 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 set of parameters they they, they correct the, the 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 spectrum in the in the boundary condition there are uh, three three parameters one is a, a, a coefficient that uh, uh, amplify or, or, or reduce uh, the, the wave energy in the in the in the spectrum in the in the input, and there the other is a frequency shift, and the other is a di direction shift that move do, do, don't change the amount of energy, but move in, it in in the spectrum. And another one that affect uh, wind wind velocity. No, we, we are we are um, so. Uh, different correction parameters, uh, the wave coefficient and frequency shift and direction shift is considered for each wave, wave system. We, we correct each wave system independently. Uh, so, but then with all of the possible parameters, we, we, we estimate the, the marginal likelihood of, of each one uh, leaving the others in the default value. So we obtain this kind of, of, of results. Here, uh, here the, the red circle is the default value. No? So in this case, for these parameters, is correspond for our case of study, the frequency shift for eastern swells. Uh, the default value is not shift, the, the energy in frequency, so it's, it's zero. But if we, if we move, the uh, likelihood will be uh, uh, lower than the than, than default, so we don't consider this this parameter. But in this case, direction shift for southern swells, the fault value is zero. But if we move the the energy uh, to to these values, this 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 means uh, turn turn to the turn to the to the and. and, and uh, turn to the to the east. This 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 swells. We improve the likelihood. So we include this this parameter in the in the calibration. So only those parameters that lead to a qualitative significant improvement of the marginal like log likelihood function are considered for the calibration. <clears throat> so uh, calibration uh, validation. I I I I mentioned the this the MCMC algorithm, but we use the the one called DREAMS, that DREAMS uh, is an acronym of, uh, of Differential ev Evolution Adap Adaptive Metropolis. Let's use differential evolution uh, to, to, to evolve in the Markov chain. Uh, 
and use a metropolis selection rule to decide whether candidate points should replace its parents or not. So some pecul pe pe peculiarities, it is multi-chain, uh, subspace sampling, the C and S ref refer that, that uh, some characteristics of, 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 of the, 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 there are a family of, of, of dream algorithms. This Zeta of, of Zeta refers to the, the peculiarities of this one. So, but we, we choose this one because uh, it presents a satisfactory uh, results in other in other areas with uh, uh, estimating very complex and multimodal uh, uh, parameters uh, space. So the, the final step is the uncertainty analysis. So we have the join distribution, join probability distribution of, of, the, of the parameters. So we, we, we run a, 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 a lot of many uh, hundred simulations sampling the, 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 the parameters from this showing distribution and then create this, this band of confidence of, of our results. So we apply this in a, in a case study, in a case study in the Atlantic coast of, of Uruguay. There, there was a, 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 an ADCP uh, close to the, to, the, to the coast. The, the ADCP, we use a, a a set of data of, of seven months, and we use the the node of era interim. Uh, this work started previous era five, um, uh, and we use the the Swan to 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 downscale the data of era interim to to the coast, and uh, uh, we use the 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 ADCP data for 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 the calibration. So, uh, results. The, the first step is the selection of the calibration data sub subset. We, we talk about to, to consider different wave systems. There, we identif identify these uh, southern swells, eastern swells, uh, also the wind seas. So, we work with three wave systems. Um, this is, uh, we have this amount of, of data to, to calibrate. But with the MDA algorithm, we keep only with uh, 50, 50 data, 50 C states to, to, to use uh, in the, to consider in the calibration. There are some uh, uh, statistics with that, these di box diagrams about uh, significant wave height, uh, uh, peak period, and, uh, and peak di direction, considering the total population and only the subset obtained with the MDA for for the, the for the three for the three wave systems. So they are very similar. We we, we think that the MDA choose uh, uh, very well. So the parameters uh, they are the parameters we <laughs> we didn't use the the parameters of Alex. We don't have to tune anything. We use this, this parameterization. They are parameters we have to tune. Uh, so there are four parameters. We choose four parameters related with the dissipation by bottom friction. There are 20 meters water depth. And also related with the uh, white capping, the dissipation, dissipation by white capping. So and also the parameters to correct the, 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 the input, the boundary conditions. So there are in total uh, 14 parameters, but if we do the sensitivity analysis that I told, uh, only five, five of, of them, moving five of them, we obtain a, 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 an improvement. So we keep with only with five of them, but we find that the, the spectral error is, is, is uh, um, susceptible to the double penalty effect, no? If we estimate the the wave uh, a, a current amount of, of wave energy, but in a different frequencies of different in direction, th this the spectral error penalized twice. So the algorithm uh, prefer to kill the energy than to move the the, the the spectrum. So to avoid this 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 problem. Uh, uh, we, we, 
we discard uh, uh, two of, of, of these parameters and keep only with, with three. There are the coefficient of a, a bottom friction, the exponent p that is used in the in the uh, source of dissipation, and uh, the directional shift of the southern swells. So, when we when we run the the, the dream algorithm, we obtain a Markov chain that ha seems like like this, and. The, our final result is the, the is a probability distribution of each of these parameters. We, uh, here I present an, an histogram. In green is the default value, and the best fit value is in is in the, the with the higher probability is in the is is, is on red. So the the algorithm suggests to move to to shift the direction of southern swells 22 degrees. Uh, the same with the exponent p and for the uh, bottom friction coefficient. No? So we validate with the integral parameters. We obtain an improvement in terms of uh, correlation coefficient and root mean square error for directions and periods. Um, here is uh, uh, the, the spectral error for the with the default and with the calibrated, the best fit set of, of parameters. So the, uh, we improve how the energy is, dis, 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 is distributed both in direction and frequency, um, which is reflected in lower errors in, in direction and, and period. So, uh, and this is uh, the, the uh, we, we can um, add it to our data series, the these confident bands. Uh, he created as I mentioned in the previous slides, and also we can move it to to the to the probability distributions of 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 the weight parameters. So uh, the proposed methodology fulfilled this double objective: the MDA algorithms and the CCTV analysis allowed to reduce uh, execution uh, the, to speed up the methodology. Uh, in, included input correction was uh, crucial uh, to to improve the wave direction results there. and uh, spectral errors the spectral error allowed to improve the energy distribution in, in the estimated spectra but it was susceptible to the double penalty effect so we come to one 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 thing to to, to improve is is to is to Use another another target uh, function. So uh, more details. This this work was was published in Coastal Engineering. You can find more details there. Uh, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo. Do we have a question, Nelson? Uh, hi, Rodrigo. Nice, nice work. Uh, could you please go back to that exp expression for spectral error? We had this discussion during yeah. Yuri's, Yuri's uh, dissertation panel, right? Uh, and that is something that is kind of tricky, really. How can you compare spectra, right? Could you please uh, uh, comment on that? Why, this is a, why did you choose this expression? Why did you... Uh, I've showed you another expression. This is tricky for your for your work, right? Because everything comes from out of this, right? Could you please so just uh, comment on that? Okay, uh, we need a a, a target function for 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 this kind of algorithm. We 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 have to define an, an error to to improve it. So when we when we started with this work, we use uh, an error of significant weight height, only on significant weight height, uh, and then we find that we are there. Are, uh, for the case for the case study, we, we find uh, um, large errors in the in the reactions and periods. So we propose this this uh, uh, this um, metric, this error metric in order to, to improve uh, 
Okay, our, 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 our objective is to improve the, the estimation of, of the spectrum. So that's the that's idea, compare the, the, the estimated spectrum with the observed spectrum. But it, it has the, the problem of, of double penalty. If, if, if the energy is correct, but there are a difference in, in, the, in, the, posi in the position. So uh, maybe this this uh, 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 this metric uh, has to be improved, but prob probably considering a, 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 a vector like this with wave partition in the spectrum, considering the, the energy period, uh, could be a good a good a good way to do that. All right, we have another question on the back, please. Hi, Rodrigo, glad to see you again. Mm, uh, your presentation was very interesting and uh, I have a question and I have some hints or advice for you. Maybe good ideas, maybe. Uh, the first one is, um, how was your experience using ERA interim? And if you have compared it with, uh, against the ERA 5 already? And the, uh, I, I don't know if you, if, want to, if you want to answer right now and then I no, no, it's, the, the idea is, is not to, to propose a, the, the idea is to propose a, a methodology that can work with any any uh, any global wave hangers. Yeah, yeah. Now we are using era five, and also we are uh, developed our our local hangers uh, from, from this this from Uruguay. But when we start to to work with this this type type of algorithm, uh, we started with the uh, era five and and the, and this this. Uh, and this ADCP observations, so we we continue working with with this, this set of data. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, if 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 we want to 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 produce to produce a a, a, a data series for for this for the case study, we uh, sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Of course, we we are, we it, it, uh, we will use uh, the the better information that that is available. Okay, and um, and the question is uh, related to the fourteen terms uh, that you that you use in in your equations or or improvement. Yeah. Yeah. So, have had you used some approaches, static, statistical approaches, for screening or reducing this this amount of terms? I mean, because fourteen are are many, um, and you mentioned that you you found that three of them are are meaningful, but I don't know if if you check the physical relation among them and. Um, if if you I, I give you some advice if, if you use some approaches like a DOA NOVA factorial design, maybe you can find some uh, um, information and uh, of the physical relationships among them. So how do you find these three terms that you you, you say that are meaningful among the fourteen terms? Yeah, of course. Uh, Many many parameters to calibrate. Uh, imply uh, means that the the parameter space to 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 search has many di dimensions. So uh, this has has a direct impact on computational demand of this kind of, of methods. So. For this a prior for 14 parameters by the sensitivity sensitivity analysis, we discard the ones that don't significantly improve the results comparing with the default value. 
and we keep with only with, with five. But then we we discard uh, uh, other two because to avoid problems with this 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 double penalty effect that we discussed with Nelson. So yeah, yeah. But but this the bottom friction affects the total amount of energy. Mm, the exponent p maybe acts. Uh, okay, okay, there are many people that can correct me, but probably acts on on how the the, the energy is distributed in, in in frequencies for the local waves, and this is a a, a, a correct directions correct direction for a particular wave system of the of the input of the boundary condition. So they they are, they these parameters affect different things. Yeah, it's very tricky working with 14 terms, but that, that sounds great. Thank you, Rodrigo. All right. Thank, thanks, Rodrigo, again. Okay. Let's, let's for a coffee. And uh, let's go for coffee. In the hall. And we convene, reconvene at 11.15. Right? 11.15. Thank you.
Okay, uh, we're ready to start the next session. I am Eric Rogers. I work at the Naval Research Lab and I'm, I'm chairing this session on wave current interactions. And the first presentation is going to be by uh, Nelson Violante Corvao, who um, who's actually the host of the first and second, well, first, as uh, Rodrigo explained, wasn't it actually a lat waves meeting, but definitely the host of the second lat waves uh, meeting, uh, uh, lat, the, uh, that was uh, so both in Brazil, of course, and so his presentation is eddy dipoles in the Brazil current and their effects on surface wave spectra. Is it on? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you, Eric. Uh, actually, the two first, what was going to be lat waves was in Rio. Back then, it was like Brazil, Brazil meeting. I don't, I can't even remember the name, but it was Brazil meeting about waves or something like that. And then we realized that there are so many people working with waves in Latin America that you should have something like, I think it was Andrea's idea. Let's change the name and have something like lat waves. It's a cool name, I think, Latin American symposium or conference, right? In Latin. In, waves. Uh, well, it's really good to be back on, on uh, back on the road, right, after so many years of pandemic. This is my first meeting after, uh, first my first trip actually, really, after the pandemic. And I have some really preliminary results to show you. Uh, it's like one month of work, and the idea is to uh, understand how small scale currents uh, affect waves. Right, so I'm going to talk about dipoles. 
added dipoles, which is like, it's a combination of, of, of uh, cyclonic and anticyclonic vortices, and they bond together, and they have very special uh, characteristics, especially in terms of a jet between them, which is much stronger currents than the, 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 the vortices uh, themselves have, have. And I'm trying to understand how this uh, dipoles affect the, uh, the propagation of waves. So the, the results are really preliminary. Uh, I'm, I think it's a great opportunity to to, uh, to send some, to, to put on the table some ideas and try to get some feedback from, from you guys. So what I'm trying to understand, to understand is this add dipoles and especially what, how they affect the, the waves propagating on, on, on in the ocean, right? Uh, and why I want to understand them? Because they are ubiquitous, they are everywhere. They are responsible for a, a significant amount of kinetic energy in the ocean. And, uh, and not only, in, especially in the western boundary currents as the, Brazilian, as the Brazil current, but not only in the western boundary cur currents, they are everywhere. And, but they are very small scale. They are like, uh, in, in general, the wavelengths, like 100, 150 kilometers. So how do these things uh, uh, really affect the waves propagating? And, and what you're going to do, you're going to use two tools, basically. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to use synthetic aperture radar. Uh, more precisely, you're going to use a new methodology that has just been published. And you're going to try to, to take a look in particular to the wave spectrum, to the shape of the wave spectrum. And you're going to use some compare some runs of wave watch with and without currents and compare the results when they pass this, uh, a specific dipole. And you're going to, to use uh, uh, a region not far away from here in the Sao Paulo Plateau, which is there is a, a particular transition in the coastline. And this is a very active area for, for, uh, for uh, cyclones for edges, especially these dipoles. So that's, what I'm, that's the idea of the, of the presentation. That's what I'm trying to, to explain to you. So this is the, uh, the state of the art of the currency in, in, the, in, the, in, Brazil, in, the, in the Brazilian coast, right? It's dominated by the Brazil current. It's a Western boundary current. And the circulation here is very, in this area is very complex with current, currents coming in different directions, uh, different uh, Depths, and in particular, there is this uh, very strong change in the orientation of the coast. Right? It's particularly, it's mostly northeast, uh, southwest, and here it changes direction. It it it, mo it moves to east and west, and this abrupt change of coastline uh, causes uh, uh, a meandering of the Brazil current, and it's in this area is very known for the presence of 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 eddies, and in particular, this add dipoles of, of uh, uh, cyclonic and anticyclonic uh, movements. So that's what I'm trying to, 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 under, to understand. This is a, a, a zoom of what happens with the Brazilian current and the formation of these uh, edges and the formation of these vortices. And in general, what, what happens is that one vortice, uh, the cyclonic vortice, is approached by an, an anticyclonic vortice, and they bound together, and they move together after some, after some stages, and can stay together for, for weeks, five, six weeks, and they are uh, very abundant in this region. Uh, so why do you want to understand that? Because it's very energetic, and it's very present all over the year. So we, he we have here some uh, uh, estimations of they are, they are extremely easy to, to be detected because there is very strong signal in the, in the sea height anomalies with, with uh, opposite signs in the, because of this uh, 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 clockwise and clock, counterclockwise movement. So there is a very strong signal in the, in, the sea, in the surface height anomalies. So it's easy, in a sense, to, to detect them. So we can see that they are present in this region. It's a very specific region, very small region, right? They are present all year round. Uh, they have, a, 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 in general, a, a, life, a, a lifespan of five, six weeks. They have this, this dimension of 100 and 150 kilometers in general. And it, as you can see, they are always present or they have a very strong presence in this very small region again. So they are, they are not just 
particular thing about uh, this region, they are everywhere. So this is a, and they are very energetic. So this is, a, I suppose, an interesting uh, subject to, to try to understand. So you're going to use two ways, two tools to try to understand, to try to, to investigate, to try to, to shed some light to this problem. The first, of, the first one is this uh, uh, new methodology that you have just developed. You have just, not, not just, we didn't just ha have just developed it yet, but you have just published it. Uh, it's a totally different way to, to extract the web spectrum. It's not based on, on ESA's uh, algorithm, it's completely independent. And we believe that is something that is, is bringing uh, new insights, especially about the shape of the spectrum. Uh, I've been working with the WVW spectrum from ESA, ESA distributed spectrum. I think it's written somewhere here. No, it's not written here. And I've compared this with spectra with measurements, with boys, with, with, with uh, numerical models. And although the significant wave height extracted from ESA's retrieval is pretty good, it's pretty good, but the shape of the spectrum, when you go into the details, you see that it's not that good. There's loads of tricks that I believe they are, they are playing with to improve the significant wave height, the total significant wave height, but when you look at the shape of the spectrum, retrieved by ESA, it's not that good. So we are trying to do something different, and there's, there's some points here that I, I suppose are the, mo the most interesting ones about this new retrieval scheme. Uh, so we are, we are tracking the directional wave spectrum from sal look cross spectrum. That's the first thing. The other thing is that this method is very cheap computationally. It's very easy in, to implement and it's easy to run. It's, it doesn't require a uh, strong uh, uh, computational uh, effort. And the other thing that is a very interesting point, it doesn't need any a priori information, don't need any first guess, which is usually the case with the, with the non-retrieval uh, schemes. In general, we need information from the wind or you need inter information from the wind sea. We don't, do, we don't need that. It's a self-contained uh, uh, algorithm. There are some limitations, of course. The first, the most important thing, and Yuri is going to talk about this in detail, right? He has a, a talk, I think it's in a, in a couple of days, right? He's going to talk about this uh, uh, methodology in detail. But one, another in interesting thing is that uh, uh, you don't need the first guess. And, uh, and, and because it's linear, right? Because there, is, there are limitations, we have proposed uh, uh, corrections, look up tables to correct the biases. We lose some information. In, especially in the high frequency band, in the azimuthal high frequency band, because it's extremely nonlinear. But on the other hand, we, we have, we're pretty sure that the shape of the spectrum is much better than the shape that is a distributed uh, 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 spectra. So we are going to discuss these things. Uh, it's self contained, and we present some regressions to correct the, uh, the non inclusion of the nonlinearities. And here is just one example of this. A particular thing that I'm saying, here we see uh, the track that is from, from uh, the data set that you use to, to, to uh, uh, calibrate the, this methodology. This is era, era 5 uh, directional spectrum. This is our spectrum link, and this is the one uh, uh, retrieved by ESA, right? European Space Agency. This is very common when you look at this spectra from ESA. Who, who has worked with this kind of information is very aware of that. The ambig ambiguity is retained in, mo in many cases. In our study, it was around one third of the case. The ambiguity was not, was not resolved. And so when there is especially a, a low signal to noise ratio, they just uh, set a flag of quality and they keep both, both, uh, uh, both peaks which is a problem when you want to do uh, analysis of considering the spectral shape. So, uh, but even though when you look at the significant wave height, in general, it's pretty good. It's pretty close to, to era five. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what they do, what kind of trick they do, they do, but if you look just to the spectrum, you can't understand what, why significant wave height from their, from their methodology is so good. Anyway. And the other thing that you're going to use is going to use the wave watch. Uh, pretty basic thing. We're going to run the model with currents and without currents. 
Pretty, pretty simple like that. And we are going to compare the, the results. What's the difference in the area of the deep dipole? What happens when you consider the currents that, that are generated by, the, by uh, the dipole? And so just basic stuff here. These are the boys that you are going to use, that we use for the calibration of the model. We're not going to discuss that here. Uh, I think that Jesus is going to talk about this, this data pretty soon. We are doing other, other stuff together. We are trying to understand the swell decay using these two boys in particular that are aligned over a, a great circle. But here, uh, you use this, 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 this boy to calibrate the model. So there are some details here I'm not going to tell them. The, I think that the important thing to stress is that you're going to use HICOM to uh, generate the, the, the currents. The other important thing is that uh, there are measurements. I'm going to show that in a while. Uh, in this area in particular that I'm going to show you, there are mooring there. So we are pretty confident about the quality of these uh, 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 runs of HICOM because the Brazil oil, Brazilian oil company have loads of measurements in this area, so we, we validated this, uh, the output from the model, right? So here's the, the, the a zoom of the area that you're going to discuss. Again, this is the, the, it is Rio de Janeiro, and this is the one of the key things about the, 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 the one of the key uh, features of the, uh, of the, this region, see, there is a very strong change in the orientation of the coastline. I'm not going to get into details here. It's not in, for interest for, for for who is working with waves. But this change of the the change is a very strong change in, in the direction of the Brazil current is is responsible for the creation of these edges, right? And in general, there are they are cyclonic edges, uh, and sometimes. There are all the, all the edges that are formed away from this region, and they come together, and they bound together in this area, and they form what is this called, this dipole. So you see there is a cyclonic uh, vortex, and a ninth anticyclonic vortex, and they bound together. And one of the key things, one of the interesting things about them is that there are jet between them that's very strong, with, with currents that are much stronger than the jets themselves because of this convergence of, of currents. And here is the... One of the uh, uh, data that you're going to use, data from the HICOM model, uh, showing the presence of this cyclonic uh, jar here, uh, clockwise, and the other one, the, uh, the counterclockwise here. Exactly schematic, uh, with a schematic view here. So that's what I'm going to try to understand. We are going to use some waves that are propagating basically in this direction from this corner to this corner, from northeast to southwest. Uh, a key thing is that it's not a, a, in most of the, the studies that I've seen, they use monochromatic waves to do that, or they use uh, idealized case with one simple uh, uh, system. Here we're talking about waves. In the, in, it's from numerical model, but it's from real world. So we have a moat model system here, but we are going to concentrate on the uh, spectral peak uh, uh, parameters. We are going to discuss the spectral uh, peak direction, peak frequency, and peak spreading, uh, direction spreading, right? But it's, in general, most of these spectra have three peaks, but you're going to concentrate on this very, uh, on this single day, right? Third, uh, August 31st, 2010. So, uh, this is, the, this is a string function, right? It's one of the ways to, to, to try to uh, express how vorticity is important here. So, so that's the idea. You have a, 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 a clockwise movement here and a counterclockwise uh, uh, move, uh, movement just in the neighborhood, in the, in the vicinity of the, of the, of the cyclone. Okay, so this is uh, uh, an illustration of what we are going to, to study. This is the simulations from, from one of my colleagues. He is one of the authors of what we expect is going to be a, a paper in the future. So you see here a cyclone, very, very nice, very well 
very well put. And if in, and here we have like uh, six snapshots with different datas, 18th, 25th, 1st of September, 8th, 15th, and 22nd. So here in the first snapshot, we, we see the cyclone, and there is an anticyclone that's moving westwards. And they, and this anticyclone is getting closer and closer. And on the 1st of September, they bound together and they form what is called uh, this mushroom-like eddies or eddy dipoles. And they stay together for a couple of days till, till uh, 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 20 days at least for these simulations. And they have in particular this very strong jet in between them. So uh, although the currents are not that strong, it's, it's less than one meter per second, but it's for this region, these add dipoles, they come up, they, 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 uh, they make these very strong currents in the, for, this, for this particular area, okay? So that's the idea, what you're going to try to, to understand. Okay, so uh, the first thing that you, you're trying to understand is what's really important for, for the transformations. Here, we have, it's a one-day average from the high output of the uh, vorticity on the left and divergence on the right. You can see that the cyclone is very, uh, the, the arrows are the, the surface currents, okay? And here the colors are uh, the vorticity and divergence. So you can see that the, the cyclone is very clear uh, determined. It's, it's clear, it's, it's nice, and, and, and it's easy to, to, to spot, but the anticyclone is not that clear. Okay, so you can see that you have negative vorticity right on top of it, but the positive, positive vorticity is not that clear uh, uh, close to the, to the, to the anticyclone. And, and, and you have plotted as well the divergence, but we are more interested in the vorticity because we're expecting that vorticity is going to be responsible for refraction. Stronger refraction is going to be more uh, related, linked to vorticity than to, uh, uh, to divergence. That's what we are expecting. That's what, we're, that's what you're anticipating. So that's the, what you're going to do now. You're going to keep this uh, plot of vorticity and divergence, and, and you're going to uh, pl uh, uh, plot together the four parameters, significant wave height, directional, uh, peak direction, peak period, and peak directional spreading. And we are going to try to understand what's going on with these parameters. Again, on this very single day, right? We, have, we, we, made a, a net, we, we came up with an average over one day, and you're going to try to understand. So this is significant wave height, okay? The first thing that you can, that is it's obvious to, to, to all of us, here is the uh, difference between a run with currents and a run without currents. It's clear that the presence of currents is going to uh, bring, is going to uh, 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 make this special uh, gradient of significant wave height. The, the presence of the currents, without the currents, it's, very, it's, it's, it's pretty much uh, 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 uniform, this area, but without currents, we have these strong variations of significant wave height. And we have, uh, significant wave height here should have written that down, but it's not. It's something around 1.2 meters or something like that. So we are talking about something, 0.1 centimeter, centimeter is something around 10%, uh, maybe a little bit less, 15%, something. So it's pretty much something like in terms of 10 or 15%, what you can see here. So there are changes. That's the first thing. When you, when you insert the currents, there, is, there are really special variations in single point wave height. There is a pool of decrease of single point wave height in this region, and there is a, a, a slight increase here. Uh, here is something else. I'm not going to get into details here. It's something that's not really related to, to the dipoles. So uh, don't ask me anything about that, right? Because I don't know what's really going on. I'm trying to concentrate here in the around the cyclone and the anticyclone. It's not that obvious, but it's more or less related to the position of the cyclone and the, and the anticyclone, right? A little bit further away, because I imagine that's refraction. The currents here are gonna cause refraction. There's gonna be divergence and convergence of energy, and that's what you're gonna see here. And this divergence and convergence is gonna depend, uh, depend on, the, on the sign of vorticity. 
So that's the first thing here. We have different wave height. It's not exactly the best thing to, to start looking for. I think that the best thing is to take a look at the uh, peak direction. So the same thing here. We are plotting uh, the difference in peak direction with and without currents and looking at porticity and divergency, right? But in the, in the color bar means uh, peak direction. So you can see again, in the, pretty much in the same area of the, where there's there are the pools of synchronous wave height, of, of difference in synchronous wave height, you have uh, 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 an, an increase in direction here and a decrease in direction here. So that's, uh, uh, and, and if you take a look at the divergency, this correlation is not, that's not correlation, that's not a good word, but this kind of proximity between an, an effect of vorticity and an effect of, 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 on, di on the peak direction is not that obvious. At least, I don't know if I'm trying to see that really, because it's kind of messy, right? But it seems to me that's more obvious a relation between vorticity and, this di and these changes in, in the parameters than considering uh, divergency. But anyway, you see that there is a, a, a change in direction, right? For a minus and a positive and a negative change nearby, the, just a little bit after, in, in, in terms of direction, propagation direction, uh, in terms of uh, the presence of the cyclone and the anticyclone. Okay, so that's one of the reasons. But again, it's clear that there is a, a gradient of this parameter, in, of all these parameters, when you when you consider the presence of the of the dipole of the currents of the surface currents, right? So this is one of the points. Uh, so because of, so coming back to synchronous wave height, okay, we believe that refraction is going to change the direction of the waves, and that's going to cause the increase and decrease. Of the of the of this difference, right? Considering the presence or the absence of currents, the other point, uh, the other parameter is uh, spreading, directional spreading, and it's pretty uh, pretty much similar to to directional the, the peak direction. We have a pool here of increase of uh, of, of of directional spreading. The, the the waves are getting broader. The spectrum is getting broader. And there's a decrease in this region. Again, uh, it's more, again, it's more correlated to uh, the vorticity plot. And the last one is uh, peak period. And it's not surprising, at least I, 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 we were expecting something like that. There is a, 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 a more or less opposite sign with peak period and synchronous wave height. Uh, the region where, where there is an increase in, uh, in synchronous, synchronous wave, wave height, there is a decrease in the, in the peak period and the other way around, right? And probably that's connected to conservation of wave actions. If the, if the period is increasing uh, uh, energy, synchronous wave, wave height, is, we are expecting to decrease. So that's the general idea. So there's something going on when you consider the dipoles. There is a change in the in the parameters, and then you decide to take a look at the spectra. Let's take, let's see what's going to happen with the with the with the spectra, the wave model, and the SAR spectra, and that's what you get. Uh, and uh, it's not very exciting, right? The spectra, the, this is the wave watt uh, with currents and wave watt without currents, and this is the spectra retrieved with our algorithm, with linear inversion method. Uh, the first thing is that the, we, we are pretty much doing a good job here. We can detect uh, the peak period quite well. Uh, that is, uh, energy is not that great, but again, we have to take a look at maybe, maybe a, a, a boy or something like that. But the position of the peak is okay. The, the spreading is not perfect. But again, if you take as, as ground truth that the wave, that the model is a ground truth, it's, a, it's questionable, right? But if you take a look at the, at the spectra with and without currents, they, are, they have a really subtle difference, right? This point in particular that, that I've chosen because of SAR, right? The idea was to compare the SAR spectra with the boy, with the, with the model. This area in particular is quite 
uh, a bit uh, far away from the where the things are really happening, where, where the, the this this pools of really really more significant, relative more significant. So this point is around here. So things are not really uh, happening there. But anyway, the the spectra is pretty much the same. They they don't have great great difference. But maybe it's five minutes, right? I'm gonna make it quick. Uh, so maybe that's something that you'd expect because the energy in the end, compared to more energetic areas like the Gulf Stream or, or agulha, agulha currents, this area is not that energetic. So not really significant changes in, 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 in spectra, right? And if you take a look now uh, to another position, and again, it's not exactly on that day, right? It's like two, three days before or after, I can't remember right now, it's written somewhere. But if you take a, a look at another spectrum, and this one is a little bit closer to the to these pools of change, right? This one is something around here. Uh, the changes are a little bit more, again, you have to be really, uh, be, be really willing to say something, right? Because they are pretty much the same. But the differences are a little bit more uh, uh, significant compared to the previous uh, spectrum, right? And in here, uh, again, it, it seems that there is the, the, the there's something that's going to develop here, so the model didn't quite pick this up yet. But again, uh, the point here is that the spectra are pretty much the same, and, and the, the presence of, of the dipole didn't change anything really, to be honest. So again, this is very, very the very beginning. I'm just trying to put some ideas on, on the table just to discuss. But uh, we see, in, in fact, that there are uh, special, special variations of these four parameters. Uh, and they seem to be pretty much consistent with other publications that I've seen using synthetic data mostly. So the, the changes are of this order of, of, or, uh, of, or of this same, of this same uh, order. Uh, but these variations are quite small. I mean, probably less than 10% or, or much less than 10% sometimes, depending, depending on the position that they are. And what we're trying to figure out, what's, what we're going to do next. Uh, Vorticity and divergence are the key points here. I, I, that's the really thing, that, that's the real points that you want to, to, to uh, focus. Or maybe, uh, uh, oops, or maybe uh, aspects of the, of the spectral aspects of the currents like uh, spectral slope, are they more relevant? Are, are, the, are these the key points that you have to look for? Uh, at dipoles, they are ubiquitous, they are everywhere. So. Uh, but even though they are not that strong when you, when you, in terms of surface currents, when you compare with Gulf Stream and other, other uh, regions, Agulhas currents. So maybe, and most of the papers that I've seen, they are considering these regions, extremely energetic regions. So maybe in, in, in regions not that ener energetic, maybe this is not that important, or maybe the chains are so small that you shouldn't consider, or maybe not. What we are going to do, try to do now, you are going to use several MSAT, uh, MSAT wave, wave mode tracks and try to understand the sh how the, sh the, the shape of the uh, wave spectrum changes when they pass over the dipoles. Maybe you can try to, to we have tens of, uh, or, or maybe hundreds of, of uh, simulations that you can use to, to, to try to get some ideas. So, that's basically what we're trying to do. Uh, just to, I should have put that on the first page, but I really forgot and, and I finished the presentation and I, I couldn't change anything more. But some, some colleagues from the Brazilian Navy, from the Yuri, that's gonna give his talk in, uh, in tomorrow or maybe after. A friend from NOC and a friend from the Brazilian oil company. Now, a point that I, I forgot, we, uh, there's a mooring in that region. It was, it was a, a red square in one of the slides. You have a whole mooring in that region and we have loads of measurements there. So we're trying to play with those measurements as well to see if there is something interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nelson. Very good presentation. Any questions? Yes, Jesus. Currents are regenerated or thermalized? Uh, Geostrophic currents. I, I, 
Uh, you mean the edges, right? Yes. Geostrophic. But they are the currents and uh, because also I'm thinking loudly, but it could mean that if they are wind generated, I mean wind waves current, uh, it could mean that uh, first these winds are uh, generating this uh, opposite current, and then the eddies form, and then the eddies later in time will uh, affect the wave. That's my no, no, I don't, I don't think so. I think there are the, 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 the edges, they are formed for geostrophic balance, for conservation of uh, uh, vorticity, and they come together by, 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 by chance, by advection. They, 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 they join together and they bound together and they stay together, but uh, they're geostrophic balance. The, the formation of the edges is, is geostrophic balance. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Nelson, thanks for your presentation. Very, very interesting problem. This dipole and, and, and eddies and the effect on, on waves. And we have to bear in mind that uh, these dipoles or this uh, circulation is really three dimensional. So what, what, uh, what they are really um, affecting the waves is, the, is just the upper, upper layer of those enormous uh, uh, characters. But, my my question is: uh, <clears throat> Have you look at the time scale and length scale of this possible interaction between these eddies and the waves? Because it seems to me that uh, the waves pass them rather quickly, maybe not, and it is a very short time to interact themselves. So my question is. What we are observing is just refraction. That could be quite sensible, right? But not the proper nonlinear interaction with the uh, interchange of energy. So that's, that's an idea. If you have looked at uh, scales of, uh, of this possible interaction between the eddies mm -hmm. and, the, and the waves. Okay. Time scales and spatial scales. See, yeah, yeah, I believe that the main, main, main point here is refraction. The waves are refracted, so yeah, it doesn't, they're passing through, they change direction, they, they respond to these currents, and yeah, I, th I, I suppose, I, 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 that's my, 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 first, my first guess right now. That's it? All right, thank you, Nelson. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. We'll go to the next speaker, uh, Pedro Veras Guimaras, also from Brazil, as a presentation on relative current effect on shortwave growth. Uh, hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, so thank you first uh, to Rodrigo to invite me here. Uh, it's very nice. I was uh, really hoping to come here. And so thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for attending my presentation. So the work that I present here was like mostly done during my my PhD. That was a collaboration between the Coil Central in Nantes and uh, Ifremer. Now I'm not working there anymore, but uh, I finished this work. Uh, this work was published at Ocean Dynamics uh, this year. So if you are interested to look at uh, closer to that, uh, but because of the pandemic, of course, I never had the opportunity to present this work uh, before. So I start the presentation with a bit of a cliche image that uh, everybody already knows. Uh, but I think that uh, that image is beautiful because it shows how complex uh, the ocean surface can be. And uh, talking about how complex the ocean can be, there is this uh, very nice work of, of Edge Zone 2007 that shows how many processors can interact at the ocean surface and actually uh, do something and. Uh, usually nonlinear interactions uh, over the ocean surface. Um, I found this uh, beautiful image also from the paper of uh, Buckley uh, and Veron 2016, where it shows uh, how much the waves structure can change the winds above the surface. 
So it decomposes these works, decompose the winds at the ocean surface in like linear contribution that we are all aware about. Also the waves contribution to the ocean surface and also the turbulent uh, contribution to the ocean surface. Uh, we also have some good works from uh, Sullivan uh, 2010 um, about the moments and turbul uh, turbulent kinetic energy exchange between ocean and atmosphere. Uh, we also have effects of waves breaking on the near surface uh, waves uh, interaction. There are some works from uh, Kudrevtsev and Chaprom and Kudrevtsev uh, that shows how breaking can change the wind profile uh, over, the surf well, over the ocean surface. And there is these nice works also of uh, Herbert and Bidlaw 2008 that also include the current effect of the ocean surface. That it's mostly the topic that I've been talking today. So this equation, uh, probably everybody here uh, already saw in the first lecture of uh, meteorology or some classes, that it's the linear logarithm waves profile that it's uh, based on muan obak uh, similarity theory. And that creates like, a linear, uh, linear logarithm profile over the ocean surface. And then uh, in waves models, what we do, we try to use uh, the wind at 10 meters height and use this logarithm profile to estimate the surface brokenness and then uh, input uh, wind input in the inside of the models. So to include, uh, so we, we use uh, usually uh, these par parameterizations for our, from other authors, uh, depending on the model that we are. Oh, sorry model that we are working with to compute the wind speed based on surface drag coefficients uh, and uh, relative to the air density. And Herbert and Bidlaw, sorry, uh, Herbert and Bidlaw 2008, they also explain how current should work inside of the model. So I use my hand, I think it's easier. Uh, so basically when you have a current uh, inside of the surface, you have to add a relative current uh, to actually will be affecting the wave because when you are at Z equals to zero, you only have like the current uh, moving over the surface. So you have to adjust your boundary conditions to solve this, uh, this relative wind uh, effect. So inside of WaveWatch 3 model and probably most of other stochastic models, uh, how is it done? If it's done inside, uh, I only know WaveWatch because I, I used WaveWatch to, to um, this study. Uh, but how is it done inside of WaveWatch? It's pretty much the same equation. So you have a relative wind that it's included inside of the model from 10 meters high. And you have a relative wind uh, term here that it's a tuning parameterization that uh, according to Herbert Bidlot, uh, it uh, should be around one, right? To be close to this equation. And here you have like the absolute wind minus the current that you are imposing the surface. So this is how WaveWatch uh, solve uh, the relative wind effect over the surface, right? And of course, uh, WaveWatch will solve the Doppler shift that uh, I, I will not explain in details here that uh, we will also influence in the other search terms like the dissipation search term. And uh, while the relative current will influence in the input search term. But like a strong impact uh, over the surface we still have uh, very little observations of the current impact of the at, o, o, over the ocean waves. When we have like moored buoys, uh, the tension in the cables line, of course, can uh, can change and bias the the measurements. And also from satellites, uh, it's hard to use satellites to measure actually this uh, current effect because you don't have 
direct observation from satellite of the current effect at the surface. So it's a bit tricky question to solve uh, from normal use of uh, waves observations. So in the in the work that I show here, our goal is to explore uh, with different interaction of the surface kinematics like waves, current, and atmospheric interaction, and their impact on the shape of the waves spectrum. Uh, and uh, using uh, experimental data and uh, numeric implementations. So to do the ex these experiments, uh, these experiments were done in the EROLC as part of a uh, BB Waves experiment in 2016 and 2015. Uh, BB Waves is a acronym for broadband uh, waves experiment. And uh, the EROC, it's, uh, it was chosen because it's a macro tidal area uh, where you have very strong current in uh, very well predicted areas like the Chano du Four and uh, the Passage du Front Vert. And uh, so you have these two areas where you have uh, very strong currents uh, between two and four meters per second, uh, depending on the tide conditions and uh, you know exactly when it's going to happen because it's a tight, tidal current, right? And to measure waves over this tidal current uh, environments, we use a stereo video system that was in Tatalan on a boat. Uh, we also have uh, a package of six drifting buoys that is called SKIP uh, that were developed inside of Ephraimer. And we also had uh, for the experiment in 2016 uh, two swift buoys that were buoys developed by Gene Thompson. And to measure winds, we had uh, uh, this instrument that it's a small trim around. It's called Ocarina, and uh, that it has like a small meteorological meteorological station that would let drift with the currents. Um, and also, uh, the swift buoys are also equipped with a small meteorologic station uh, on the top of it. So, what we did in the experiment, we we let uh, uh, these uh, six drifting buoys. Uh, so, in the top, it's uh, the six drifting buoys that uh, we let uh, drifting over the current. So. Here you have like currents are between uh, between two and three meters per second for most of the case. Uh, here it's a bit higher current. So in this experiment, uh, in the top ones we use the skip buoys that were just drifting buoys. Uh, we don't have uh, wind measurements for those cases. Uh, and here it's the same uh, the same idea, but using the stereo video system. And here using other buoys to remove like. Uh, to show you that we use different equipments uh, in different experiments, and we got uh, we got similar results. So for the numerical experiment, uh, we use WaveWatch three. Uh, we use uh, unstructured grid, and we refine a lot the the grid over the current areas that we are most interested. In. Uh, I will talk about this later. This is uh, uh, the numerical test that we did uh, with search terms and others, but I will explain later. And this is uh, th uh, those are the results that we got. So in dash lines here, it's uh, the wave spectrum uh, the using ST4 uh, simulation with WaveWatch, and the the solid lines are the experiment results with the buoys. And we can see that we can uh, we have a constant bias around the wind sea peak. So here it's a zoom around the wind sea peak. Uh, from here, uh, for lower frequencies, we we had more or less good agreement with um, with the results, but the problem is that because we are working with small buoys, we don't catch it very well as well. And this is a very well protected area, so the swell don't arrive very well in this area as well. So here it's a zoom inside of the wind peak. So here it's the wind peak of the spectrum, and we can see that the model it's always underestimating a lot the wind seep of the spectrum for all the cases that we look with strong current. So 
we did a lot of experiments, so this uh, must be solving by tuning, right? Uh, we can try a lot of experiments. So we did a no lot of numerical experiments to try to solve it. Uh, here it's uh, the first one. What? Okay, the the black line here it's the skip buoy. It's hard, it's hard to hit, see, but uh, it's the skip buoy. Then the this blue one it's uh, average, right? From the results that I show you. Uh, previously, it's the ST4 uh, parameterization from Arduino 2010, um, and then uh, we have some uh, wind testing. We test different wind source. We test uh, how it changes with arom winds. Uh, arom winds. We also test uh, a coupled uh, simulation that I will talk uh, soon. We test some uh, numerical tests with forcing wind fields and so on. And uh, it was very hard to change that. We even removed like the dissipation uh, source term and we also removed current to see what was the effect and was really hard to get a simulation that was really uh, getting close to the peak except when we changed the wind. So it's a wave model, right? The problem must be in the wind. So the first step that we did, we had some wind measurements. So what I did, I like forced the the model uh, to change the the wind speed, like by changing by a air factor that I call it. That uh, I just took the 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 value from the measurements and forced the model with that value in the the in the that the value that we measured. So this is not measured wind. So I multiply it by that factor by this air factor the U10 that I was forcing from ECWF. It's a wrong test, but it's just to show a point that when we do that, we start to get waves closer to the peak. So we had a clear problem in the wind speeds at the surface. So to explore a bit that later, uh, a bit more, because uh, we only have points, we only have wind measurements at one place. So uh, we don't, we cannot know exactly what is going on. So Marie Noël Bon from Ifremer did a very nice um, numerical simulation using a couple uh, ocean atmospheric simulation that it's called uh, uh, using a mesoenage model, using a mesoenage model following the uh, Voldor uh, et al. Uh, implementation from 2017. Uh, so this is uh, bas basically the current field that we had uh, from Mars uh, 3D. And uh, these is simulations that uh, she did uh, with current and without current. So here it's a simulation uh, with no current. And here it's uh, the simulation with current. So first, uh, I don't know how clear you can see that. Uh, so first we look at U10 because we forced the uh, WaveWatch model at U10, right? And if you look that, okay, there is some difference. But it's not clear, right? How much difference that we have here at uh, 10 meters high. But if you look at the the moment flux at the surface that uh, that it uh, is squared off the U star, right? Uh, so if you look the moment flux at the surface, I don't know how clear you can see in the image, but here we can clearly see the effect. We clearly see the current around this area that we cannot see uh, at uh, 10 meters high. But we forced the model with the winds at 10 meters high. So to be clear, I compute the difference. So this is uh, like the difference between uh, U10 with, uh, with current and no current divided by the U10 with current, right? And so we can see a difference between 10 to 20% around the areas, uh, around these areas uh, between the two simulations. and if we do the same calculus uh, over uh, um, the moment, uh, the surface moment, you, we can have about 90% of error in the of difference between uh, the two simulations. 
And here is the same, uh, just other simulations when we can see much more difference uh, at the moment flux at the surface. So the problem is that uh, we force the model at U10, right? So in the end, uh, we don't use that much of information that we have from couple atmospheric models when we include that at uh, Wave Watch. So here it's uh, what's happened when we use um, the the U star the the U10 uh, in Wave Watch model, and we include that uh, using. Uh, a simulation with current and without current in the atmospheric, and we got uh, we we take the results. This is U uh, star. This is U star from Wave Watch to for force the surface. So we cannot see the current effect at the surface anymore. So. Just uh, to finish here, so in this work, we use uh, uh, several drifting buoys and a stereo video system and uh, different kind of buoys to see the waves and current interaction over the surface. Uh, but in all of the case with different equipment and experiment at different years, uh, the model consistently didn't uh, solve the um, wind C part of the spectrum. And uh, we tested different uh, parameterizations inside of models, a lot more than actually I'm uh, showing here. And uh, the, the, parameter, the tests in the parameterizations, they are not sufficient enough to, to explain this difference. So the problem must be coming from the wind input. Uh, The, the numerical results that we did uh, using, the, using the couple atmospheric experiments shows that uh, actually the impact of the current, they are much more evident at, uh, the, at U star, at uh, near to the surface, than actually at 10 meters high. Uh, the problem is that uh, when we use, uh, when we force the model, we always use uh, wind at 10 meters and we lose uh, most of the current in fact in this in this uh, part so there is uh, of course some possibilities that we can try to use in the future to try to solve this problem we can try to use the couple numerical simulations and uh, force the model with u star instead of u10 this could be like a simple way or we can try to actually Build experiments and try to understand uh, what how the wind acts uh, on the top of current uh, speeds and try to improve parameterizations uh, to better transfer these uh, winds from 10 meters to now. Sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, so the, just to be clear that the condition that we stat he is the study here, they were strong winds and, uh, and uh, sorry, strong currents and low wind conditions. Uh, the results should not affect that much HS uh, uh, because it, they are working at wind C. And the buoy were tested and very calibrated for, uh, for myself in a paper that it's published in 2018. So thank you. The questions. Uh... Pedro, very, very interesting talk and, and interesting problem too. Um, we have uh, observed some changes in the wave growth regime in at least in laboratory cases, especially when we deal with uh, accelerated winds or changing, changing winds, varying winds, especially yeah. in the in the intensity. I wonder if you, you have looked at that in your experiments. Have you considered only cases where we have, you have only stable, very stable and constant wind or as nature produces a variable yeah. wind? So maybe some of the changes are related to varying wind. That's my wonder. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, there was one limitation from this experiment that uh, we were using a uh, small boat. And uh, 
if the if the wind was too strong uh i don't remember exactly but uh this was uh this is small boat here so if the wind was too strong we cannot place the drifting buoy so this limits a lot to the the experiment uh for a strong wind and the experiment lasts like for 40 minutes to one hour each so we don't have a lot of chains and what i didn't show you here uh and it's actually not in uh in the paper as well that we also looked uh, different uh, stations uh meteorological stations in land not uh, in the ocean because in the ocean we only had these small measurements but the there is a station here and if we compare the ECMWF uh, winds that we used to force the model in the other stations around, the wind was good. But the wind here in land, very close to the current, they, they were very wrong. They were underestimating a lot the wind speeds that we, we actually see here. So that, this is what I can tell you about right, the wind. Thanks. Thanks, Pedro. So we should uh, go on to the next okay. uh, speaker. Thanks, Pedro. So the next speaker is Roger Moreira, also from Brazil, and his talk is Nonlinear Wave Current Interactions in Deep Water Vorticity Effect. Hi, hello, everyone. My name is Roger Moreira, and uh, um, I'm from Fluminense Federal University. Uh, Rio de Janeiro, and here uh, I'm going to present uh, a work that I've been carrying out with Julio Chacautana from Federal University of Espírito Santo, and also with Nelson from uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. So I'm going to talk about nonlinear wave current interaction in deep water, and uh, actually I'm going to focus on the shear uh, effects that uh, would be introduced in our model. Uh, so it's well known that wave, uh, waves change their properties when meeting underlying adverse currents. Uh, this is a classical photo took by Howard Peregrine in 1978 showing the Bristol Channel. And we got here the incoming sea waves going from the left to the right. And we can see here the interaction of an underlying adverse current causing all this region uh, that I call it blocking zone, where you have the uh, increase of wave height and causing wave breaking. And uh, in the further uh, right side, you can see the smoothing region where some of these transmitted waves uh, past the blocking zone, but they got, I mean, small, very smaller uh, uh, wave heights. So this is a classical phenomenon. Uh, we've uh, studied this numerically and found out that part of the wave energy that builds up uh, in the caustic region where it's located the the blocking uh, of waves could be released in the form of reflection before breaking occurs. So uh, this slide here, the right side I'm showing uh, a snapshot of the wave profile, uh, actually when breaking occurs. And we can see here uh, some of the registered reflected waves that appears uh, downstream. Uh, if we compare uh, these wave properties, for example, with wave steepness and uh, using linear theory, we can see clearly that uh, the reflected waves follow uh, a pattern that uh, is registered by linear theory, but actually uh, the measurement of the wave steepness for the transmitted and incident waves, they start to be uh, very far since we are computing here nonlinear effects. So uh, this feature was only observed when rapidly varying horizontal surface currents were imposed. And we uh, 
who are actually interested to, to see uh, what would be uh, if we consider in our model, numerical model, uh, autistic effects over the both free surface profiles. Actually, uh, autistic uh, would be uh, affecting our free surface profile here. And we, we introduced uh, this vortice to, to our model. And uh, we will see also that these shear effects would also uh, affect the vertical free surface profile. And then, I mean, we were motivated to study what would be these effects on, the, uh, on, on this interaction. So it's well known that currents generate vorticity, which affects directly the free surface layer. Uh, also that these highly sheared currents result from wind gusts. And Teres da Silva and Peregrine showed that shear flows have a profound effect on wave properties. So here we reproduced uh, this work from Teres da Silva and Peregrine, in which uh, it's uh, we can see here that depending on the sign of and direction of the shear flow, the magnitude and direction of the shear flow, we, we have completely different uh, scenarios regarding the wave height and also the wave speed. So uh, this work has motivated us to introduce these uh, effects in our wave current model, nonlinear wave current model. Uh, so our main purpose of, from this work is to study these shear effects on deep water waves propagating over non-uniform currents. And especially uh, when I compute here uh, the vertical uh, current profiles at the blocking point, uh, we can see here that uh, when the vorticity is introduced, uh, we, we start to have rapidly varying currents that would affect the, the, the free surface. Uh, so in our numerical model, we consider uh, Laplace equation as our governing equation, uh, the kinematics and dynamic boundary conditions. Uh, in the dynamic boundary conditions, we introduced here uh, vorticity. We consider also a periodic model, a periodic domain, uh, deep water, and we use some non-dimensionalization to uh, show our results. Uh, the initial condition uh, was treated in order to uh, consider the vorticity uh, on waves uh, in our initial condition, and also uh, we uh, run the model for different conditions with and without vorticity. Uh, first, we consider a monochromatic wave train with initially uniform wave number, and we introduced uh, wave steepness from 0 0.02 to 0 0.2. Uh, this is some details of the numerical method. It was based on a boundary integral method adapted to include shear, plus the potential current. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the potential, the velocity potential will be uh, chosen from a distribution of singularities, which uh, would induce the underlying flow. And for each time step, we would calculate the potential velocity and uh, uh, track the free surface, uh, the free surface flow. Uh, here I'm showing a picture with the time history of the, the uh, incoming sea waves, uh, incoming waves and uh, interacting with the underlying adverse current. And you can see actually in this region, uh, as time evolves, the development of this uh, uh, breaking wave and uh, here uh, we, uh, we were interested to see what would happen to the, the breaking wave. And uh, we still can see uh, the formation of reflected, a partial reflection before breaking occurs. 
and also with the introduction of vorticity, we start to see that wave breaking uh, would uh, happen before uh, as uh, the, the adverse current is uh, influenced by shear and after uh, introducing uh, negative vorticity, we could postpone this wave breaking and uh, actually we, we would have regions of, uh, uh, in which the wave steepness uh, would uh, present uh, also partial reflection. Uh, considering steep, deep water waves near the blocking region, we uh, could also see the evolution of the waves near the blocking point and uh, the solid lines representing here uh, the solution without vorticity and also we can see here the difference uh, introduced by shear depending on the sign uh, we would have uh, a phase shift of the solution and also we could see that this uh, the, the uh, evolution of the wave to a plunging break is formed in the case of a positive vorticity. Uh, in the case of a negative vorticity, we uh, could see that, for example, wave breaking could be postponed. Uh, we also studied uh, this problem uh, using linear and nonlinear wave theory. Uh, here I'm showing the linear and nonlinear dispersion relations. Uh, we knew that vorticity would affect considerably the, uh, the dispersion relation. So this was uh, registered here by the thin lines. And uh, we also computed here uh, the influence, not only of vorticity of the shear flow, but also of the uh, of the wave height that would uh, augment nonlinearity to, to this problem. Uh, in this case, we compared uh, the stopping velocities, considering the Doppler shift, uh, which uh, the stopping velocity would represent the inclination of these uh, straight lines, and uh, it's clear from this picture that the incl inclination is different depending on the magnitude and also the sign of uh, the shear flow. So based on this picture, we extracted the stopping velocities, corrected the stopping velocities, and we uh, compared in this table uh, the time of braking, which is in the uh, right column here, and we can see that uh, this time is much less and it is uh, influenced by uh, the effects of vorticity uh, introduced in our model. Uh, so as main conclusions, uh, we could see that reflection continues uh, to occur when rapidly varying adverse currents interact with gentle deep water waves. Uh, we, we saw that wave blocking uh, is more prominent for positive vorticities, and we could observe these plung plunging breakers being formed when these steep, deep water waves undergo with strong opposing currents. And as stated by Karif in a paper in 2008, um, we uh, could see that a high wave steepness uh, state uh, would be prolonged by sufficiently strong negative vorticities. So uh, uh, in this, uh, tomorrow I, I'm going to present another talk that I would uh, study the, the, the effect, the she this shear effect on uh, the Benjamin Fair instability. So I'd like to thank the local organizing committee and also CAPES the Brazilian age for postgrad uh, education. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. We have plenty of time for questions. Anyone?
as questions or comments? So one thing that I wondered about is, so when you have reflection, yes. uh, these, so these are shorter waves that are mm -hmm. being reflected. Is, are they waves that are created uh, at the point of blocking instantaneously, or are these actually waves that existed in the incident wave? That no, is, they, they didn't exist. Okay. That, that was due to okay. the non-linear interaction. I know you call it monochromatic. But sometimes, yes. you know, there can be tiny little waves. Yeah, but uh, no, and, and they were already treated, uh -huh. actually, in the case of Vorchisti, when we introduced the Vorchisti as well. Because uh, in that case, you, you only had, for example, without Vorchisti, the underlying current interacting with a monochromatic wave train without any reflect right, waves. Right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Can I work? Yeah. Ah. Go ahead. Roger. Uh, really a doubt. You said that the sign of the vorticity implies yes. in the behavior, right? Yes. Do you have a physical explanation for that? Why, if it's positive or negative, this Yes. Is uh, I've got here a picture uh, that can explain this. Here, uh, for example, uh, we actually uh, run this model uh, where we considered negative and positive vorticities. And uh, when we have, for example, positive vorticities, we actually uh, have the uh, this uh, free surface vertical profile uh, acting on the on the wave. And actually this uh, computed over the the uh, underlying current, would augment the the blocking uh, of these waves, and actually, uh, in this sense, for example, the plunging breaker was formed due to this shear effect. So it was like a, a joint uh, uh, effect that uh, would be contributed by the, the 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 effect of the shear occurring at the surface and plus the underlying flow that was simulated using the singularities. Okay, so it's a double effect that would. So in, in the case of the positive orticity, uh, you have this uh, effect more clearly uh, occurring than in the negative orticity. In, in the case of negative orticity, you can see that, for example, the waves, they start to move, move forwards, so, and they, tend to have a uh, wave attenuation and we we couldn't see for example uh, and breaking we could see that breaking was postponed so this is what we learned from these numerical experiments okay thank you Roger. Thank you. um i wonder if you with your formulation can, can you determine or establish the exchange of energy between the wave oh, yes. field and the current? Yes, uh, and, tomorrow uh, that, uh, that? when we start to uh, study uh, Benjamin Fair instabilities and the effects of shear, we actually uh, had the time series and also the, the spectrum. And tomorrow I will show some of these pictures, but we, we studied this as well, okay? Thanks. All right. Thank you. Okay, so last talk is by Alex Soloviev, working at uh, Nova University in Florida. Uh, hello. Can I have a glass of water? Oh, okay. The table, because sure. I used to live in sure. very humid climate in South Florida. Uh, Yeah, uh, thank you for introduction uh, and uh, uh, thank you for organizer, organizers uh, of this conference for inviting me. Uh, I'll be talking about coherent uh, structures uh, in the near surface layer of the ocean. Uh, my co-author is Kayla Dean. She was my PhD student, she graduated and now entering Good job with Noah. <coughs> yeah. Our presence uh, <coughs> of free surface uh, 
significantly complicates uh, to, uh, analysis uh, of RSE exchanges would be much better if that would be rigid lead. <laughs> Maybe no problems, no waves, but thankfully we have waves because of free uh, surface. In addition to turbulence uh, motions, chaotic motions, there are also a type of organized motions. Uh, and I'm going to focus in this presentation on organized uh, motion motions. Uh, there are two types typically considered. One is Langmuir circulation, which is uh, very well known to everyone. And one reason is uh, that uh, it is visual visualized very easily. You can see on the surface if there is some kind of flow, some lines, everything uh, visible. There is, uh, there is also different type of uh, coherent structures which are related to properties of turbulent boundary layer. Uh, this is uh, so-called uh, REMPA-like uh, structures, and these structures uh, have been, uh, I would say, discovered uh, by Steve Torp in 1985, I guess, published, and then was work uh, I did in 1990s, and then Hemanta Visikara from Naval Research Lab did a quite nice uh, paper with uh, significant statistics, and Steve Torp published a uh, uh, review in 2005, and look like everything is known now. But there is some little cloud on the horizon. Uh, why important uh, to look at the coherent structure? Because this is organized motions, and organization always is most effective in transporting something. It's they're more effective uh, than turbulent fluctuations. And uh, according to measurements done mostly in atmospheric boundary layer, because all this started from atmospheric studies in 1970s, one Anata from Scripps uh, uh, Institution, they were studying it in a over the ground, because they found that it might be up to 40% of momentum, energy, gases, is transferred by these coherent structures. And this is a, a brief uh, overview of these ramp-like uh, structures. Again, they are not so well known, because you cannot see on the surface, the signatures. This is part of turbulent boundary layer processes. It's very fast that these structures uh, eject. Uh, eject. Uh, I don't know, is it here? No. Uh, <clears throat> uh, eject uh, uh, water uh, from the surface, and there is also the kind of eddies. And uh, they're interacting with the mean current, and they produce one side like sharp interface, another side uh, is a more smooth uh, interface. And they're characterized uh, by uh, so-called ramps. Uh, so uh, the structures, first, uh, it's uh, on the, this is on the example of temperature, just, but it works also for velocity, for anything. Very slow increase and then jump, very slow increase and jump. And when we uh, take a derivative, it turns out to be that there are peaks uh, on these jumps, uh, but they are pretty much in the same direction. And then uh, if to calculate uh, skewness, which are shown here, maybe not very well visible, that Steve Torp suggested 1987. So we have uh, a non-zero skewness if uh, we have these ramp-like structures. And that's uh, easier to identify the structures if we just measure skewness. But for this purpose, buoy is not so effective uh, because it kind of in the same, same time scale as waves. And waves, of course, are dominating. But if you start doing horizontal transaction, like uh, putting sensor on the bow of the vessel or on the bow of submersible, or now there are automatic underwater vehicles, then it becomes quite easy to see the structure. And uh, uh, Himanta Visikara in 2004 published his course this diagram uh, on the right side, C, which uh, shows dependence of uh, skewness 
coefficient of derivative as function of angle. And turned out to be that uh, this uh, <coughs> ramp-like structure, they have axis of rotation perpendicular to the direction of the floor. So if we moving instrument in the direction of this axis, we don't see them. Uh, so that's why zero near zero uh, nine, near 90 degrees, but their maximum when the instrument is moving alone or against uh, uh, this current. And they are between uh, zero uh, when it's 90 degrees and zero or 180 degrees, about one <coughs> statistically. Then, uh, Langmuir circulation. <coughs> um, yeah, so there is little cloud around Langmuir circulation. What is the reason? A traditional theory, Langmuir circulation is driven by the Stokes vortex force, and it is oriented along the wave direction. But if you go observational data, there have been. Uh, the disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, deep water horizon, and it produced lots of oil spills, and it was easy to trace uh, from airplanes. They did some images, and these images were showing that Langmuir circulation cells, lines, are not always in the direction of the wave front. Also was part of Gulf of Mexico research initiative, and our collaborators were doing experiments with uh, bamboo plates. They were releasing them and looking for a stat, making photos, videos, and found cases when uh, these lung cells were pinned uh, just along the way for 90 degrees. Uh, and in most cases, actually, they were not coinciding <laughs> with wave front. That was puzzling. And we are trying now <coughs> to resolve this uh, uh, puzzle. And uh, first, as we used to do in physical oceanography, if you go to basics and analyze the assumptions which have uh, been developed uh, for in case uh, of this theory, a traditional theory which is based uh, on the Stokes vortex force. So, what is uh, actually going on in this uh, type of models uh, replace uh, they replace a free surface with a rigid lead that's okay but in order to compensate for this uh, replacement of free surface they also introduce Stokes uh, vortex uh, force and uh, then this model is based on an assumption of weak ambient turbulence in the upper ocean but if you look at breaking waves, is it really weak? Yeah, that's difficult <laughs> to imagine. So what is then happening? Yeah, we can look briefly what is going on in the upper ocean. It's a well-known picture. We have uh, first uh, wave steered layer, which is within one significant uh, height typically. Then we have a uh, wall layer, logarithmic layer, or at least theoretically, it may be not exactly logarithmic due to Coriolis force. And we have a diffusion, turbulent diffusion layer between these two, uh, which is about 10 significant wave height, as Jean Terre determined in his 1996 fundamental uh, works. And uh, next, uh, we can look at the vertical profiles of dissipation rate of turbulent uh, kinetic energy. Vertical axis, its uh, depths are normalized by <coughs> significant wave height. In uh, horizontal axis, uh, this is dissipation rate normalized by significant uh, wave height and flux of turbulent kinetic energy. Now it's kind of standard, it was proposed by Jean Thierry. And uh, first, uh, this dashed uh, vertical dashed line, this is log layer, if uh, it would be no wave breaking. And uh, continuous bolt line, this is uh, uh, wave breaking models, uh, that few lines on the right side, are developed for wave breaking turbulence. Uh, there are dots, uh, black dots, uh, this is observational data, and also that blue dots, this is what we did uh, during Toga Core when we put a turbulence sensor 
in front of the ship and we're making dissipation rate estimates every 10 minutes. That was a few months, so that's a lot of data. So we see uh, here most, most important uh, uh, that uh, log layer, which would be no waves, and really wave breaking case are different for, by few orders of magnitude. So assumption that there is no wave breaking turbulence as it is done in the traditional models of uh, Langmuir circulation may not work well, at least. And also, uh, Good idea to look at uh, vertical shear. There were some observations uh, which uh, showed that in that uh, area of uh, intensive wave breaking, shear almost uh, not existing because everything well mixed. Uh, moving next. Uh, let's, let's go to the traditional theory. It assumes uh, that Langmuir circulation is uh, driven by that Stokes term, US, U sub S, yeah. And uh, vertical gradient of velocity along the current. Uh, but what happens in wave breaking area, there is uh, vertical gradient is almost zero. So this term, vortex term, seems to be vanishes under intensive wave breaking. And then um, we may still expect that below wave breaking, there is maybe some interaction, but if you look at one of the works done by Lee et al, 2013, he calculated um, that Stokes uh, vortex force, and it's dropping. And uh, if you go below that wave breaking layer, it's also small. So why do we have Langmuir circulations? <laughs> this theory doesn't seem to be taking into account uh, everything. So now we go back to these coherent ramp-like structures. Yes, it exists and we see it. So we have an alternative coupled model theory. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is animation. If you could uh, start it from the middle because this is in real time. This is 500 meter long, 200 meter wide and 80 meter deep. Uh, domain and uh, we have have here removed uh, that uh, non uh, stock term there is no more stock term but we see quite nice uh, lines still yeah and we look at the side uh, and then on the next uh, slide uh, we calculate uh, actually vorticity in the direction yeah, and vorticity shows also that tilted lines, which are coinciding pretty well qualitative, qualitatively with the sharp frontal interfaces. And then we have a hypothesis, maybe all this also related to ramp-like structures. So this is green in the model. On the top is schematic diagram, which we have from observations quite well established. On the right side, we calculated the skewness coefficient, and it is zero uh, below 20 meters, but within 20 meters, it's not zero. Means that there are ramp-like structures there. Uh, could these uh, structures actually move along new cells? I need some dramatic, dramatic silence before that. Yeah, first uh, we go to the case of atmospheric boundary layer. When they studied this coherent structure quite well, we could see it. Not, no waves, no moving anything. And that was uh, started in Christian Institution of Toronto by Vanata. By Vanata. <laughs> Uh, started, Vanata started uh, in 1970s at Scripps Institution, Institution of Oceanography, the studies over land. And then uh, was developed uh, a theory of these coherent uh, structures. Uh, they have uh, this periodic uplift areas and uh, uh, some kind of uh, uplift and subsidence, which they observed and that's quite well established. And they also did uh, 
special structure. This is so-called hairpin shape, uh, which initiates uh, this uh, ejections of fluid, which then produce that sharp frontal interfaces. And uh, you can see here a rotation in this special 3D picture in different directions. And what happens when it's continued developing and it touches surface, it produces ejection. It also produces two footprints of counter rotating eddies. But for land, it doesn't matter, they just dissipate. But if we apply this picture just upside down, as here, and then uh, they must uh, have same type of development because wind stress on the surface developing these uh, structures. And as soon as uh, they touch surface, they eject fluid, but also they produce uh, two footprints counter rotating eddies. And uh, this eddies can run long mirror circulation. Actually, it's a Craig Libovich two type of mechanism. But in this case, it's driven not by Stokes uh, rotational term, but it's driven by these coherent structures. Does it make any sense? Yeah. Uh, okay, that's uh, another animation, uh, which is uh, for uh, 50 meters per second, so it's a hurricane category two, I believe. And uh, here we, what we did, uh, we don't have uh, steel that Navier, that uh, stocks vortex term, but we ejecting turbulence now, wave breaking turbulence based on the available data. I was working actually for a very long time with near surface turbulence, so we created parameterization and ejecting. And uh, yeah, it produces these lines, which might be reason for that spray lines, which we see during a hurricane from space. But we decided to actually investigate also how this uh, Stokes vortex force may interact uh, with uh, ramp like structures. One reason that ramp like structures, they still produce some gradients. So, in that uh, uh, Stokes vortex force, we may still some vertical gradient, not that much, but may still. And it can may still drive uh, that Stokes vortex force. And this is the case when we don't have. Stokes vortex force, we see nine meters per second wind speed, it's kind of healthy Langmuir cells, and we're injecting here uh, this wave breaking turbulence. Uh, next, uh, uh, we connected that vortex term. We still see Langmuir type of cells, but they are now like fish scales. So that's uh, probably what is happening. Langmuir circulation becomes more like uh, fish scales. And uh, if you look at coherent uh, structures, uh, ramp-like structures, they somehow synchronized uh, with Langmuir uh, cells. Uh, and uh, uh, Stokes vortex force is also synchronized, but they're not synchronized in between, which produce some chaos. And that's probably this is uh, Langmuir turbulence, which is well known by works of McWilliams from 1990s. And uh, this may explain uh, really what is going on. And uh, since uh, uh, this Langmuir circulation models are now supposed to be included in climate models, it might be good to look uh, more seriously in all these processes because they transport significant part of momentum, energy, gases at the surface layer of the ocean. So our main conclusion is we reported previously unknown mode of Langmuir circulation which is coupled with ramp-like structures. The coupled model is locked to the wind, but not wave direction, so it can be not coinciding with the traditional models. And the computational fluid dynamics model incorporating the wave breaking turbulence has been able to reproduce both Langmuir circulations and ramp-like structures uh, coexisting in space, but coherent intermittent but coherent in time. And uh, what we think now, under low in speed conditions when there is no wave uh, breaking, traditional Langmuir like, circulation mode expected to dominate, it will work, why not? Uh, under high in speed conditions, a more difficult situation because of breaking waves, and the new Langmuir like, circulation mode can complement or even compete with the traditional 
models of lung circulation, as you saw on the last uh, slide. We started this work before quarantine, and uh, now that paper in loan revision because we had to postpone it for some time, but we will submit it, of course, I submit it, and uh, uh, this is acknowledged meant to funding agencies. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Okay, the other Alex has a question or comment, obviously. Thank you. Uh, Alex, uh, as far as I understand, this is a new theory. At least I haven't seen uh, anything like this before. Congratulations. It's, uh, yeah, thank you. It's a new phenomenon. We didn't know about that uh, until five minutes ago, right? <laughs> or maybe somebody already read the paper. Um, I, I uh, have a question which I'm still trying to formulate, right? So basically, this mechanism uh, explains a kind of lung mirror circulation, but it's not lung mirror circulation because it's not Craig Lakebach anymore, right? It's well, just. Oh, it's still Craig Lebovich, too, theory, because uh, just uh, that uh, uh, Stokes' vortex force is replaced uh, by vortex force produced by coherent structures. All right. I, so it's but still uh, same, just uh, uh, advanced. Here I'm getting to the lung mirror turbulence, right? I, I, yep. Which. Uh, I never liked. Uh, I, it's uh, I, uh, some hypothesis based on the use of uh, the stocks a uh, uh, number, right? Uh, but you don't need it for well, here your. Here we don't need because we have another component which is not yeah. governed by stocks number. We need to develop new number. <laughs> I think it's possible. Uh, all right, so um, uh, yeah, that leaves an open question to this lung mirror circulation thing, which uh, I think I still think it's a uh, uh, lung mirror uh, turbulence thing, which I still think is quite hypothetical, right? But um, uh, here is a practical question, right? So that depends on the wave breaking, right? Now, uh, um, unless it's a hurricane, the way wave breaking rate is one out of fifty, one out of one hundred, right? So it's like there is wave breaking if we are in the ocean 100 meters times 50 this 5 kilometers apart between them is it enough time to develop lung mirror cells in a regular way or it requires because it takes minutes right so it may not be enough for the regular mechanism to still happening in between yes the answer is it's not known <laughs> So it's a coupled mode, and how they coupled on different time scales, different wind speeds, it's necessary to look at. I think it may change uh, some parameterization, which are now included in climate models experimentally. Definitely, yeah. right? It's I, a... Yeah, I also have uh, some concern about uh, Langmuir turbulence until I saw this uh, uh, coupled um, mode, uh, because any organization, it reduces chaos, uh, it improving effectiveness of the system. So it uh, has, uh, like if it's organized motion, it's very effective in transmit transmitting different uh, subjects uh, and should reduce lung, lung turbulence. Uh, and uh, if we have now two mechanisms, one is uh, due to coherent structures, another is traditional du during Navier, uh, during Stokes, uh, Stokes vortex force. But what's happening? They are not coordinated because uh, coherent structure due to uh, stocks drift, it's related to waves. Uh, but ramp like structures, it's part of turbulent boundary layer, and there is no way they can be uh, coordinated. And that's what can produce this turbulence. At what extent? I just don't know now. <laughs> Necessary to look in more detail. Mm. Okay. And, yeah, and, yeah, we and we uh, continue this. Okay. this yeah, I probably stopped it. Yeah, next step, use uh, uh, autonomic, autonomous uh, vehicles. We have a couple of uh, uh, gliders now, and they can actually go in horizontal mode, so-called hovering mode. So in this mode, uh, we can see lung mirror, and uh, we can see uh, reply structures. So that we hope uh, will bring some results. If there are other questions, question. we can wait until uh, yeah. after and, and uh, let's thank Alex one more time. Yeah, thank you. And Rodrigo probably has something to say about lunch. Yeah, the ideas go to lunch. The restaurant is close to, to here. Go all together. Um,
come back at uh, 1215. Uh,
So we wait for for Andres connecting. Okay. And uh, is that his presentation? Um, hi, Jesus. How are you? I'm 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 okay. I'm connected, but I'm, I'm not sure if he's projected my presentation. Ah, yeah. or not. Okay. There you are. Uh, hi, Andres. Okay. How are you? There, there is a music, a music in the background, but I don't know if it's also if you have there or not. We we have your uh, you we have your presentation in the screen. I think yes 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 we have it. So uh, welcome, Andres. Uh, nice to have you here, although remotely. Uh, and okay, you whenever you're ready, you can uh, you can start. Okay, thank you, Jesus, for introducing me. And so, but uh, I will introduce also a Juan David Osorio Cano, and he's my, he's my colleague uh, from the National University of Colombia. And so, this presentation I will do with him. Um, that's part of our my. In order to introduce myself, thoughtful. That I'm I'm professor. Let me. And so, yes, I, I'm professor in in the National University of Colombia, and uh, also I'm the director of the Center of Excellence in Marine Science. That is an um, international center uh, integrated with several universities from Colombia, and and also uh, one university from Germany. And today I'm I'm, I'm really happy just to to at least uh, connect it to the lab waves. And so we we were the the host in in the Latvia's um, um, in 2018, almost four years that uh, before the pandemic, and after the uh, tremendous efforts from uh, Rodrigo and the University of, uh, in Uruguay that uh, you have the, this fantastic conference of waves in Latin America that we are very happy just to the. The, the full collaboration of all the colleagues that's coming to to Uruguay and thank you Alex and I, I know that uh, Paco Eric and so Luigi I don't know if he then he's there or not but it's many many people that help us in all the uh, understanding of different processes of aerodynamics of waves understanding the physics process of, of waves in general and in particular in this case I will start in a about the natural structures interaction, mangroves, corals, and seagrasses. And, um, and I will share my, my talk, as I said before at the beginning, with Juan David Osorio, and he's a civil engineer, PhD in marine science, and submarine researchers also in the National University. And I will uh, start with some, uh, some concepts about theory, and introductions, and after that, I will present some examples of what we are doing in our research group uh, in in topics of corals, mangroves, and seagrasses. And also, we have some physical participants uh, from our research group, um, some students, and Paula, Camilo, and Juan Paulo, that they will present the others kind of approaches that we are trying to do in this interaction of waves and structures in general. And so, but um, I will start why we started this this line of research in our research group is because uh, when we observe ecosystems uh, like a coral, seagrasses of mangroves, and the process of interaction of waves with these ecosystems are all of them related with the connectivity of ecosystems. Um, ecosystem services. What kind of ecosystem services? For example, when we have an extreme events, the coral reefs is a, a natural barrier of protection. And so, but depends of the uh, roughness of the, of, the, of the coral reefness. And so this interaction between the roughness of the coral reefs uh, against the action of the waves, it's important to understand in the, in the hydrodynamics. And the same way that the hydrodynamics internally into the mangroves of seagrasses, could provide nutrients that provide at the end uh, the health of the ecosystems, for example, for productivity, primary productivity, and different ecosystem services like a, 
uh, uh, food, for example, you know, fishes, uh, fisheries in general. And so that is uh, the, the motivation. So it's important to understand these hydrodynamics, right? These waves over these ecosystems. And so our question is, uh, how or, sh or should the ecosystem be considered into the wave propagation models to account the wave energy dissipation due to bottom friction, or how we should to do that? So, but say uh, in the traditional process of, of dissipation of wave energy, we understand some a uh, process like a wave breaking and but uh, over uh, beaches, uh, sand beaches. But when we have different uh, bottom like a uh, a strand or, or, or in these cases, a natural ecosystem of rocks. And so it changes this, this roughness. And so it's important to understand that process. Um, I will start directly. And so I know that you started uh, with different approaches of the, of the waves. And so uh, when we have phase average models and the wave actions, and so, but the, the, the flux of energy of, of the waves and interact with the with the different process in the right side of the equation we should include different mechanisms of generations and in, in the case of we watch one uh, the the interaction or, or winds or or in non-linear interaction for example but also the mechanisms of dissipations and one of the mechanisms of dissipation is the is the wave breaking for example you know but also the, the, the friction or vegetation. And so I, I here I have two uh, terms in this kind of equations that, and two parameterizations. One is the dissipation by frictions. And so this uh, parameterization is proposed by Van Dor Dongarin in 2013, that if you could see the parameterization depends directly of the uh, say wave height, and the root mean square of the wave height and the period. And so, but of course, and a wave number. But also there is a parameter of friction, a friction factor. This friction factor is a, an, a number that we include in depends of the, of the roughness, but we don't understand really how is this number so the, the depends on what depends of the shape of the of the of the of the of the roughness depends of the shapes of the um, different interaction that we call to find it there and so the other point is when we introduce the dissipation by vegetation so when we have that point um we have uh, uh, also wave parameters like a wave number wave height and uh, the frequencies but there is another coefficient that is a uh, drag coefficients, and so but these drag coefficients is is the same when we compare with the fri wave frictions, and so one depends on the roughness, and the other depends on the vegetation, the size of the vegetation, the uh, the size of the roots, uh, the, the the how density is the roots there, and so but all this is is a one way of introduce in this kind of models this wave dissipations depending on wave friction and vegetation. But we should to gain more details and uh, in, in another kind of models uh, in order to understand the, the real process that occur there. And so what is the forces that interact there? And so there is another approaches uh, with more details about the, the governing equations like a momentum or continuity equations. And so we have here, in the in the in the left side of the equation, uh, the acceleration, the local acceleration, the convective accelerations, but also in the right side we have another terms. What kind of terms? Um, in this kind of equation, in the in the left side, uh, include the um, the wave pressure, the hydrostatic and non hydrostatic pressure, and the non hydrostatic pressure is related with the with the waves. The with the surface waves. But in the right side of the equation, we have the eddy viscosity and the turbulence model, and also the vegetation force. But in these two terms, uh, in, in the, 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 the turbulence models, we should understand the mechanisms of generation of turbulence and the mechanisms of dissipation of turbulence. I will explain in the next slide that, but also I would like that you focus in the effect of the wave, uh, 
uh, averages vegetation force? What is the effect of between the waves and the forces? And in the same, similar to the previous equation that we have in the dissipation of wave energy or in, in the models of phase, phase average models, in this kind of models, we have um, the forces. And so this is the momentum equation. It means that we have the accelerations in relation with the forces. And one force is the vegetation or, or another object that we have there that's could be a structure or could be uh, a coral. And so this, this force includes two terms. One term is related with the drag force and the other terms is related with the um, inertial force. The drag force is directly proportional to the velocities, the square velocities. And the inertial force is directly proportional to the accelerations. And so, but to include this force and um, to solve the ignorance that we have about the physics, we include there these two coefficients, drag coefficient and inertial coefficient. But again, uh, we don't know if the same, what is the value of the drag coefficient or inertial coefficients and depends on what. And some approaches uh, show us that depends of the, um, the kind of fluid that we have. And so the Reynolds number or cooling Carpenter number against the shape of the structure. And so, and the other uh, theory important is the process of generation of a turbulence. And in the turbulence, we have mechanisms of production of turbulence uh, due to shear. Uh, and so if you have the prof the velocity profile, the horizontal velocity profiles uh, is the main mechanism of generations of uh, turbulence, this interaction of the, of the shear. And the other, when we have in this kind of models, the vegetation, we could introduce another mechanism of generation of turbulence <laughs> by the vegetation and depends also directly from, uh, from the drag uh, coefficients. And so again, we have here, again, this drag coefficient, this inertial coefficient, several coefficients introduces into the physics of the models, but we show to estimate these coefficients. And so, and just this is the summary in general. And so, we when we have one structure, a uh, mangroves, coral, seagrasses, and of course the seagrasses could be depends the the flexibility of the of the uh, the stick. And so, depends on the interaction of the wave and the forces with the structure. And so, we should to try to carry out some laboratory experiments numerical experiments, field experiments, to try to measure the velocities and the accelerations and the forces in order to find the, the real force and these coefficients, drag force or inertial force, and how important is the contribution in the dissipation process, one or the other. In order to solve this, uh, I will present it, uh, some examples uh, about that. And so, but we use it physical modeling um, in, on, the, on, the, on the field and also on, on laboratory experiments. But at the same time, we use a uh, mathematical modeling uh, with different approaches and with different scales. And at the same time, we try to propose new formulations to introduce in this kind of models from the small scale to larger scales. And so now I, I will give the, the talk to Juan David. Uh, Juan David did uh, his PhD in, in dissipation of wave energy over coral structures. And so, but uh, he's the, the best person to expert to explain this part of the our research work. Juan David, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Andres, for the introduction. I hope everybody can hear me well. Uh, so I, I will continue to explain a little bit more about a, a certain kind of ecosystem, which is uh, the coral reefs. Uh, I decided to start studying corals since more than 10 years ago during my PhD, and I'm still working on it. And uh, this is still an ongoing research uh, topic. That's why we have now 
our master students uh, there in Uruguay, helping me with this and working with us in numerical modeling, physical modeling, and field experiments. <coughs> As a start team, sorry. <coughs> <coughs> As a starting point, I would like to mention that before starting with the formulas and, and parameterizations, uh, I wanted to, to give you uh, like an overview of, of what we like to do before. It's like to have a framework of, of uh, our research line. We, that's why I divided this uh, kind of uh, topic into four different stages. The first one is to understand the physics uh, around the ecosystems that we have in coastal areas like mangroves. Say, I don't know, uh, Andres, if you can just say it's next slide, next, next, until have, yeah, just just like that before, yeah. So we have uh, four different stage. The first stage is to identify which kind of ecosystem we have. Uh, and based on that, the idea is to understand the role of those ecosystems into the wave propagation models, which at the end will give us different protective services uh, that will help us, uh, for example, against beach erosion or flooding, for example. But at the end, we are we are just we are researchers, we are scientists, but all the information and all the tools and all the formulas that we generate should be for something. And the idea is to include or to implement all of that into the coastal management plan. That's the hardest plan, hardest uh, thing I will say, because at the end, all this makes sense if we can uh, contribute for a uh, appropriate coastal management plan. I'm now living in San Andres Island, surrounded by very nice coral reefs, areas, mangroves and seagrass. But uh, in terms of management of all of those ecosystems, we are still uh, in a beginning. We, we have to understand the physics around that and understand very well the protective services that we that are provided by those ecosystems. And to do that, we, we have to do all this uh, physical analysis in terms of understanding the contribution on the role of those ecosystems into the propagation models. If we have a well barrier reef or if we have a well mangrove forest, for example, then for sure we will have um, wave damping and we will have a uh, less flooding. We just passed a hurricane last week. And uh, two years ago, we had a Iota hurricane passing through the archipelago with very devastating uh, uh, things in, in the archipelago. So then is, is why all of these things uh, make it uh, important for us. Next, please. So the point is how can we include the ecosystems, the natural ecosystems into the wave propagation models. Andres already said that we should consider the frictional coefficients, but the frictional coefficients are still very poor in terms of, uh, for example, in case of corals, which one we should use? It is not just a, a, like a single coefficient factor, like a constant that we should implement like based on a tuning of the numerical models, considering our weight data, for example, then it's important to understand the physics behind that and why we should use an FW, for example, frictional coefficient factor of 0 0.3, based on what? The kind of species, the kind of uh, material we have, the healthy of the ecosystems, the distribution of the different kind of corals, because it's not an homogeneous bottom. So we have a very open, still open questions regarding that. Uh, Next, yep. So, which one we should use? Uh, I during this research, I I try. Uh, if you can see the table, is a uh, between zero and one. Is a uh, is a uh, from Rolving two thousand and fifteen. But if you can see there, you can use a single coefficients of zero point zero one up to one. But the the new, uh, I mean contribution for new authors, new papers in recent years, we, we can find frictional coefficient factors above uh, one, maybe two or three, for example. And Paula will gonna show us later on uh, what we got from field measurements here in San Andres regarding these uh, frictional coefficients. So I wanted to do a numerical analysis, a sensitivity analysis with that friction coefficient. Next, please. 
And this is just an example of how is the envelope of the wave high along a reef profile, considering, for example, a frictional coefficient of 0 0.3, which means uh, covered by corals, for example. Uh, remember that it can be up to one based on Swan model, for example, or X beach model, for example. And we have different uh, different behaviors of the envelope of this uh, wave high depending on on that, if we have a zero level of a uh, tide, or if we have is the left side or in the right side, we have two meters of wave uh, of tide, for example, tide level. Then we will we will have, of course, a different kind of uh, envelope of the uh, wave uh, uh, wave dissipation along the reef profile. But considering the same friction coefficient, now what happens if we just change the frictional coefficient? Then we will have a sensitivity in terms of coastal erosion and coastal flooding. Uh, next, so we we estimate the dissipation depending on those uh, scenarios of water level, and we can see that the dissipation can be up to ninety percent, uh, or it can reduce up to just eighty percent depending on the uh, uh, flow above the crest of the reef, for example. So. That, that's one point that we want I want to to focus highlight is that uh, the importance of in our in our archipelago of the reef barriers in terms of preserving the reef crest to dissipate that kind of amount of energy is more than 20 percent uh, energy uh, that is a uh, uh, produced due to the presence of a, a well and healthy barrier reef in the case of San Andres um, next. So I, I want to uh, explore or to show you some methods that we use to understand a little bit more about these uh, frictional uh, factors. And that's why we perform a uh, field work in Tesoro Island. It's located in the Colombian Caribbean Sea. It belongs to the Rosario Island National Park. And we, we have, uh, we, we deployed five different sensors, uh, a Doppler sensors called AWOC. Uh, if you can see in the left, right side, the location of the four sensors. I don't know, Andres, if you can, with your mouse, help me with that. Uh, yeah, so that's the transect. And we have in the lower part, the location of the different ones. AWAC, Doppler sensors, RBR, AQ, AQ1, AQ2, and AQ3 are just uh, pressure sensors to measure the evolution of the wave, uh, wave high along that reef uh, profile. That's the reef profile at Tesoro Island, and we estimate that only one meter above the reef crest uh, uh, in that reef profile. So we wanted to explore the dissipation along that. And with that, next, uh, that's just uh, to show you the, the kind of equipment that we are using uh, during the, the field trip. And with that, we, we use the, those data to uh, validate a uh, a computational fluid dynamics model called uh, open uh, form and you can see in the right upper side the the comparison between the energy spectrum of the field data in dot black line and the red line is the uh, numerical model so from open form i i i found that it was possible to estimate the the general of uh, the general uh, dissipation of the energy along the reef profile, which was like I, I mean, I, I did it this uh, ten years ago. It means that okay, it's possible to to get into the details about the reef roughness based on the characteristics of the coral species that we are expecting to have in that area. That's why uh, I try we try to perform a sensitivity analysis considering in that kind of model like this, the influence or not or having of having different corals like the shape that we have in a lower uh, figure, we can see the like a cropola palmata, which is a, a, a skeleton, it's, a, it's like a it's like a horn, elk horn coral. It's a rigid one and it can survive in a very uh, in a in a high energy environment like like in the caribbean next to the next to the barrier reef so we wanted to explore at the end the influence of those corals into the energy dissipation what is the role of the roughness into the wave energy dissipation next so we performed the open form model we did a model validation we did a uh, several uh, sensitivity analysis to include 
uh, the shape of those corals into the uh, CFD model uh, based on the capacity of the model to represent the, the, the shape, the, the very, very complex shape of the bottom uh, surface. Next. And this is just some results that I wanted to show you. The, in the left side, we have two plots. Uh, the upper one is the it is the the evolution of the waves along the reef, considering that, that that we don't have any kind of roughness like corals. And the other one is the contrary. We we have a rough scenarios with corals. What is the influence? And we can see we saw different effects on the anticipated wet breaking. We saw a detachment of the understock currents, and we have um, and we can see also the influence that having a very rough surface then we have a uh, uh, waves uh, breaking before the reef crest which open uh, more open questions related with the restoration processes now we are doing kind of a, a coral nurseries to net to later put those corals into some places near the reefs or near the the, the reef barrier but then we we should understand better the energy behind and the turbulent processes and the nutrients around uh, how the hydrodynamics will gonna affect that that point. So it's, it's one of the points that we we got. Uh, next, so that is for uh, the large scale. The next scale is okay. Now we understand that we have an overview of a large scale of what is uh, what happened when we have corals or not into a CFD model, for example, and the contribution of the corals, uh, which is more like around one of the conclusions is like a, is around 14 percent of the energy dissipations is due to uh, coral roughness the next step was to understand okay how if we go to a small scale like a coral colony scale how can we uh, understand the the physics behind related with the track coefficients or the inertial coefficients that uh, andres already mentioned that's why we perform some field some uh, laboratory experiments in Germany, Braunschweig, uh, where we were able to uh, make experiments on their uh, current conditions, steady flow, and also uh, with a uh, oscillatory flow. Uh, we measure the surface velocities, the uh, the sorry, the surface high and uh, and the flow velocities in different points, and with that we were able to estimate at the end. Uh, the track coefficients based on the force transducer that we implement below the corals to get the total force uh, uh, above the structure. Next. And with that, uh, this is al already published. Uh, if you need some details we, with that, uh, we can then uh, explore the streamlines and the influence of that shapes, very uh, complex shapes into the uh, turbulence behind. And, and that's one point that uh, Juan Pablo will gonna show you show you later uh, more of these results based on some experiments that we are we perform in Gies and Germany later on. Uh, next, so with that it was possible to obtain the C the C D and C M the the drag coefficient and the inertial coefficient and we found that the drag coefficient in this kind of structure is not the only one responsible of the total force in some cases when we have a, a solid structures branch structures like like the cropura palmata coral then the inertial coefficients appears to be also dominant uh, in terms of the hydrodynamics behind that's the one point that maybe we were missing during the Wave propagation models that maybe we are not considering uh, the the proper uh, uh, coefficient in terms of the importance uh, depending on the uh, what what we have below if we have coral if we have sand if we have rocks or if we have uh, uh, sticks of mangroves and then the the difference between the coefficients will be important in terms of the energy dissipation and yeah thank you can Andres can continue. Um, thank you, Juan. And I, I will try to, so to present to, to examples in, in mangroves and, and sea grasses. And so, because I know that the time is over, but um, 
I think that the different approaches presented by Juan Davi uh, with a field experiment, numerical modeling in large scales and laboratory experiments and numerical modeling in laboratory scales is uh, important uh, to identify the different uh, numbers in these cases of drag coefficient, friction coefficient, inertial coefficient, and how to introduce this into the these numerical models approaches. And so, but just to finish, uh, the similar approaches we follow in with mangroves and with sick grasses. And so, but in the case of mangroves, the important aspects is that we have another parameters like uh, root diameters, tree density, biomass, depth, relation with sediments, transport, and so, but uh, it's a little bit different because the, the interaction in this case uh, should be another approach, but also the same we did, uh, or we are trying to, we carry out some experiments on the field and also on, on laboratory. But here I only show you experiments on the field. In the same place that we did experiments in, in, in Colombia, in the Cartagena, in Rosario Island, that we did experiments in, in, in the coral reefs uh, with Juan David, we, we choose uh, a patch of mangroves, a small patch of mangroves. And this was very nice because it was uh, uh, like a, a small laboratory on the field. And so, but we measured the velocities, uh, the the waves uh, surface, and and the, the and different parameters of the mangroves, and at the same time the wave energy dissipation, of course. And so, but uh, this work it was really really published in in the in the um, ecological engineering. And so, but the different methods to measure the density of the of the mangroves, and we combined the evolution of this significant weight height uh, and the relation uh, with the effective vegetation lanes and, and velocities and renal numbers and the drag force. And what we found it, and we found it that the, if we include the, that we, if we estimate the drag coefficient um, but base it in the data, and so uh, we could see that the data like this um, is the if following this this tendency, it's changing all, all the time. But uh, if we include drag coefficient fixed values, agree with the literature, and so the variability of the dissipation of wave energy is of course depends in the increase of the magnitude of the dissipations depends of the of this fixed coefficient and so but when we compare this model of the drag coefficient variable drag coefficient uh, it means that the drag coefficient is not a fixed value and in many approaches of the numerical wave models we try to use a fixed value of the drag coefficients into the um for for a specific mangroves and so it's not only dependent of the characteristic of the mangroves of course depends of the uh, fluid dynamics the renal numbers cooling current numbers could help us to characterize this process and at the same time if we compared the data the full data of a flux of energy and the dissipation of the energy fluxes against the coefficient, the dissipation by vegetation and the dissipation by the slope with two parameterization, we found it a difference. It's because there is a no linear process that is not as included in these simple models. And so this is an open question that we should do keep in, in the future. And so, but we compared uh, the drag coefficient against the literature, and there is it's a it's a, an open discussion. It really depends of the characteristic of the vegetation, but also depends of the characteristic of the hydrodynamic, of course. And so, at the end, we should introduce a drag coefficient models variable. It's not a fixed value. And understanding that. Uh, 
in other approach, uh, we use it. We try to propose a, a model of propagation of of fluid of, of surface of our sea grasses, but um, try to simplify it, uh, a theoretical model. This work it was developed uh, so, sorry, uh, by. Sorry, Andres, to interrupt you. I will finish. Uh, I will finish. Okay. Uh, I will finish. I will finish. Uh, it was proposed by Cáceres, I would say, and and also we started with numerical models, open file like this. But after that, we tried to understand the the, the complexity of the oxidatory flow in the submerged canopy, and we propose. I don't understand with many details, of course, it's a little bit more complex. But I would like that you focus in this yellow yellow equation. This equation is just to understand. A, the physical process that occurred in the fluid, uh, in the acceleration uh, process here, and the interaction with the sea surface, and with the turbulent process and the friction factor that could be dependent of the drag coefficient too. And so we develop how it could be the contribution of the horizontal velocities, vertical velocities and acceleration and all the process. And after that, we apply this model uh, with laboratory experiments and we tested and at the end we found it this result with this new model and so the the this new model is the is the red is more near more more near to the uh, measurements to the measurements more than the a uh, traditional model where the drag coefficients it was a uh, constant uh, sorry the our model is with the black the black one with the uh, the drag coefficient variable. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Some conclusion is that this is an open area of development in the waves, uh, in, 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 with different approaches, using safety models, uh, understanding how important it could be the dissipation of energies, in some cases, uh, reach almost 80% of the dissipation of wave energy depending on the characteristics and also understanding the, the roughness surface in the different kind of models and at the same time uh, understanding that this coefficients drag coefficient inertial coefficient is not a fixed value in many approaches for example in the swam model uh, the literature recommends a specific fixed value for this but it's not uh, true we should to understand that this is variable uh, coefficient and and finally, uh, in the we chose to follow the future developing new simplified one-dimensional uh, models to understand this interaction between the natural structures and phys physical um, um, and, and dynamics and weight dynamics. Uh, we will show we will follow in, in this in this way more interaction between physical. Uh, engineers, uh, oceanographers, and uh, people coming from the background of natural structure biologies, and also the future of this kind of models of wave models should be take more in details the physical process like a friction or turbulent process in more details so to better better uh, planning. Thank you very much. And so, by just to show you the the kind of magnitude in the real process. And we have the, our contacts and any questions. Sorry for extended a little, a little bit more. Thank you. Thank you, Andres and Juan David. Uh, very nice the topics you are working on. Uh, you let me very short time for questions, maybe for one quick question of comment. We have some. Um, thank you for the presentation. I just have one question. Uh, I agree with the fact that uh, the drag coefficient varies with uh, the velocity all the time. But I also think that uh, it depends whether the coral reef is upstream or downstream. It means that there will be some blockage effects uh, from coral reef to another, from one position to another one. I don't know if you have considered this effect. Thank you. 
Um, thank you. I, I will give the the talk to to Juan, but uh, just to comment that yes, we know that this is important effect, and Camilo, Camilo, that is there, and I don't know if Camilo will present. Uh, something a, a little bit, but we tested different direction of the wave energy of wave fluxes over the structures, and definitely is is an important topic. One, if you want to complement, yeah, just just to say that during the experiments, I, I based on that, I tried different uh, experiments. One was uh, a single coral, a single structure, and all the experiments with that in laboratory experiments. Uh, considered only one single coral, and the other one was a group of corals to evaluate the group interaction. That's something that we should also consider into the uh, drag coefficient because then the total force will be different based on the, you know, we have uh, another structure that blocks the, 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 the flux or the fluid to the one behind, and then there is a, an influence of, of the different ones. Uh, uh, and, it's, and it depends on how how far is one from the other one, and uh, that kind of things is 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 why during the experiments, for example, with piles or with columns in a river, then we we, we should consider the distance between them to to understand uh, the drag be between them. Uh, the I have to say that the equations that we were using or the assumption is that uh, there is not interaction between one or to the other one. That was a big assumption, but for course, uh, it, it should be a, a group dependent based on the distance and and the the fluid dynamics or the the fluid conditions. Just to say that. Okay. Thank you, Juan David. Uh, thank you, Andres. Uh, so we move on. Our uh, next speaker is uh, Lucas Bindelli from Argentina. Hi, can you hear me? So good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lucas Bindeli. I work for the National Institute for Water in Argentina. And uh, this presentation is about a critical situation that a coastal town in Argentina has and that is in need for a coastal management solution as soon as possible. And um, the institution in Argentina that is in charge of dealing with, with this problem uh, reach to us for some technical assistance so then they can elaborate some uh, tender documentation for then uh, the construction works to start. So to put us on the map, this is uh, okay where we are now in Montevideo. This is the La Plata River and, and its estuary. And this is Las Toninas, the town that uh, is in trouble. This is the Buenos Aires province. And Las Toninas is one of the first towns in the maritime coast of Argentina. And this is a picture of, of the town. As you can see, urbanization is very close to the, to the sea, only protected by the sand dunes here. But if you take a closer look, as we go north, the sand dunes disappear. So the urbanization is very exposed to, to any storm surges that can come. And, and well, it's been, lately it's been causing a lot of damage. This video shows here the effects that a okay the the effects that a storm surge uh, provoked in the twenty twenty one in in March. All of this is has been destroyed. There was a street there before, and now there's nothing. And um, so this is here at the northern part of of Las Toninas, which is the most exposed part. This is a, a current situation, a uh, current problem, but also there's a potential risk. Because at the same time, this is Las Toninas viewed from above. In this town, we have the, the landing of all of the cables that provide the whole country of Argentina with internet. So any erosion problems in that area would create, create a massive problem for us, for the whole country. And, uh, 
as you can see, most of the cables land in this blue rectangle, which is the, the most affected area of uh, erosion problems. So how are we going to deal with this, uh, this situation? What we proposed was to do a um, set of uh, parallel breakwaters that comply with three main characteristics. Uh, in the long term, they, these breakwaters can't have a tumble formation, which is this here, which is when the beach meets the structure. We want to avoid that because that would um, interrupt the, the alongshore sediment transport and that would cause a problem for the next town that is north of Las Toninas. And also in the short term, we want these breakwaters to be a protection uh, against storm, storm surges. And in total, we need to protect about 1,600 meters. So we can't uh, deal with this with only one model because we're dealing with two different timescales. And what we, we did then was to do a modeling system. So we started with empirical formulations from which we selected six alternatives. And then we tried those alternatives into two different softwares. We used Litpack for the long-term evolution of the shoreline, and we used XPeach for the, the, the impact of the storm, storm surges in the morphological changes. From that, we selected just one alternative, and we did some minor adjustments for a better fit. And from there, we just only did on that same um, alternative some hydroelect impact verifications, just to make sure that everything was going as expected. And in the end, we did some preliminary structural design um, because that was one of the things that we were requested from uh, from the DPH, which is the, the institution that was hiring us. So the empirical formulations, um, we took them all basically from the US Corp, uh, Army Corps, Corps of Engineers. Um, these are just some examples. In one document, uh, what they did is they just gathered a lot of information from everywhere in the world of uh, cases uh, that were constructed or that they were analyzed in um, in physical modeling. And they, with, with all those uh, examples, they did some relations between the length of the breakwater and the distance from the shore and other aspects as well. And they took some uh, conclusions when there was tumble formation or when there was just a salient formation and, and all of that. So here are, two, are only four examples. In total, there were about uh, 30 formulas that we used to um, create all these six alternatives here that you can see uh, the different characteristics. So they vary in the length of the breakwater, they vary in the depth where they are located, and therefore in the distance from the shoreline. They also vary in gap, which is the separation between breakwaters. And uh, they all try to, to protect the 1,600 meters that, we men that I mentioned before. So in total, the number of breakwaters will change. As an example, so you can see what we're talking about, alternatives four and five are shown there. Alternative four has six break breakwaters, and alternative five has nine breakwaters closer to the shore. Now, before going into the modeling uh, results, a thing that we needed to, to know first was the hydrodynamics and the wave characteristics. So basically we needed a lot of data. And for that we used a, a previous project that we had worked on and uh, that actually we collaborated with the people from this university with uh, Rodrigo, Monica and that whole team. And one of the outcomes of this um, project was all these dots here that you can see on this figure are uh, virtual boys which means that they are not buoys that exist, but they are points with, uh, with a lot of, of information. They're basically files with a lot of inf information that recreate a set of that data of about over 20 years for both tidal and uh, wave dynamics. So what we did is we took one of these points here, right at the top, and uh, we propagated it with a swan simulation up to the shore of Las Toninas and we obtained all this information here. So basically we are dealing with uh, mostly waves of about one meter, one and a half, with uh, a period of four to six seconds uh, that can go up to 12 seconds even, and with the main direction of east and southeast. Now, all that, what causes is uh, sediment transport 
uh, dynamics that of about 120,000 cubic meters a year that goes north. And all this doesn't seem very, um, very extravagant, very uh, important to cause such a, a problem. But when we analyze the kind of storm sur surges that is, this area has, we can see here in red, we see the tidal level that goes up to 2.5 meters above mean sea level. And we can see that the height of the waves go up to four meters. So this is actually taken from the virtual buoy, so it's offshore. When this information goes to the shore of Las Toninas, this wave is a bit smaller, but they can reach easily three meters high. So there's a lot of energy coming on these storm, storm surges. In, in, uh, in the combination of these two different effects, the result is that this shoreline is uh, receding, is on, on retreat, on permanent retreat, retreat. And it's most important on the northern part of Las Toninas, but also on the southern part of the area of interest. So to give you an idea, this is where the cables land. It's not a problem now, but with this dynamics, it can be a problem in the near future. So I'm gonna go straight to the results of these models uh, because, because of the time. With the lead pack, the long-term dynamics, we did two, two different um, analyses, one at ten, uh, one year and another one at 10 years. And the best uh, alternative was alternative four, mostly because we didn't want an excessive change. We didn't want any for, uh, tumble of formation. So this alternative here had a mean change of 10 meters. As you can see here, line, re the red line is um, at one year and the yellow line is at 10 years. There's no tumble formation, but a big salient there. And uh, at, at 10 years, these numbers stabilize into a mean change of 50 meters and a maximum retreat of about 19 meters. So, so you can see the retreats are about here and there. Um, there are small punctual areas of, of retreat, but it's a generalized um, positive change and a, a beach uh, gain in, in width. When we go to the X beach, the storm surge simulations, in this case, what we did is we took first a few satellite images that could uh, show us the shoreline at different, uh, different times. And we tried to locate um, storm surge that is in between two, two satellite images. So if, if you see here, the orange line is the shoreline on the 14th of October, 2016. And the green line is the shoreline on the 30th of October, 2016. So in between the, th these two images, we have 16 days, and this is the information that we took from the virtual boy of what happens in those 16 days. And in red, we have uh, the levels, the tidal levels. In black, we have the wave heights. As you can see here, we've got one, two, three, and maybe even four storm surges in those 16 days. So we're expecting a big change on the, on the beach. These are some of the results here. Uh, also for alternative four, that uh, resulted in the best one uh, from from all of, of the six selected. In green, we see that accretion occurs at the back of the breakwaters, and in orange, we have uh, erosion that occurs on the gaps. This behavior is expected, uh, and it's not very important. As you can see here on the, these black lines, the dotted line represents the shoreline, and there's no salient uh, tumble formation, only a small salient. If we do a profile of about here, we, we get to those plots. The first plot has multiple profiles uh, put on the, same, on the same plot. In blue, we can see the original profiles before the storm surges. In, <clears throat> in um, orange, we see the profile with the breakwater after the storm surges. And in green, we see the profile after the storm sur surges, but without the breakwaters. So on the first case here, on the first case here, this is what happens when there's no breakwater and the storm surges occur. There's a lot of uh, erosion at the feet of the sand dunes, and only a little bit of the sand is retained at the foreshore. 
However, when we put the breakwater, this is what we get. We get less erosion and a, a higher retention at the back shore, at the front shore. So if we do the difference between these two plots, we get this one here, which is the difference between putting breakwaters or not putting them. And the difference is that we get overall accretion, uh, mostly in, in the, in the uh, sand dune area, which is most important for us, and a little bit of uh, erosion at the foot of the breakwater, which is something that actually occurs and that we need to take some considerations, some construction considerations. We, we have to add a foot there to protect from that to happen. But in this numerical model, we weren't representing that. So obtaining uh, local erosion there is actually a good sign that this model is consistent with reality. Now, once we selected alternative four, we proceeded to do some uh, hydraulic impact verifications. And one of these verifications, what we did was to use uh, Mike Bosinesk to see what happened with the wave transmissivity. So we put a wave here uh, of uh, one meter when the, the breakwaters were emerged, and we observed that transmissivity would uh, go down up to 12% at the back of breakwaters and would be of about 90% uh, in between the gaps. Then if we rise the tidal level and the breakwaters are submerged, what happens is that transmissivity goes up uh, up to 24%, so twice as much as this case, but that uh, transmissivity in the gaps is still around 90%. So from this, we can say that even though when they are submerged, breakwaters are still working and they still take energy from the storm surge. To uh, finalize, what we did is, okay, we have the alternative and uh, we have the main uh, main aspects of the layout, which is what we obtained was this here, the six breakwaters. <clears throat> well, we needed to provide even more information to, to the DPH. So what we did is uh, some extreme analysis of the wave heights and the tidal heights to obtain this table here and to, to ob obtain the data for a 50 year return period which then we used to uh, get a dimension of the size and the weight of the rocks that we needed to, to put there and the different layers and different uh, uh, dimensions for the food and all that. So we could um, get, uh, provide a, um, a good representation of what was needed. So in the, the big result of this, this work was this layout here with this section here. Okay, so as a final um, uh, reflection about this, this was um, a, a somehow a coastal management um, situation that we need to address. The tender process has, uh, has happened already, has finished, and construction is to be about in a few months. So it's a good opportunity for us to, to see how this um, design process has worked and to see what we need to improve or what, um, what is good uh, so far. Thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Uh, we have time for questions. Yes, Paco. Uh, Lucas, thanks very much. Very interesting. We know that uh, this type of erosion is a big problem in many, many parts of the world, uh, the coastline, essentially. My question is, uh, if you have ever been considering, instead of just breakwaters fixed to the bottom, which are classical, to use either uh, floating breakwaters or even more interesting, uh, breakwaters with wave energy conver converters, right? So think about uh, many wave energy converters instead of the breakwaters, and then you could basically reduce impact on the coastline. But even more, if these devices could be dynamically controlled, could be smart devices, they could help you to reduce or modify the wave energy in the shoreline as, as, as much as you wish, right? 
Yeah. Have you considered that? Well, here we had um, mostly two two problems, I think, towards that, or three. Um, the first one is we need to act very quick because uh, all of this is happening now and, and uh, the houses are very close to the shore, to the, to the sea, and each storm surge is a big problem for them. So that technology might take a bit longer. The other one is uh, economics. Um, I think it's uh, cheaper to do this than to provide some energy converters. Uh, but the third thing would be that the potential of wave energy there, it's not as high as to put uh, converters uh, to, to, to generate electricity, you know. Uh, so th they, they would only work to, to take, take energy, but not to, to provide. Yeah, that would be very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the short term, it's cheaper. Yeah. Yes. Yes. They will be damaged. Yeah. Uh, congratulations, nice work. Thank you. Um, we did similar study for Mar del Plata some years ago, and we had troubles discussing the constructive method to build the break, the touch it breakwaters have you something uh, you thought something about this well we the t way or yeah pontons, different alternatives. so that that is to define for the, the construction company that would do the work but yes we based our solution into the case of mar del plata in which they did uh basically a, a road from land to do the first breakwater and then they they moved from there i think uh, but yeah, that we we, ha we did, did this having that in mind. Uh, Lucas, a qu quick question. Your first video was very impressive. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, some analysis or something about the storm that caused this uh, all this damage in 21 or the waves, the characteristics or the storms and things like that? That no, would be very nice to see. Yeah, we, we don't have the data. Uh, the virtual boys actually on only get up to 2018. So from there on, we, we don't have way, any way to, to get the data that, that did all that. Yeah. Very yeah. To see yeah. That, uh, that case. The last what? <laughs> ah, 2018. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we we are using this virtual voice as much as we can because we know that they are validated uh, with the field measurements and with satellite imaging. So we know that that's okay. This is very sound and robust. Let's use this as much as we can. But yeah. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That would be, would be great. Yes, the, the, there should be data somewhere else. Yeah, <laughs> somewhere there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you, Lucas. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Very brave. So we go back to Colombia. Uh, our next speaker is Camilo Cabrera. <laughs> okay, uh, good afternoon for all. Uh, my name is Camilo Cabrera. I am from the National University of Colombia. Uh, the title of this work is Implementation of a CFD Model to Study the Physical Process Around an Artificial Rib Structure. And my co-authors or my advisors are Andres Fernando Osorio and Juan David Osorio Cano. 
Uh, I want to start this presentation with this question. Uh, why, is why is it important to study the uh, physical process uh, generated by, by waves around an artificial reef? Uh, uh, the artificial reefs uh, provide uh, several uh, benefits uh, 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 among which are uh, improvement of ecological environments, uh, habitat restoration, coastal protection, recreation and tourism, uh, and scientific and technological uh, innovation. Uh, we need to quantificate and improve this 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 service for the reason uh, we we study uh, the physical process generated uh, uh, around these 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 structures. Uh, the the structure uh, analyzed in this work uh, correspond to uh, artificial reefs designed by the. A reefs organization uh, uh, and in, uh, this structure uh, was installed at San Andres Island in Colombia uh, and is composed of uh, 228 uh, bricks uh, and these dimensions are uh, 1.4 meters high, uh, 2.6 meters weight and uh, uh, three meters uh, uh, long. Uh, this is the the CAD uh, model uh, 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 used for the uh, numerical modeling. Uh, for the for the numerical model, uh, we use uh, the open uh, the open source toolbooks open form. Uh, uh, these these toolbooks solve uh, the continuity equation and the momentum equation. Uh, the the terms on the left side of the momentum equation correspond to uh, uh, the first term uh, correspond to a chain of velocity with time. The second term uh, correspond to convective term. On the right side of the equation. Uh, 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 the first term uh, correspond to pressure gradient. Uh, the second term uh, correspond to uh, external force that act uh, in 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 the domain, and the uh, last term correspond to the diffusion term uh, associated to turbulence process. Uh, for the uh, for the numerical modeling, we use the interform solver. Uh, this solver is uh, specific to uh, multi multi-phase flows, uh, and uh, we ask the volume of fluid (VOF) technique to uh, tracking the the interface uh, uh, water air, and uh, we use uh, a transient simulation that evolved in the time. Uh, for the turbulence model, uh, we uh, use the less turbulence closure model, uh, considering the one equation subgrid scale, eddy viscosity model, employment the business hypothesis. Uh, for the case of uh, the case studies, uh, we uh, select two, two two geometries. The first geometry correspond to a uh, simple brick wall uh, composed of 19 uh, bricks and the second geometry corresponds a simplified simplified uh, artificial reef uh, composed of uh, 228 uh, bricks uh, the the numerical domain uh, corresponds to a um, uh, numerical wave flow uh, with a uh, uh, one uh, 100 uh, 102 meters of for long, uh, 10 meters uh, wide, and 3.5 meters uh, height. And the weight parameters uh, uh, correspond to a weight height of one meter, weight period of five seconds, and water depth of uh, 2.5 meters. Uh, okay, uh, the machine generation uh, for the for the mesh uh, use uh, on 
in numerical modeling, uh, we as the open form tool, uh, Snappy Hex Mesh, uh, this, this image uh, show the different uh, types of mesh obtained in this process, in this uh, meshing process. Uh, it's important to highlight uh, uh, that we find, we, uh, we made or we obtained a, a detailed uh, mesh that uh, uh, adjusts to complex geometries. Uh, for this case, uh, adjusts uh, very well to different brick walls in this last picture. Uh, for different bricks, sorry. Uh, okay, the uh, corresponding to results uh, of simulation uh, for the first case for the brick wall simulation. Uh, we uh, focus on evaluate the the force uh, generate uh, on to on all structure and different bricks uh, 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 and different bricks on the on the brick wall. Uh, we found uh, the maximum velocity is uh, uh, 400 newtons. Uh, each brick exper experience approximately a 2.5 percentage of total force generated of, of the interstructure of the interwall. Uh, and the period uh, behavior of the series of resultant force, uh, the resultant force is, is, uh, uh, is in accordance with the definite wait period of five seconds. Uh, with this model, uh, we found uh, uh, evaluate the performance of the numerical modeling uh, of the open form. Uh, for the real results, uh, uh, we saw to evaluate the influence of the chain in orientation on interdynamic variables at force, pressure, and velocity. Uh, we uh, we defined two orientations. Uh, for a uh, same incident weight in this direct in this direction, and uh, the uh, the width with largest frontal area uh, is blue, and the width with smaller frontal area is red. Uh, uh, we define uh, six points. Uh, 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 we define six points in the plane x y. In, and the C coordinate, uh, we uh, establish uh, 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 nine points additional for a total of uh, five, fight, uh, fighting four points uh, for each case. Uh, okay, the, the results obtained in this compar comparison, uh, the, the series, uh, this picture, uh, show the comparative on velocity series of time in the center of the, the reef. Uh, we find we found uh, that velocity series shows a decrease in positive peaks of up to 0 0.0 meters per second at the bottom and 0 0.5 meters per second at midwater depth for the case for, of the reef with a uh, largest frontal area. Uh, Records of resultant force, uh, the, uh, the picture of the right side, uh, uh, show uh, uh, show uh, uh, this uh, diminution of uh, uh, twenty percentage uh, compared to uh, to the red with large frontal area. The the blue record, the blue series. Uh, reach uh, uh, until 20, uh, 20 percentage of uh, resultant force for the case uh, the, with the read uh, uh, larger frontal area. Uh, finally, uh, we uh, we calculate or we determine uh, the the maximum uh, the average maximum velocity for all location for all points in in this in this figure uh, we uh, we use the the series of velocity and and and, uh, and, and found the maximum and minimum uh, values and uh, um, and we made an average 
for build the uh, average maximum velocity profiles. Uh, we uh, we found uh, that uh, maximum uh, velocity uh, is uh, between 0 0.5 meters per second and 0 uh, and 1.5 meters per second for the sound of the the reef. Uh, and the and the bottom in this image, uh, we found we see we see, we saw uh, that uh, the reef with uh, largest frontal area exper experiments uh, uh, minor velocities in the in the bottom of the of the numerical domain. Uh, for the for the future work, uh, we uh, we we search uh, to validate the numerical modeling results with exp with experimental or field data uh, from previous work uh, on wave structure interactions. Uh, we explore the uh, influence of different turbulence closure uh, models uh, on the results obtained and. And uh, we explore uh, the different solvers uh, in uh, CFD toolbox to evaluate the flow, sediment, and structure interaction, the three components uh, uh, for uh, explore uh, new, new areas in the, in the, in the field of uh, uh, fluid structure interaction. Um, finally, uh, Thank you for your attention and uh, uh, my knowledge to a uh, RIVS organization, uh, National University of Colombia, CD Caribe and CD Medellin. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Camilo. Uh, questions? We have time for questions. Uh, then I will take advantage of. Uh, I, I don't know uh, if you mentioned, but uh, this is some project uh, for uh, San Andres Island that is going to be built or something like that? Yes, the the artificial reef uh, was installed on San Andres Island and actually uh, the project is uh, uh, made a, a constant monitoring for for evaluate the, the behavior of a structure. Uh, for the uh, for the last hurricane uh, pass uh, over San Andres, uh, the the base of of, of concrete, the, the structure suffer a uh, affectation. Uh, however, the the structure uh, remains on uh, remains sta stable. Uh, 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 this this project I have a component of monitoring. So this already built and it's underwater. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, alternative? Okay. Uh, questions? More questions? Okay. Why don't we thank Camilo again? Okay. Thank you. And uh, then we go to Ecuador. Our next speaker is uh, Wilson Guachamín. Hello, everybody. My name is Wilson Guachamín. Yo soy, uh, I am a, a lecturer at uh, National Polytechnic University in Ecuador. Well, today I've heard a lot of uh, about modeling of waves. What I actually do is I use those waves to compute uh, dynamic responses of structures and also to assess uh, structural responses of fixed and floating structures. Uh, that's the topic. I hope that it will be interesting for you as well. A little bit about the content. First, I will deal with some basics about the structural analysis. Uh, also so about some theories that are already published regarding wave spectra partitioning. 
and how I used it to, I, sorry. And how do I use it? Well, it doesn't be, I can use it, but, well, then after we get the spectral parameters, we can use them to predict extreme responses, extreme HS values, for instance, and apply them to the structures, and we can assess the structural responses. Also, we can use these spectral parameters to assess dynamic responses, and they are very important for the assessment of marine operations. Finally, we will go through some uh, conclusions. Well, here we have a picture of an offshore structure. Uh, the design codes say that basically we should perform several analyses. One of them is the service limit states. Every day we have uh, records of the spectra, wave spectra. They will impose loads on the structures. Basically, we use these loads to see that in service conditions, the structure will be okay. But sometimes, say every 100 years, every 50 years, there will be a very big storm. With this storm, we will have very huge, uh, very huge responses, say stresses, and the structures have to survive it. These extreme environmental loads have to be properly assessed. We have recommendations from standards, but we also have some other uh, methodologies that allow to compute the stresses in other, uh, following other uh, approaches. And we will try to compare them to see whether we are okay, whether we have to improve the standards. We also can perform fatigue analysis by uh, computing the uh, amplitude and mean uh, values of the stress. We also have to conduct accidental limit state analysis. Say, for instance, we have a collision between a boat and a fixed structure. Actually, in this presentation, I will focus more on the ULS uh, design. That means the ultimate limit state design. It means that I will use extreme value uh, HS values for this uh, presentation. Well, the basics about the structural design uh, have to comply with this equation here. Basically, the capacity, say the allowable stress, say the allowable bending moment, say the allowable axial force has to be larger than the, than the demand. The demand, for instance, can be the actual stress the actual bending moment, the actual axial force. This demand that is also called a load response effect is just a combination of several loads with their own factors. These are gravity loads, life loads, environmental loads, that's the important here, and also some deformation loads. All of them have uh, several loading factors, these gamma factors. We can see here that the environmental loads for a combination of several loads are important. That's why it's very important to compute accurately these values. And according to the DMB or the API, they have to co be computed for 100 years return period. It means that from an extreme value analysis, we have to estimate these HS values for the design of these structures. Well, this is the state of the art that people use nowadays for the design of offshore wind turbines. What we have here is a contour plot. We can perform analysis to obtain these contour plots say, combining wind and wave actions. And for example, for a 50 years return period, we can have these contour plots. Each of these points means a combination of spectral parameters like HS and TP. We use these points 
we use an analytical uh, formulation, say, for example, Joshua spectrum. We input this spectrum into a model, a numerical model, and we compute the stresses. However, based on a recent work, well, not so recent, from uh, Jesus, uh, they developed uh, uh, an algorithm for partitioning of wave spectra. We can separate winces and swells. The extreme value analysis theory says that uh, we have the, the extreme responses or also the extreme HS have to be independent and also identically distributed. I'm sure that you all agree that the HS, extreme HS, are independent because they are generated with different storms. But we cannot say that they are actually identically distributed, especially if one comes from one wave system or another wave system. So what they did is actually use just one wave system. Say, for instance, I have four wave systems here all the extreme values from this web system to predict an HS value for a 100 years or 50 years return period. And they did this in this uh, paper. We have a paper from Portilla and Hakome, where for 100 years return period, using only one wave system, they came up with an HS that is much larger, actually, than when you use all the data, all the data from all wave systems, we have this black line. This black line give us an, a smaller HS value. Actually, the API and the DMB say that we should use the combined spectra, this value. Our question is what happens if we compute the stresses using this value. So what we did, what I will show you, is use this HS value with the corresponding typic periods to generate the jones Webb spectrum and input in the, into the, the numerical model or the structural model. But, we also want to do, this is not done yet, we want to input actually this real spectra, directional spectra, into the numerical model and assess directly the bending moments or the stresses and see if we get the same results. But well, we have the HS value bigger for wave system one than the total one in black line here. We have typical corresponding peak periods, we have generated the analytical model for the wave spectra. We have input into a numerical model for hydrodynamic loading. And from here, we get the Morrison forces. We get a time history on the base of the tower or the jacket and the time step at which we get the maximum overturning moment is used to export all the loading into the model. At that time step, we get all this loading. In a structural model, we get all the stresses in the members. We can correct these stresses, as you see here. We have different uh, welded connections. And we can compute actual stresses on different critical joints. That's the methodology. We do this using the combined spectra and using the extreme value of HS for wave system one. These are the results. I will summarize a little bit. In blue, you have for wave system one. And in red, you have for the combined spectra. I hear, here I show only for a few directions. But what you can see is that when you use the combined spectra, you underestimate about 20% of the stresses. Uh, the question is, is this okay? Is this correct? Actually, we got a lot of critics from people from the industry who use 
the traditional methods specified in the standards. We want to show using the actual spectra or, or applying the actual spectra onto the numerical models and assessing the right, directly the bending moments or the stresses in the critical joints to see whether we get the same differences. But here we can see that it's about 20% underestimation when we use the combined spectra. Another important application of wave spectra partitioning is that we use them for marine operations. In marine operations, say installation, transportation at sea, generally you have information of forecast wave data. But we also have limits at which we can work, we can do these activities. It will be easy to just compare these two limits and assess whether windows, whether we can work or not. The problem is that when we perform or when we execute a marine operation, the limits are not a chest. The limits are stresses, are tensions in the cables, are bending moments. So we have to convert responses or responses into allowable limits of C states. That is the state of the art, actually, that we people are using in marine operations. We can compare responses with allowable responses or forecasts with allowable C states. But we have to keep in mind that we have uncertainties in spectral parameters, say, for example, HSTP or the energy distribution of the wave spectra. We also have uncertainties in the numerical models. And most important, when we are at sea, it's difficult, very difficult to conduct a numerical simulation because it takes a lot of time. Like the CFD simulations, they take several hours. But when you are in office, it's possible to do that. But when you are at sea, you need something very fast to make a quick decision and a safe decision. That's why it's important to convert actually these responses into limits of uh, C states. And here, what we have done is use wave partitioning to get a spectral parameters, say HS, T peak, direction, to use them as features for machine learning uh, algorithms and predict responses during the execution phase. So that's uh, this, uh, about this presentation in this part. So what I said, we have a spectrum. We apply into a numerical model of a ship or, a, or any vessel. This vessel has its own uh, transfer functions, dynamic properties. This can, this can be obtained, for instance, from um, frequency domain analysis. And we can obtain response spectra from this vessel. And we can assess response statistics. If the system is nonlinear, we can also solve them in the time domain, and we can obtain time histories of the responses. Either you use frequency or time domain, we can obtain response statistics. We can compare with the allowable limits. We can assess whether these C states are workable or not. And we can obtain, say, curves like this for HS and TPIC. Below these limits, the C states are workable. But of course, as I said, we have sources of uncertainties. And the most important, this is, this is very important, we have to give a quick decision, make a quick decision, and we have to uh, respond very quickly when we are executing marine operations. Moreover, is different when we use the actual spectrum and when we use a, uh, an analytical model, say, for, for instance, Jones Web, because they will produce different responses. Here we can see that in, in black color, we have 
the responses for vertical bending moments in a ship and also for roll responses in a ship using the actual spectra, directional spectra. And in magenta, when we have used the analytical jones wap model, you can see the differences are quite significant sometimes. So we should use the actual spectra. To perform a numerical analysis using the actual spectra is quite time consuming. That's why we use machine learning. At office, we can train the, the algorithms. We can uh, conduct the difficult, complex numerical simulations. We can split the data into training data and test data. Here, what we do is we do the wave partitioning. For each wave system, we get the direction, the peak period, the HS, and we use them as features to train machine learning models, algorithms. Here you can see the, the features. For instance, here we have the HS for six different wave systems. Here you can see the directions for these six wave systems. We also have them for the peak period. It's not shown here. We can use them for the machine lear learning algorithms. And what we can see here are the actual responses, the dotted blue, the, the, the blue dots, yeah? And in green, that's practically the same. We have the responses using machine learning and the boosted trees algorithm. We have also tried with uh, linear regression models, like in the orange color, but they didn't perform very well. So the conclusion is that during the execution phase, we can estimate, we can predict the responses. If we use wave partitioning or spectral parameters of wave partition, we have also assessed response statistics for different levels of, in this case, vertical bending moments. And they are very important for the assessment of reliability of marine operations. That's something that we will do in, in future. Finally, the conclusions from this presentation is that, as you can see, covariate EVA, extreme value analysis, including directionality, can be applied to offshore structures. The problem is that whether this is correct or, or not, we still have to complete this work. And hopefully, we will do it before the end of this year. Covariate EVA suggests that actual design codes could be unconservative, about 20%, right in this example. If that's the case, in future, maybe the, the standards, the codes, may need to be reviewed. Marine operations are highly sensitive to wave energy distribution. We saw that the responses using actual spectra and using jones wap spectra are quite different. For us, for marine operations, it's very important to get a very accurate shape of the spectra. Parameters from wave partitioning can be used as features for machine learning algorithms. We have a good prediction, very accurate prediction. But I think that they can be improved. Finally, uncertainties in forecasts, parameters, and machine learning algorithms should be included for the analysis or reliability analysis of marine operations. We're working, we're trying to get forecasts, uh, the directional wave forecasts from uh, the ECMWF to assess reliability of marine operations. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Wilson. Questions? Well, uh, Wilson is uh, having a lot of fun with uh, partitions and uh, now challenging the engineering community also with uh, new calculations and new methods. And uh, yeah, probably also setting the path for uh, new definition of standards and that's basically his uh, his work that uh, sometimes i have the chance to collaborate 
Euh, non, no questions. Good pre presentation. Uh, good, good, good job. Uh, uh, I, I have uh, only a, a little uh, question related to extreme value analysis. Did, did you check the stationary of the time series when you derive the, the return levels, the return periods? Because now with climate change, maybe the the stationary assumption of the of the extreme value distribution maybe uh, now is violated to to a uh, change in, in climate. Yeah, actually, uh, this is not part of my work, actually from Jesus, but I know that they check the, some parameters have to have some stability at the end when they estimate these extreme values. Actually, that's done, uh, I guess, Jesus. No, actually, uh, it's a very qu good question. Stationarity is not uh, taken into account because actually in some cases we see and we may see that uh, there are uh, changes because of uh, climate change, and uh, actually that, that's not taken into account. Of course, it's very interesting to, to talk about practical problems. Uh, I'm surprised that uh, after what is 50 years that we have a rig into the sea. There is still something to be learned by the oil company because they should, should be it's such an investment that they should be at the top. So do you think it's a lack of knowledge or saving money in the construction or, or what? Because you're basically saying that most of the structures are below the structural level that they should be in some case. What do you think? Uh, I will say that, uh, Luigi, that you know, most of the codes were developed uh, during the exploitation of the North Sea when the oil activities started there, about the 80s, 90s. And uh, since then, there has been very little effort to improve the standards. And since they are most of the time quite conservative, they are happy with that. That's what I would say. But another thing is that sometimes people from industry want to have something in a very simple format. They, do, they don't, don't want uh, very complex uh, uh, equations or surfaces. They want something very practical and very simple. And we need sometimes to convert our findings into a very simple format. Like, for instance, safety factors, loads and resistance factors. I think that we, that's what we need to be done now. No, I think you're right because uh... Uh, one of the things uh, that uh, in a way modeler we were complaining that uh, we push a lot for two-dimensional spectra, but there was not much use of two-dimensional spectra. Most of the time uh, they were working with a significant wave height or just one one-dimensional spectra. So perhaps uh, this is uh, uh, where the, the, the effort should be put for them, you know. To, to, to show in, practic in practice that uh, uh, was there any accident, for instance, uh, you shown an accident there at the beginning as in the slide, the tilting tower, where uh, you or anyone else has done an estimate of the different maximum or condition that uh, act on the tower depending on the traditional approach on the one more, the most sophisticated one that you have shown? Well, in marine operations, we need to have a very good description of the sea environment. Uh, I have seen that in practice, captains, for instance, they rely on their experience. They say, okay, look at outside, the weather looks very nice, let's do the work. 
And with the swells of 10, 15 centimeters, the ship is moving like hell. You cannot do anything. It's because they rely on two very simple parameters, or too few parameters. That has happened. That, that leads to sometimes to accidents. Uh, and uh, economic and uh, also people can get injured. But uh, we need to improve the standards. We need to change it. Actually, the DMB in Norway, they, I know that they are trying to modify the standards, the marine operation standards. But they are still far away because they are using just uh, TPIC and HS. They realize that they need to include TP. But we know that vessels are sensitive also to direction. Sometimes we have multimodal wave spectra. So how do we do with that? You have to hit the vessel, and you have to work somehow. And you need to make that information so simple that they can use it. So I think this is uh, the, the main or the key uh, work that needs to be done now. I have some more comment. We, could, we can discuss it during coffee. <laughs> yeah. OK, thank you very much. OK, thank you, Wilson. Thank you, everybody. And uh, this session is finished. We'll go for a coffee and come back in 50 minutes.
Hello everybody, welcome to the last session of the first day of Lad Waves and we will have the the last keynote speaker of the day, Eric Roberts. So Eric. Thank you. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, wave ice interaction in uh, the uh, Southern Ocean. The, the official title is Ocean Waves and Sea Ice Dependence of Dissipation on Ice Thickness, because that's the, uh, the main uh, advancement that we made in the most recent study related to this. But I have to start by explaining uh, where we get there, and, and that's the previous paper. And so my co-authors are Jay Yu and David Wong. They're both uh, with me in the Ocean Sciences Division, and we work at uh, Stennis Space Center in Mississippi. And uh, so Alex has already gone through the governing equation, so I can save some time and, and skip through that. Um, but I, I wanted to uh, at least draw attention to uh, this term. So th this is the um, a source term that goes on the right-hand side of the equation. And so the equation is used uh, by WaveWatch 3 and SWAN, uh, both of which have uh, already been uh, mentioned uh, in this meeting so far today. And, and so uh, ice uh, is one of the things that causes dissipation in the ocean, and that's why we added uh, uh, ice dissipation source function in, in WaveWatch 3. That was done, I believe, back in 2014. And we've made... Uh, a number of updates uh, since then. Some are in collaborations with mathematicians. Some are in collaborations with uh, other wave modelers. And uh, and I'm going to talk about a special type, uh, just uh, which is actually the simplest type, which is a parameterized uh, wave ice dissipation source function. So um, this is basically how it's formulated: the uh, the ice dissipation is given um, in terms of Ki, which is the um, dissipation rate, which is um, a, a function of, uh, I believe I had it, uh, let's see. It's the dissipation rate, oh, there it is, uh, in space, which is, um, uh, it, it's based on the dissipation rate of the wave amplitude, and you want to convert it to dissipation rate in time, which is a function of wave energy. And so that's the conversion uh, uh, with group velocity. Uh, and so go, So this is um, a, a slide introducing the, um, the par parametric forms. So we, we started doing the, the parametric forms uh, back in 2017. Uh, so this is not the first uh, wave ice dissipation uh, thing that we introduced into WaveWatch 3. We started uh, doing it in, in 2017, and we've been adding uh, new parametric forms as we go. And the advantage of parametric forms is that they're, um, they're simpler than some of the forms that exist in the literature. For example, you have some that are based on viscoelastic layers uh, that are uh, quite complicated and finicky, whereas the parametric models are very simple and robust. And so that's what we have gravitated toward lately. And we implemented uh, first in WaveWatch 3 and then in SWAN uh, more recently. And these models, uh, they read in uh, what I call field variables. These, you know, these are input variables that can um, vary in space and time, just like uh, wind uh, vectors or ice um, concentration and ice concentration is in fact the, the first one some uh, more properly it's it's called uh, ice fraction and then the second one uh, is ice thickness and so just a little bit of history uh, so this is uh, my first time visiting Uruguay uh, but it's actually my second visit uh, to the to the region um, so I was part of a um, efforts to improve um, the uh, understanding and modeling of dissipation at Casino Beach uh, in southern Brazil. Uh, so this is um, at the, uh, the inlet uh, of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, where the mud comes out and uh, deposits the mud, and there's a lot of dissipation there. So that was a long time ago. This is based, This is ancient history. So that was published in 2009. Um, so and I, I went to. 
Um, Brazil, just to participate in the meeting that was subsequent to that, obviously they don't need a modeler to participate in the field experiment, but I participated in that meeting that was in uh, Brazil. Um, and and the, this is a, a good segue because um, the dissipation by mud was essentially like a version one of, um, or, 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 or a preliminary um, thing that fed naturally into this dissipation by sea ice uh, because we started out with representing the mud as a visco, viscous layer and then we started out representing the sea ice as a viscoelastic layer and, uh, and that work started um, in 2011. Um, so a little bit of history. So Pioneer, and, and here I'm focusing on work uh, in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, one of the early pioneers of the study of dissipation of wave energy by sea ice uh, is, a, is a paper by Robin. And it was published in 1963. And that uh, field work um, was in the Weddell Sea, uh, 1959 to 1960. And so they, uh, we're doing this on a ship, and then this was back when there were no satellites. So they had um, only their own, you know, their own local area that they had information about the waves. And so that made it difficult to say how the waves were dissipating uh, as they propagated through the ice, because they only had the measurement of the waves where they are, uh, which I call uh, myopia. And uh, they, but it, they still managed to do an amazing amount uh, with this kind of primitive technology that they had. And one of the interesting findings uh, was that for the longer waves, for example, wave periods larger than 11 seconds, the dissipation uh, they found is primarily controlled by the, the wavelength and the ice thickness, and which is, um, we find is true. And there have been other um, studies of wave ice interaction uh, in, in the south. Um, so I've already mentioned the early work by Robin, so that was uh, 1959, uh, Doble and others. So they um, did work in 2000 and later uh, Kohout and Malin. Uh, they did some work in 2012. Uh, Ayers, Claire Ayers, they, oops, they deployed some uh, buoys in 2017, and at the same time, um, uh, Kohout uh, deployed uh, other uh, <clears throat> buoys uh, in a larger experiment in 2017 that was just a, a month prior to uh, the work by Claire Ayers. And uh, so the, I've got a literature review in the paper. It's published in uh, Cold Region Science and Technology, if anyone wants to read that. And uh, so, they, what they did was they deployed these uh, uh, so-called buoys uh, when they were uh, on their way to and from a field experiment that was at the Ross Sea. And um, so they, they transited through um, this region north of the Ross Sea, dropped uh, buoys along the way, and then they did their ex experiments that were totally unrelated to the waves. And then on the way back, uh, they um, deployed more buoys and they left them until they basically failed. They stopped transmitting. Um, and uh, and there's, they published a study uh, in glaciology in 2000 with a focus on uh, dissipation of total energy, in other words, significant wave height. And they used a method called, what, which I call the geometric method, which I'm, I'm gonna explain these, uh, this, this distinction later. And then I published this paper in Cold Region Science and Technology in 2021, and that's uh, the focus on the frequency dependence of the dissipation uh, inferred from those buoys. And I use a different methodology, uh, which I call the inversion method. And then the third uh, thing, uh, which is the second part of this uh, presentation, is um, published in a NRL report, uh, and, and that is looking at the uh, ice thickness correlations that we got from this uh, first study and using it to come up with a new parameterization that depends on ice thickness and not just wave frequency. So this is what the, the so-called buoys look like. So, so there's two ways to deploy the buoys. One is you find a flow like this. So it's, not, there are, it's always a flow that you can walk on. Um, but you find a flow and you, um, you put the buoy down and, and you leave it. And the other way to do it is you put the buoy down on continuous ice with the expectation 
that at some point that continuous ice will become part of an ice, they'll become an ice flow later. So you have a buoy on the ice flow. Now there, there is a catch here and I, I that is maybe kind of uh, sour news for, um, for us that are trying to study the problem, which is that when you leave the buoy to become, you know, on ice to become ice flow later, then you don't really understand the size of the ice flow, which is important because of um, the buoy response function, that of course, depends on the ice flow size. And wh whereas a buoy, I mean, a, a flow of this size uh, might have a good uh, response function able to measure higher frequency waves and kind of one-to-one, -one, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, uh, RAO, response amplitude operator, um, that if it's a very large flow, let's say 10 meters wide, it's not going to respond as well to the waves. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that we're not actually measuring the free surface of the ocean per se, we're measuring the motion of the, um, the ice flow itself, and that's a, an assumption that goes into the process. And so, okay, so I've already alluded to these two methods used to uh, infer or estimate uh, the dissipation rate in experiments like this. Uh, one is to use the uh, geom what I call the geometric method, which is basically just to take two buoys and you watch how the energy crosses, goes from one buoy to the other, and you calculate the, the distance between the buoys and you calculate the energy between the two of the two buoys at that time and you assume that the wave energy travels instantaneously uh, between the buoys and you assume that there's no um, source functions other than uh, dissipation by sea ice in between the buoys and you use that to calculate the attenuation rate. Um, the other method is, is more um, complex, which I call the inversion method. And so this is the method um, that I first applied in, in 2016. And so basically this is, this method is, it's asking, it's taking the wave observations, the observed spectrum, and then it's going to the model and saying, okay, model, what dissipation rate at this frequency do you need to have in order to recover that spectrum? And so what you get is a, a spectrum of the, uh, of the dissipation rate. And, uh, so I, I've got a review of some pros and cons, which I actually had to cut out of the paper because it was way too long, but I, I still keep it on this uh, ar archive uh, website if anyone uh, wants to read it. But okay, so this is the animation from Wave Watch 3. So this is uh, part of the Hindcast uh, for that um, uh, time period. So this is um, uh, during June uh, 2017. So, so these markers here are marking where the buoys are, the ones with the colors other than yellow are the ones that we used for the um, for the this particular study, and uh, so it's just cycling through time, and it's going um, you know from uh, early June to late June, and the the colors are significant wave height, the arrows are wave direction, the contours uh, shown in black that's the uh, ice uh, concentration contours, uh, twenty percent, forty percent, sixty percent, eighty percent. But basically, that's the the ice edge uh, right there, and so um, what? So it's going to cycle back to the beginning. And okay, so you notice at the beginning that the buoys are oriented north south, and so that was by design to use this geometric method, which is that if the waves are propagating from the from the north, then it's um, you ideally you want to have the buoys aligned in a, in a north to south orientation so that you can use, use this ge geometric method to calculate the distance between the two uh, uh, buoys and then the spectra of the two buoys and then estimate the dissipation rate. But the problem you see it as over time, these uh, the buoys reor reoriented themselves to be oriented more west to east. And so you can't really apply this uh, geometric method in that case, unless, except in a few cases where you have two that are luckily oriented in a north-south orientation, but definitely the whole array are not oriented that way. But the not, that's, that's kind of a, a benefit of this um, the method, uh, that um, the inversion method that I use, which is that it doesn't require two buoys. Each, for each buoy, 
you get an estimate of the dissipation rate as a function of frequency that's com it doesn't need any other buoys in the area. Um, okay, so so this is just a plot of the buoy positions as a function of time. So this is June 6 to June 30th, and so we've got um, buoys that are arranged with different distances uh, from the ice edge, ranging from uh, about 30 kilometers from the ice edge, and the deepest one was 250 kilometers from the ice edge, uh, uh, at least at the initial um, position, and then it migrated to be closer to the ice edge as the month went on. And uh, so this is the, the spectra uh, from the same, so this is using the same uh, color scheme that I used in the prior slide. So this is the wave spectra. Uh, and it's, uh, oh, and I wanted to mention one other thing. So about this, so the, um, you notice the, the pretty large numbers, 250 kilometers. That, that's the size of the MIZ. And that, so that's a special thing about the, the marginal ice zone in the Southern Ocean. The marginal ice zone, the kind of general de definition, is that it's a region where you have both ice, sea ice, and waves at the same time. Uh, and in the Arctic, at least part of the, part of the Arctic, like north of Alaska that I'm familiar with uh, prior to this, is the marginal ice zone tends to be on the scale of about 50 kilometers, so that scale. But in the Southern Ocean, because you had these huge long swells coming in, it makes that marginal ice zone a lot bigger. So order, um, you know, 250, up to 250 kilometers marginal ice zone, so, so much larger. So it's a different wave climate, so a different uh, type of marginal ice zone in the, in the Southern Hemisphere. So uh, back to this. So this was the, uh, the wave spectra. Uh, same same color scheme, and so the the one deepest in the ice is um, the wave spectrum uh, shown in black here, and um, so this is just kind of giving a, a visual impression of that dissipation rate. So the geometric method it would use the, like the you know the spectrum here and the spectrum here, and if they're arranged uh, geometrically along the axis of wave propagation, then it would use that to calculate the dissipation rate. But like I said, for, for the inversion method, it doesn't do that. It uses each spectrum individually. And, uh, so, and I'm marked with these horizontal bars here, a kind of visual cutoff of where it looks like the spectrum is propped up. And, and what's happening there, so this, where the slope of the spectrum changes, and that's called by, caused by instrument noise. And I didn't realize this until I was well into this study. And so I hate to admit this, but I spent a lot of time dealing with like redoing my calculations to uh, uh, work around uh, this problem with instrument noise. Uh, you, first, you have to identify where the noise takes over, where it becomes so significant that it corrupts your answer. And then you want to remove that uh, from your analysis and uh, and then redo your analysis. Okay, so but this is the result. So this is showing the dissipation rate as a function of frequency. Um, and <clears throat> the color here is the, the ice thickness. So I did this for a number of parameters in the paper. I, I used uh, ice, uh, the distance from the ice edge is one parameter, free parameter that I used. I used the ice concentration as another parameter, uh, the, the wave height as another parameter. But this plot, which I think is the most interesting one because it's about the ice, is the, um, the, the ice thickness. So you see the intuitive result, which is that for the thicker ice, so this is up to 50 centimeters thickness for the ice. Um, oops. The, dissipation rate is higher. So that's the intuitive result. And so th there are several conclusions from that 2021 paper. I just kind of, I deleted the ones that are kind of uh, in the details uh, and instead just showed um, the, the more interesting one. And uh, one is that there's a positive correlation between the dissipation rate and the ice thickness, as I said, and also um, with distance from the ice edge. Uh, but there's a negative correlation between dissipation, weight, uh, uh, dissipation rate and wave height, which is um, it's counterintuitive if you expect a kind of nonlinear increase 
of dissipation rate uh, as the um, amplitude increases. But it's actually very intuitive if you understand that if the wave height goes up, it probably implies that the way the ice itself is broken up into smaller pieces, and that's going to affect the dissipation rate. If you have solid ice, you're not going to have high wave heights, and so that's I think why you have that negative correlation. But that's not something we can use in a predictive model, I think, because that's this kind of nonlinear, indirect correlation. Uh, whereas I think the you know it's more intuitive that there's a causal relation between the ice thickness and the dissipation rate. And uh, we made some other conclusions about instrument noise and methods of making uh, mean profiles. Okay, so one problem that we have in wave ice studies is that people have done field studies like I've just described, and people have also done studies in the lab, and they've uh, done something in kind of in between, which is to have a very small scale uh, field study. And what we found, and this is again, dissipation rate as a function of frequency, what they found is that the um, uh, for the cases that are a uh, larger scale, so these are field studies like the one I uh, just described, you have a relatively low dissipation rate, and then for the laboratory experiments, relatively high dissipation rate, and you if you you can't extrapolate from one to the other to get uh, them to match up. Uh, and you know this is reminiscent of the the plot of uh, of flow separation that Alex showed, but but here we want to look for, I mean, it's a completely different topic, of course, and we don't want to apply uh, the, the same methods because it's a, it's a different uh, uh, physical scenario. And, and what uh, uh, my colleague uh, Zhe Yu uh, came up with is to address this with a, a, a non-dimensionalization to try to get these to line up better. And so this is non-dimensionalization based on basically a Reynolds number scaling uh, where the Reynolds number, the Reynolds length scale is the ice thickness. And, and this is uh, the, uh, the result is, oops, the, uh, so you have these non-dimensional parameters, so a non-dimensional dissipation and non-dimensional frequency. And so you can plot those against each other instead of the dimensional versions of these. And so this, and so what my idea was to take her non-dimensionalization and plug it into a parametric form. And of course, you can come up with a, you know, complex parametric forms for ice dissipation rate as a function of ice thickness and frequency. You can have a, a binomial form or a, a polynomial form. Uh, but to keep things simple, I, I use the monomial uh, form here like this. So you have a coefficient out in front and you've got a power dependence on ice thickness. And then you have a power dependence on frequency. And uh, uh, so you end up with a formula that looks like this. And uh, so if you know the power on the ice thickness, then you know the power on the frequency and vice versa. If you know the power on the frequency, then you also know the power on the ice thickness of this parameterization. And so it makes it much simpler to constrain your parameterization. And so these are two examples. Uh, one is if you have uh, you know, you use ice thickness to power one, that mean, that implies your frequency is power four. If you have ice thickness to power 1.25, it implies frequency to 4.5. And so this is what you uh, end up with. So this is what we call scale collapse, which is you have it in dimensional form. Dissipation rate is a function of frequency in dimensional form. Colors, again, are the ice thickness and you put it in non-dimensional form and it kind of collapses on itself. And so, so that's what we wanted to see. And then we put it in a scatter plot form. So <clears throat> the uh, horizontal axis is the dissipation rate estimated from the field experiment. And then the vertical axis is the dissipation rate that is uh, estimated from the parametric model. And uh, so this is the old parametric model that doesn't take into account uh, the ice thickness. And this is the best you can do in calibrating if you don't use ice thickness. If you do include the ice thickness, you get a much, uh, uh, better uh, agreement with the data, much less scatter. And, and of course, there is a big caveat here is this is not independent data. This is the actual data that we use to calibrate the, the, the um, parametric model. And of course, the challenge is to develop something that's general and which it, that it turns out to be a very big challenge because ice uh, is very different in different uh, 
parts of the uh, polar regions. But in any case, we, this um, new parametric form, we, I implemented it into uh, SWAN, and it would be trivial to implement it in WaveWatch 3 because we've already got parametric forms in WaveWatch 3, and so it would just be a new option in there. And um, so this is a more recent uh, plot that was provided to me by uh, my colleague, again, J.U., and uh, she, she submitted this to uh, Journal of Marine Science and Enge Engineering. Um, and th so this is similar to the plot that I showed previously, um, but she's included a lot more cases of, uh, of field data and laboratory data. And you see this kind of nice uh, lining up along the axis where um, the, um, this red line is the, the, per the new model, the new parametric model. And so it's a good reconciliation of these two. But like I said, if you go to different field experiments, you have different ice type. And so that's why some of these field experiments, these crosses don't, don't line up very well. And uh, so there's still a lot of work to be, do, to be done because, I mean, so, you know, I've added ice thickness to the problem, but we, there's still other characteristics of ice that aren't included. And so that's probably what's uh, contributing to that remaining uh, misfit. Okay. So last slide, so um, just combining the, that non-dimensionalization and an assumption of a monomial uh, power fit, we get a new uh, uh, empirical parametric form for the dissipation rate, and that's, this is um, uh, shown on the slide. And um, it, use, it, it gives much less scatter, so the scatter index goes from 0 0.063 to 0 0.038, uh, so that's uh, much less scatter. Uh, mixed results with independent data sets, and um, it, it would be, um, uh, so, so I already mentioned the, the, the difficulty of variable ice types. Another problem is you have a lot of experiments uh, where people are trying to measure or estimate the dissipation rate, but they're using different methods and that could also contribute to the problem. Different assumptions going into the estimate of the dissipation rate and different um, <clears throat> results in the, the estimation. And uh, another thing that I should probably mention is that there, right now, not a lot of field experiments where people have measurements of ice thickness, and so that's all, another thing working in a sense that we need to have more field experiments uh, where you have uh, simultaneous measurements of ice thickness and the uh, wave spectra. And, and so, so, so that's, that's the end of the presentation. But I, one last thing that I'd like to mention is that I think that RAO problem is probably something that needs to be solved too. And I think if I was going to design a new field experiment for wave ice interaction, I would probably uh, think about that problem first and foremost, because ideally you want a buoy that's following the sea surface and not something that is uh, subject to the motion of the flow, which may be so large that it doesn't have a, a suitable uh, response function. All right, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Luigi, before you say anything, I just wanted to mention, so you, you like to boast that you're the dumbest guy in the room, but I want to say that I must be in the competition for that because this is the kind of math that I do right here, right? Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to put that there. Okay. <laughs> no, Eric, beautiful lecture as usual. I'm not surprised. You're always good. So. <laughs> uh, about the fact that uh, when you're talking about dissipation, you were talking absolute term or in percent of the energy? Uh, it's a dissipation rate. In, it's just like exponential growth rate, exponential decay rate. So okay. it's a function of the energy. Because uh, uh, if you consider, apart from the other consideration, if you find a lower dissipation in principle mm -hmm. by higher wave height, right? Could not this be connected that in general higher wave height are connected to longer waves? Right, but this already has the frequency dependence in it. So, you know, when I'm plotting the dissipation rate, it's always dissipation rate as a function of frequency. So the long waves, I mean, that, that's definitely a thing, but you can see that in the plot. So you have higher dissipation for the high frequencies. Hmm. Yeah. 
Um, but but definitely that's true. And I think that that's been an issue with other experiments. And I think um, so. Alex's uh, postdoc uh, Chin Shan Lu he actually found that as an issue with the prior work is that they had studied the dissipation rate in terms of total energy, so wave height. And they found some kind of, uh, made some conclusions about that. And what he found was if they had realized that the wavelength was different for these two cases, they would get a di very different dissipation rate as a function of frequency. Which is the ph physics. It's really amazing to think that you find, you still feel waves to 250 kilometers from the ice edge. Right, right. Which uh, order of ice thickness are we talking there? Uh, well, so this instrument, I use a satellite to estimate the ice thickness, and it saturates at 50 centimeters, which is about the end of it. So that, that I mean, that's about as thick as it got for this experiment. Yeah. And it kind of worked out. We were, we were lucky that it didn't go up to, you know, one meter, because then the instrument wouldn't be able to see it, right? <laughs> so about 50 centimeters. Okay. Thank yeah. You. <laughs> Eric, thank you. Very nice uh, talk. Uh, I wonder if uh, you said dissipation is, uh, well, dissipation rate. Right. And we can compare it to growth rate. Just, yeah. Just in the, yeah, it's, in terms it's, of it's the source function, meaning, just like meanings the of that. One, yeah. So I wonder if you have or have you done uh, dissipation rate curves such as those uh, very familiar, the growth uh, curves for, for waves, the growth rate curves for waves. Oh, for, um, you, you know those gamma and calcone yeah, and all right, that? Right. Is, is something similar that you could expect? Like, uh, of course, gamma and calcone yeah. and others were expecting a collapse right. in the dissipation, in right. the growth rate in energy and frequency, peak frequency. As a function of fetch, for instance, or always non-dimensional, right? Right. Yeah, I have to think about that. So you would have. So you might say, okay. So with the fetch limited curves, it's the you know you have x the horizontal axis right, non-dimensionalized right. fetch, and you yeah. can have a non-dimensionalized distance into distance. The any any non-dimensional yeah. yeah. distance. And, yeah, and yeah. then and then you could have um, the energy level. Yeah, I think L that could like, work. I think that could work. That, like that, that would provide you with some insight into into the process, for yeah, instance. It, or it might. Uh, I mean, I'm a, I'm hesitant. I mean, it, it's hard to say. It's hard to predict if it, I would have it, but it'd be definitely an interesting way, and it could it could provide new insight. Yeah, that, that's an interesting idea. Thanks, Baka. Yeah. So who's next? Uh, you take it. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Eduardo Palenque from Bolivia. Eduardo. Well, uh, hello everybody. Uh, I just want to present uh, what uh, basically is still a proposal or an idea to get this uh, experimental test on the wind wave interaction. As you have seen, there is a lot of uh, models on how the waves has been produced or related with the wind, especially the force of the wind and the size or the height of the wave. Uh, the idea originally it's all merit of uh, Alexander. You know Alex, and he's quite enthusiastic. And uh, the idea is to 
work with uh, us and uh, we got here on a, what we will say a general plan because uh, I apologize it's supposed to be already with the results and uh, the idea is because of the models itself or well, themselves uh, they got some uh, contradictions uh, the different models has uh, different results on the output on how the high on the each wave should uh, be con considering all the parameters of the especially of the uh, string uh, force and uh, that kind of interaction Uh, there is. And uh, among the models we we would like to test uh, are these uh, phase resolving and this other with uh, the spectral wave models. What we think we can do this is just to get a buoy. Measuring the wave height, and somewhere better if is on the buoy, but maybe just on the close by shores for measuring this one the wind intensities, especially on gusts, because if there is a still water and comes the the wind, everybody knows how to. The processes, the energy is transferred uh, from uh, the atmospheric to the to the water level, and then the the water level is rise locally, and that's the the way we sell. That's the idea: is to set on the energy transfer. That's the uh, air masses moving, which means. Uh, as a physicist, I would say it's the kinetic energy who has been, which should be transferred to the uh, water no. this. That's the difference between uh, the models itself. The phase resolving will give a, a simulation, that's a point, on how this uh, surface, which is absolutely flat initially, and then by effect of the wind, it becomes triplet, uh, and uh, it moves. That's uh, at the other point, and uh, has a, a lot of uh, dynamics, especially. Uh, to, to be investigated, you have seen uh, all the spectra, the power uh, systems. Uh, well, there is a list of uh, 18 parameters we can uh, confer to characterize the wave. The spectral wave are the one, uh, the models that everybody has been uh, presenting. They are used for this uh, wave forecast. Especially for the ocean engineering, who has a lot of um, troubles these days. This is a general, I would say, a scheme on what we are standing now. This is a theory, which is if the wind comes in this direction, when uh, there is uh, some kind of uh, wave over there, the pressure on this region is lower than uh, on this one, and that means there is a, I would say, some kind of suction We just take the water the, over the level, the, the main level of the water, and it depends, among other things, on the stress of the wind, that's, that's 
And uh, there is a uh, here yeah, several theories and models on exactly what we can expect on uh, on each case. Main problem is here experimental data because all these theories are based on uh, what we call empirical constants. No? There is a general theory which comes from the general theory, the Stokes uh, equation, uh, and uh, the Boosting X approximation, and so on. But the data itself no, needs to be uh, taken. No? And uh, that's in, in the labs, but the problem in the labs, there are by definition, on uh, small scales. And the other is we can uh, not make uh, extremely long, uh, to say, or large experiments with wind because uh, the, there is no, no, because not a machine large enough to to do that. And that's uh, doesn't work. And uh, this is the equation basically we are looking at. No? The set zero uh, basically is the level of uh, reference. Set is the height of the of the wave, and uh, the U's are the standard is one, and uh, the other one who are basically measuring. These are taken from a paper from Alex. And uh, what we need is to measure the, the high. I want to return one. Back, yes. Yes, that's what. Yes, yes. And uh, the, a secondary contribution. Mm -hmm of this study will we say is that of the whole models we can uh, take on uh, there we will test the universality of the models not only for the water or the sea but it should be you know, extrapolated to every kind of uh, liquid we can uh, think on both for the model itself and for most of the equations on uh, uh, fluid mechanics. And uh, a good point now is uh, this problem with the climate forecast, because as everybody knows, uh, the global warming is basically putting a lot of energy inside the atmosphere, which is uh, reflected in the higher temperatures now. I mean, uh, but the same means a uh, difference. Uh, warmer atmosphere means much energy, which can be transferred to the coast and in the waves. And these waves are uh, anyway going uh, to the shores, and that's the problem. And then we want to refine these empirical parameterization. Then this is uh, the site that uh, will be tested. And as you know, it's it's quite a trend even for me that one of the Bolivians speaks on uh, on the sea. Bolivia is uh, you know uh, in the middle of the continent. It's a land a landlocked country and so the, it is uh, a totally new field for me and uh, inside uh, on this part of the of the country we've got this approximation we've got the Titicaca Lake which is shared with uh, Peru and inside the lake we will take this point around this is 
Copacabana Peninsula. It's well, very well known for the tourist point of an historical site. Uh, this is uh, another historical site, the, the Sun Island, and a small one which is called the Moon Island, or Coati, because uh, it has the largest cross uh, section, I will say, free of the disturbance, because at the beginning we want to work here in uh, Copacabana Bay, but there is a lot of islands and uh, it's protected for the main uh, direction of the wind. We got these uh, wind directions. Uh, it's not on the lake, it's on Patacamaya. We work at a lot of um, Patacamaya. Patacamaya is more or less here, in the middle of the uh, Altiplano, the high plateau. But as the Altiplano, as its name say, no, it's absolutely flat and there is the same wind crossing from the lake down to the middle, even, even south up to Uyuni. And the idea is to study this interaction because we got already uh, the wind, uh, wind stations, one over there, one over there, and we are putting another station more or less on this side. And these are the reasons why we choose the Titicaca Lake. No, because it's obvious. No, all these uh, wind wave interaction models were has been designated. Think on fall on the sea level, because that, that's the point. No, the ocean has obvi obviously an ocean level, and. Uh, at ocean level, the, both the pressure, the air pressure, and the mass of the air, the density, is exactly the same. A very well-known well parameter. But due to the high altitude of the lake, basically the whole basin of the Altiplano, and in this case, yes, nearly four kilometers, 3.8, above the sea level, we got a low atmospheric pressure, basically one third less than the sea level, which means the density has the same relation. Numerically, this is the relation. If you got this altitude, we divide it in, in this, and we have to this exchange points to, and then we can calculate whatever altitude. In this case, uh, Montevideo is, say, 50 meters above sea level. We can make a calculation, and instead of the, say, 760 uh, mercury millimeters, we will got 750 something. And so that's uh, the idea. With this pressure, we can calculate the density, the, the low density, which basically is the same. And with a lower density, there is also lower kinetic energy available to be transferred from the air to the water. One of the interesting points is the density of the water basically is the same, but from the lake, even being a lake on uh, fresh water, but uh, it has some salinity, it's not uh, the same as the as they see, it's 10% uh, lower, but it can be taken uh, that in account. And we will uh, measure uh, on this point, because here on the lake, you can see, we will study it here, but so these are cross sections. And this is one of the important points. As you can see, it's the, the lake has the deepness long enough yeah, 
These points here are some islands will just appear in the middle of the lake. Uh, but here, after, uh, we'll see. Before or after, it's not clear. Though. This is a small island. And, and on all this line, I will say, this region between the Moon Island and the, uh, and the shore, the North Shore, from the wind uh, are coming, uh, is uh, basically free. It's, that means it's quite equivalent to an open sea. Uh, it's even uh, 200 meters deep. And uh, as the waves who are, has been uh, record in, in the lake are no higher than, say, uh, one and a half meter high, there is a lot of or, or 40 meters uh, long. That means uh, the, this this kind of waves uh, cannot see the bottom, and it's equivalent to the open sea. Yeah. Then, for we can uh, test this uh, this model for the well. Uh, and uh, in this kind the. This model, we got an electron correlation with the fetch. Basically, the, the distance between, uh, say, when all the wind has is in contact with uh, with the water, and that make a, uh, it gives enough time to, to to the system to transfer the energy of the air to to the water. And uh, the the island will, will uh, the, the point near the Moon Island, has the longest fetches both on north-south direction and one of the longest to the uh, direction to the east-west, I would say, because most of the time, 90% or even more, the direction of the winds comes from the north. That is a general feature on the Altiplano because most of the winds uh, come from this region. It comes uh, started on the south pole, goes up, or goes to the north, and crossing Argentina, crossing um, this part of the of the coast, go through the Amazonian. When it impacts with the intertropical region, and then it's turned back, and it uh, it follows the uh, and this direction it, it stops on the on the mountains, and there is uh, the region uh, when the, the heights of the Cordillera Real yeah. are are lower, and then there is a lot of uh, winds coming from the Amazonian to the Altiplano, which produce all the uh, humidity in the, in, inside the Altiplano. We just pick that, and that's the point of this. Ninety percent of the time, and at at the Titicaca, no, the winds at the lakes coming from the north and pass pass the lake and go to the to the rest of that plan. The other one is a uh, five percent of the time. Uh, it comes from the west. There is uh, some uh, storms and. Uh, Especially on uh, on the rainy season, there are sometimes some uh, like uh, phenomena like the El Nino, when, when the when the coast pass the border of Peru and uh, goes to the Altiplano also. No, in the other five percent uh, comes indirectly from the rest of the directions. And then um, the good point is, uh, as the most of the time the direction is. Well known, no? we can orient all the details and the equipment on that. That's uh, a closer view on the on the site, and uh, well, it's it's too small. <laughs> this is uh, the, these are numbers on the, the bathymetry, and we are over there. This is the, the region 
we will get to the the boy yeah. and uh, for the scale yeah. this is one kilometer right then we got something like uh, uh, 10 or 20 uh, 88 on, on from the point of a point and uh, another one is and this is uh, one of the good views from the lake thanks thank you very much we have time for questions I like the idea for two reasons, uh, for three reasons. Uh, of course, because I like waves. The second one is that I love, uh, I love mountains. And the third one is that I've been to Titicaca Lake. So, and I had the same idea. <laughs> the question is, what is the advantage of doing an experiment there? You mentioned that uh, pressure is two thirds of the uh, sea level. Yes. What are the advantages then? Well, the lower pressures means also a lower uh, air density. So what? Uh, a lower uh, air density. The density of the of the air yeah. is is already down. That means the uh, kinetic energy of each parcel of the of the air is lower than in the at sea level. When the see, basically the interaction between the wind and the and the water you know, is uh, trans transfer of energy. We could work the other way around. If I if we are used to the Titicaca Lake, I would look for a place where the interaction is stronger, not weaker. Uh, well, we go to the lake. Okay. <laughs> Uh, that means the Altiplano itself is it's already a big uh, laboratory, natural one. What is the dimension of the lake? Uh, on the northwest is uh, 150 kilometers, and on the wide is 50. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Have another question? Th thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting idea. I like it. Yeah. And it's I Alexander. wonder if uh, he got I the merit. I wonder if uh, there is uh, the idea of momentum fluxes yes. with, say, a decovariance method or something like that. Then, in such a way, you can prove that uh, even they, they are stronger fluxes or weaker fluxes under those conditions directly being measured. Uh, well, we can try to measure them. Okay. Thank you very much. Just a quick comment. Uh, first time uh, uh, to uh, Luigi, right? Uh, so Luigi, the air pressure is much lower, 30%, right? Or maybe even 40, and the, the air density is much lower, right? So you don't expect that the same wind will generate the same waves. Right, it's what we have 10 meters per second wind. The waves will be different, and we think we know how different they are, right? Because actually, the air density is a uh, is a part of any formulation for a, a the wind input, right? But we just ignore it, right? In the way watch three, it's not even a parameter, right? We just uh, assumed constant, but it's not constant. Even in the tropical cyclones, it drops by 10 percent, right? So it and, and then. You know, it comes squared, so it can contribute, right? Uh, but um, the most intriguing thing uh, is uh, the pressure, because the wind input is the work of the pressure on uh, the surface, right? And for that, we don't have a simple relationship to, you know, the pressure, right? Because it's the way we induce pressure in otherwise, say, uh, ambient pressure of the atmosphere, which is lower. Right, so it's an interesting problem in terms of physics. It has practical value uh, for modeling on Earth, even more practical value for modeling elsewhere. Right, like we have papers like waves on Titan, where the atmosphere is not air and the uh, fluid is not water. Right, 
Uh, and um, uh, <coughs> uh, Paco, <laughs> to uh, comment to your question, right? It would be good to measure the uh, uh, viscosity so sometime in the future. Let's plan it, right? Uh, uh, Eduardo plans a simple experiment, right? But whatever is uh, possible now, right? But in principle, it can be very nice. Natural laboratory, 150 kilometers fetch, right? It's like not ocean, but the sea, right? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. We invite the next speaker. We are running behind the schedule. And Leandro Fariña. Eso está bien. Con este para adelante, con este para atrás. Ah, y este okay. es un puntero. Ah, puntero, puntero. It went Ahí, back. Yeah, back. Yeah. Forward, and this one you push, and you will see a red dot. Yeah, but this I don't see the red dot. Yeah, you need to, no, you are pushing the, the big one. Okay. The, the one on top. Wait. Okay. Yeah, there's the thing. Okay. And yeah. you will see a counter there. So okay. You know okay, how much time you can let. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Hi, everyone. And uh, very, very happy to be here and uh, to be with all of you. And um, it's another very interesting thing that, that we waited here now. Yeah. Um, very good that we could wait for these two and a half years yeah, since the since the, the first uh, schedule date for the for the conference. And uh, anyway, um, this is a work with um, with a student, a former student, uh, Hector Perotto. So he was the the guy who who found, discovered this object that we're going to speak about in this talk today. And uh, Luigi Biocchi was uh, a former student, also graduate student, and uh, he performed the computations that we're going to speak a bit about now and uh, okay so let's go to the, the outline of the, the talk uh, so this is very basic uh, traditional order introduction and uh, after this uh, review very brief review I'm going to speak about uh, uh, some characteristics of the Brazil's continental margin which is includes more than the continental shelf, so it's a little bit more. Uh, the methods, so basically the, the model, and uh, the data that we used, the boundary condition of the model, and also the, the wind, the wind data, and so on. Um, we make some uh, calibration, we compare the results with one buoy that we had near this region, and some uh, numerical experiments. Okay. Um, basically, um, what we're going to speak about is this um, this object, the sea mounts that uh, they appear in the worldwide in a very huge number of them, so two two hundred thousand sea mounts. And um, but but most of the work related to this uh, this structure are not related to the effect on the surface waves so there are a lot of work on these uh, structures but usually they are more con concentrated and focus on the geology and uh, in the currents or in even internal waves but uh, very few work on the surface waves um, exist about this uh, this kind of interaction there is a previous work on this interaction by Sosa et al. that I, I point here. Uh, two of the authors are here, it's, uh, Jesus and uh, Luigi. Um, then the, there are our work. Okay, so this work of ours was published later on in 2020 in Deep Sea Research. And it, it was uh, submitted to the conference in 2019. And uh, as Rodrigo remembered this work, eh? I was going to, to talk about a, a, a more recent work about 
prediction of uh, wave height by deep learning that I'm going to speak on Friday. But as uh, Rodrigo well remembered, I had submitted this before, so uh, I imagine this is still of interest to the conference, and uh, we decided to to give this uh, this brief talk about this also. Okay, and uh, very recently, very recently, uh, there was an ar an article published, I think, a week ago, um, on the interaction of sea mounts and surface waves, and the authors they studied uh, a sea mount of Glaga in Java. And uh, the interesting thing about this cement is that only two meters depth. So it's amazing. It's very near the surface of the water. And they, the authors make this study about this uh, cement as well. Okay. But in, in our case, uh, we are interested in the in cement that we found. Hector Eitor uh, Peroto, he found looking at some satellite images. Uh, and it's in the northeast of Brazil, near the state of Ceará. Um, and he found a group of simons that were affecting the wave field in that part. And he noticed this looking only in satellite uh, images. Not satellite image, but uh, the wave height produced from satellite data. Um, okay, so in, oh, another characteristic of this study is that there is more than one simon. Okay, so there are a group of simons, and we focus on three of them. Okay, so the wave field that uh, composed by this interaction is not only uh, due to a single simon. So this is one of another aspect. Um, the shallowest simon um, has a depth of 21 meters. We hope this is the correct uh, depth because. Uh, you, we got this information from nautical charts, and uh, very recently, in 2020, there was an, another survey of this uh, bathymetry. And uh, I talked to the, these people in the Brazil's Navy, and I got the information that maybe it's not the exact correct depth, but they keep this information on the nautical charts because um, it is one area of risk. So even if it's not very, very accurate, it's very important to keep this as a... Um, Precaution. So I hope in the future we get this more accurate number about this uh, this actual depth. Yeah? Okay, so this is a, a list of the conclusion I put in the beginning because uh, I hope I remember in the end. But uh, the orientation of each simons affects this this wave field. Uh, the orientation with respect to the incident wave. Uh, there is a, a shadow wake zone. Know, behind the, um, the sea mounds, this is, which is a very common phenomenon. Uh, and also we notice wave focusing and the conversion interaction behind the, the summit, okay, causing this um, reappearance of uh, wave amplification. So just behind the sea mounds, we have an increase in the, wave, in the HS. And in some cases, depending on the wavelength and also on the depth, of the cement, we see another peak, maybe even two peaks of, of the wave height. Okay, so this uh, is probably related to this conversion of uh, of, uh, of the waves refraction behind the, the cements. It happens in, for, under certain conditions of wavelengths and uh, and the summit depth. Okay, so this is the the the, the image that I was mentioned in the beginning of the talk. Uh, on the left, on the left hand side is a uh, wave watch dissipation. Okay, so this is the coast of Ceará. Uh, and we don't see anything about the, the simons here. Okay, so but when I uh, look at this, uh, another image produced from a satellite data, we see this, uh, these patterns here. Okay, so these are the sea, where the simons are. So we, we see also, this is dissipation, but we also notice this in the in the wave height, also this part. So, and then I we realize what what is going on, and let's look at this with more attention. And we start to look at the bathymetry, and also uh, these nautical nautical charts that I mentioned. And then we decide to make this study. Okay, so there's no observation data for this region. Satellite data, I think, is not a, a, a very good choice okay, because they have this sparse. Uh, 
space distribution and also time distribution. So maybe it's not a good idea. So maybe there's another way to have these measurements about this wave fuse in this region. But uh, we don't know yet which is the best way. Maybe I get some uh, suggestion from you here. Um, this is the um, profile of this Brazil uh, continental margin. Okay, so we can see here this uh, in all these uh, regions. Okay, so this is the here in Rio Grande do Sul, and we have this profile what is going on. So we have all this uh, simon. Okay, so this here is a very interesting region. It's uh, Vitória Trindade in the state of uh, Espírito Santo in Brazil, uh, which number is uh, number 11. Okay, so we have this profile of a lot of sea mounts, and some of them also very shallow. The summit is like uh, 30 to 20 meters, so the depth. We didn't uh, analyze this one. Another one very interesting is Fernando de Noronha. Okay, so it's around here. Also, they have very shallow and a very uh, small depth. But the one that we are focusing in this work is uh, is around here, so in Fortaleza. Okay, so I think this number is number three here, Fortaleza. So there are a lot of these uh, Simons ridges. Uh, they can be susceptible to this uh, interaction of surface waves. Okay, so as there is no observational data, so we would like to study this phenomenon, so we decided to to employ the SWARM model, okay? Okay, so this is a, a bit more detailed, so just to make it uh, very clear what are we, uh, our object of study, these three C mounts here, okay? So S1, S2, and S3. The depth of S1 is around 20 meters. This one, I think, is uh, 40, and here, 50. Okay, so this is the very shallow C mounts. And um, there is a buoy here, okay? So Near the city, near the city of Fortaleza, there is a buoy that we used uh, data from there to make some uh, comparison and calibration. Of course, it's not uh, a very good uh, point because it's far away from the sea mounts and in, is in continental shelf. But in any case, that's what we had. So we decided to make the comparison of data in this buoy, and we had like something like one month and a half of data. Okay, so wave height and we made this comparison. Uh, what more here? I think that's it. Uh, Ceará wave climate. Okay, Ceará wave climate. Ceará is the state where these sea mounts are, are located. There are some uh, works uh, on this topic. For example, Bianca 2010, Brazil offshore wave climate. So very roughly, the wave periods in this region in the spring from 3.7 seconds to 21 0.4 seconds. Okay, so there are some long waves in this region, probably due to storms in the north hemisphere. We have uh, this wave direction from the north in the summer, in the summer in the south. So is it the, in winter in the in the north hemisphere? So we have these uh, storms there, and then we have these uh, long swells uh, and the old ones that uh, come from the north hemisphere to the north of Brazil and they affect these uh, sea mounts. Uh, wave height, average, maximum, 0 0.8 in spring, 3.4 in the winter. And this is a, a, just a historical article in the newspaper of Globo here in Brazil many years, many decades ago, where it says that uh, big waves in Ceará uh, had its origin in storms uh, in the North Hemisphere. And this, it was written by João José Henrique Alves, and he was based in a founding by Eloy Melo. Okay, so it's very, it's just a historical you know, perspective about this. Eloy had this program called Sea Sentinels that they observed, observed waves, you know, it's a lot of surfers, I think. Surfer Sentinels, and they have this program, okay? So they have this uh, program of wave observation, and then Eloy realized, and by looking at this uh, wave conditions and uh, wave frequencies, uh, we realized that this, there are these big waves come from the North Hemisphere and incident in Ceará states. Okay, so just to have an idea of the wave climate and also in this historical perspective. 
So there are long waves, okay? So heating, CRR, so more than 20 seconds frequency. And the longer the wave, so you can already imagine that you'll be interacting with this shallow, um, shallow summits, shallow Simmons summits. Uh, okay, so people already talked about the, about the, the model, the equation, the wave uh, balance equation. So I'm not going into details here. This is the, the source terms used in our SWAN simulation. And here are the, the, what we have activated. So uh, it's not an um, analytical and um, theoretical simulation. Actually, we wanted to make a, as possible, um, as close as possible to this real uh, situation. So we, we activated the source terms and we made some tuning in the source term using the buoy results. And uh, what we found what I think is the, the main um, term here that make a, a significant difference was dissipation, white capping. And we decided to use this uh, Van der Wettison term as opposed to Coleman, I think, term. Okay. And uh, basically all the other conditions are more or less standard. It, it was done three years ago. So maybe something changed in the version of Swan now. Um, Okay, so these are the data we used. Uh, there are some of these nautical charts that I mentioned. And this is a, a one of these big file, one, one, one gigabyte. So you click on this and zoom on this file and you can get this, uh, this depth, okay, of all these, uh, these seamounts. This is uh, uh, elaborated by Brazil's Navy. And, and I think we used one from 2004 or 2014 where uh, Luis Bjorki, he found this very, uh, very shallow uh, seamount. And then I contacted people uh, from the Brazil's Navy very recently. There is a, a researcher who published uh, this one, a paper in 2020, and, he, and she did another survey on the whole Brazil margin region. And I asked her, how about this, uh, this seamount? Is it really so shallow? And she, she asked, I don't know. And, I sent this very old chart to her and she, she was a bit surprised that, okay, so it's really 20 meters, but uh, it's a risk area and maybe it's not exactly this amount, but we keep this value for precautions, you know, conditions for navigation and so on. So um, the buoy we used is PN Boya in Fortaleza, that boy that I mentioned, uh, nautical charts of Brazil plus Jebico database. Okay, because we have a domain near CRI state and they combine these two uh, bathymetry. Okay, so one shallow water and another one deep water by this global uh, bathymetry database. Wind fused by ERA interim at that time. We didn't have ERA 5. Uh, boundary conditions by Wave Watch 3, Heimkess, and then we, we run the model. Okay. This is a model verification of the buoy. So I think it's quite good. This, uh, this comparison, this is a significant wave height, peak period and the uh, mean direction. So there is a fairly good agreement. Uh, we can see here there are three curves and the one is a buoy, the other one is swan and the other one is swan best. Swan best is the, the tuned swan that uh, we you know, Luis uh, play a little bit with the source terms and uh, parameters and decide the best, um, what is the best uh, uh, setting. And that's the one I showed in the, another previous slide. Um, okay, there is a, just to mention here, there is a, some swell in this time here during this month. So from the north okay, here and some other uh, comparisons here. Um, okay, we selected five events, w w uh, which we call cases. The first, the first four of them are real ones. It happened. And uh, uh, we picked up uh, also a synthetic one. The number five is a, a, a delight situation because we wanted to test with this big, uh, large uh, frequency. Okay, so this is like 21 
seconds. I think Luis got this from an actual event and say, so the maximum is 21, so let's try 21. And then he also run this case with uh, synthetic uh, conditions here. And then the fourth, first are real ones that actually happened and then we simulated them. Okay, so these are the peak period, which I think the most important uh, uh, parameters here are this column here, all right? Um, and it is the uh, initial wave height, okay? Okay, so what is this figure here? Just to explain a little bit what is going on. The first one, you see the three C mounts, S1, S2, and S3. We have here the depth, 21 meters, 41, 53. And uh, you have, we have these four cases, okay? The first two, uh, wave from the southeast incident in the mounts and the number three and number four cases waves from the north all right um, and these patterns here show a um, significant wave height and we can see here there's a multiple uh, interaction between them okay for example in this case this wave from the north it uh, hits uh, the seamount one and the, the wave generated by this interaction also affects the wave fuse in C S3. Okay, so there's some multiple uh, interaction going on here. We can see very clearly in this uh, figure here, this uh, wake zone. Okay, so this shadow zone where the, uh, the wave height behind the seamount is uh, smaller than before it hits the seamount. Okay, this, uh, there's this characteristic. What more? Yeah, so let's move to the next one. Okay, so here we can take a look at the wave direction. Okay, so this is the, the bathymetry and this is the profile of the wave height. Okay, so we can have a very clear idea of the wave height amplification. It's high, but it's not as high as a synthetic case. So it's like a maximum 40% increase in wave height. And uh, we can also see this focusing of uh, of um, waves behind the, the seamount. So they are refraction, okay, and they interact again. Okay, I want to show you this uh, figure here that I was mentioned to you, okay. So this is uh, incidental on seamount three, and there are four points, we, four or five points we select and in this transect, and we can see here the profile of the wave height. So we have a peak and two and three peaks, okay. So there are something going on behind the, the seamounts which related to this uh, refraction of waves after the seamount and probably also with this uh, multiple interaction with the other ones. Uh, so it's something to, to point out. This is um, the synthetic case and I was talking to Jesus today and he was realized, he was telling me that uh, he was very interested in the seamounts, the, the top is very flat. So this is one of the case, right? So I think he was interested in geological interaction between the waves and the, the seamounts, but um, then it, it was clear to me. And this is very long waves, okay, and uh, HS of three meters. So you have this first peak and then some stabilization, then a second peak in the wave height. Um, okay, some perspectives. I think it would be very, very interesting to analyze what happens in Victoria, Trinidad Ridge, because it's a region with very, a lot of these seamounts and some very shallow, and Fernando de Noronha also, uh, to get accurate bathymetry, to see, get closer to reality, employ right, higher resolution uh, wave model, and finally, to compare this with uh, data, to measure data. So I think it's some of the things that we, uh, we think could be uh, follow, follow up to this one. Okay, so thank you very much. We have time for one question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Leandro, this uh, multiple peak peaks be behind uh, I, the sea mount, right? Yes. Uh, is uh, intriguing. Uh, it looks like diffraction pattern, right? Yes. Um, I, I think in the other work by by Sosa et al., 
there was a situation similar to this one that occurred when we have these long waves and uh, shallow seamounts. And in their work, we, are, we, we observe two peaks. But in our case, it's like three or four. So maybe it's related to the other... Um... How far apart they are? Sorry? How far apart they are? I think the, the, the summit of this seamount is around uh, 30 kilometers. No, the peaks, they, how far apart? It should be like a um, couple of uh, kilometers. Should be, if I'm not mistaken. I'm just trying to approximate. Maybe I'm wrong. Well, it's uh, in the optics, right? It looks uh, you would expect a diffraction pattern if you have two sources of the waves, right? Mm -hmm. It has to compare with the wavelength, so two kilometers probably too far, but who knows? Could be, yeah. Yeah, I have to check. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> of course, I had to ask a question, given that with uh, Asus, we work on this problem. And uh, can you go back a couple of slides? Yeah. This one, uh -huh. uh, the next one. Back? No, in the other direction. Yeah, this yeah. one. Mm -hmm. uh, there are difficulty. Uh, the top of the mountain seems to be flat for something like uh, 10 kilometer. Am I correct? Um, yes, yes, wrong. Yeah. yeah. Okay. In this case, uh, uh, the peak that you're showing, it looks more due to uh, shallowing water rather than the double refraction. Mm -hmm. and then the convergence right. behind, you know, because when we work out with ASUS, the, paper, the synthetic seamount, uh, mm -hmm. it was rather, I don't remember, how big was it? It was around it, but one, yeah, so, 500 meters, yeah, but something, this, uh -huh. something like that. And then you get uh, the two convergence behind, yeah. of course, in that. Uh, which, by that, uh, by the way, the uh, effectiveness of the convergence, depending if it is swell or it is uh, uh, this basically the spreading, because mm -hmm. the spectrum is very directionally spread. Of course, uh, everything is di different because every frequency converge as a different distance mm -hmm. behind. Of course, uh, one question about uh, the newspaper. The big olas, uh, blah, blah. The, the paper? Yeah. Ah, the newspaper? Yeah, that's my, yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah, yeah. this one, yeah. But uh, the, La Grandes Ondas de Doceara, de Seara, they were not due to the, uh, to the Seamount, but it's just no, a no, case of Northern just, Swell. Yeah, it's just to the, the wave climate of Seara. Yeah. It's, uh, just to show this uh, very historical note on the newspaper about this wave climate, just that, not seamount. And yeah, I'm surprised by the dimension, horizontal dimension of the flat top of uh -huh. the mountain that, that you've shown. Uh -huh. it's a 10 kilometers is a lot. Yeah. Okay, it's good to know because I, I have something, some work to be done uh, on this subject and this is very good information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Leandro, we talked about this uh, this subject before. Uh, I will ask you something related more to the when you show the several peaks with the map. Yeah, I, I was really amazed to see that, and maybe my question is not related to the waves, but but uh, more related to the geology of the region, this because one? normally uh, when we were no no the other one the, the, with the peaks previous. The, the no the profile of the of the the profiles of the bathymetry showing the no case file this one before 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 one one of the first ones the, the gray one showing the the map and the bathymetry that one that one uh, because I, I'm. Uh, Amazed to see how many peaks there are yeah. there. And actually, when we did that study, we were also driven by curiosity of the geological formation of these uh, sort of things. 
And uh, one of the things that we read is that uh, they normally when they, uh, the continental plates, they move, uh, basically these things sink a little bit, but they are also exposed to waves, and then they get flat because of the wave action right. until the moment they they go under under the the sea and the wave cannot erode it anymore. Right. And uh, I was wondering when to see this picture, if you have an idea of how the movement of the continental plates are somewhere here, because we have some cases like that, for instance, in the Galapagos, where you have the hot spot. Uh -huh. uh, somewhere in the west side, and the continental plate is moving to the east, yeah. and then the islands sink, yeah. and they they have this effect of uh, flatness on the top. Right. Uh, so I was wondering how the continental plates move here uh, right. to see this effect of the of the the one. How, do you I, have an I idea? I don't have this information. No. No, I didn't. I didn't go so I, I know that the Atlantic Ridge it's it's opening actually. So I don't know what, at the end, how the effect in the coast and the continental plate uh, mm. is, yeah. is doing that on the... It could be interesting to mm. look up this. I didn't... Uh, yeah, it. definitely. Yeah. I, I would be very curious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So we arrive to the last talk of the day, and we close with a local. Rodrigo will be presenting his work. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Francisco, for the introduction. The, the Rio de la Plata is uh, is a funnel with uh, 32 kilometers wide and goes to 220 kilometers uh, here. And it's about 20, uh, 280 kilometers long, but it's very, very shallow. It has about six uh, meters depth. Uh, 
So two main tributaries, the Uruguay and Paraná River, it discharge over 2,000 cubic meters of uh, water and saving concentration around 100 uh, milligrams of uh, of uh, kilograms, sorry, uh, milligrams of uh, per liter of mainly clay material. Due to its shallowness, uh, is uh, the hydrodynamic is mainly affected by waves. Uh, or in addition to the river discharge and the tides. So here you can see Montevideo. We are right now, we are here, and this is Montevideo Harbor. This is a satellite uh, image. Uh, we have the access channel here. And uh, the bathymetry in this in this area is very shallow. Also, we have uh, the six meters uh, medium of the of the Rio de la Plata, and we have two points. Uh, here is the there is a buoy and a tripod that we are going to focus on in this presentation. I'm going to show a field experiment. The currents in this area are mainly one meter per second. Wave hives are up to 2.5 meters with periods of five seconds, uh, indicating wind-generated uh, waves. And salinity with a range of from zero to 30 PSU and water temperature to, to from 10 to 26 uh, Celsius degrees. And the mud deposit in this area is 13 uh, meters thick. So we have a lot of mud, not only Suspended, uh, uh, not only clay suspended, but also mud in the in the bottom. The knowledge of the hydro and sediment dynamic is very important uh, in order to improve the sediment management in this area. So we designed this deployment uh, near a, an oceanographic buoy. Uh, we put it uh, a few hundred meters uh, near the buoy. In order to understand the sedimentation, the interaction between sediment uh, and waves and currents in the near bed, uh, in the near seabed, the the tripod was placed uh, thanks to scuba divers and a and a multicat uh, in the pin showing in here, named uh, Titan, and this tripod had a a few turbidimeters, an ADV, a CTD, and an ABS, which is an acoustic backscatter sensor that uh, profiles uh, the acoustic uh, backscatter in different frequencies. We wait for more than two months in this deployment. We've done that twice, so we have a, like five, five, near five months of data return to the site and extract some sediment uh, on the, of the bottom uh, in order to do some laboratory works. This is just a reminder of the wave climate and strong current we have there. It is a common practice to decompose the water motion into current uh, waves and turbulent components in order to know uh, the different time and spatial scales of the of the forces uh, that are applied in the sediment dynamics. Uh, this is a typical velocity time series uh, recorded by the ADB. The three components uh, are shown here. And also the, the pressure, the registered by the same instrument, but the the velocity was uh, measured nearly 30 cent 30 centimeter above the seabed we are very near the sea the seabed and the pressure is uh, almost 70 centimeters uh, 70 centimeters above the the, the seabed so uh, how to distinguish the wave the wave from the turbulent motion this is a hard question to answer some of you 
some of the presentation before uh, show this 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 uh, complicated uh, this complication. Uh, this is just a power spectral density function of the four time series I'm showing uh, in the up uh, panel. Uh, the turbulent cascade here uh, can can be seen. Uh, and we also uh, can observe the high, uh, oh, sorry, the high frequency tail of the wind-generated waves in in this in this spectrum. The by using a technique proposed by Thornton uh, in 1979, we uh, we use the cross the cross spectrum with the with, from the velocity components and the pressure that are measured uh, in in different heights and we use the coherent the coherence uh, of those signals uh, here here you can see the coherence of the signals sorry assuming that the spatial scales uh, of the wave motions that are a few tens of hundred uh, tens of meters uh, that are much bigger than the turbulent uh, motion near the the bottom which are a few decimeters in 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 this in these measurements uh, we we div we extract the wave energy from the turbulence energy in 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 those uh, different uh, at uh, measurements. So uh, this is a scatter plot uh, comparing uh, this idea using the ADV with the buoy we have near. And in the other panel, we, we can see the vertical component of the ADV, which is uh, which is we we are going to use it uh, as a as a proxy for turbulent uh, by applying a Hilbert transform in this in this the vertical velocity uh, instantaneous uh, velocity the signal we now have a non-stationary variance of the turbulence which can be used as a proxy for instantaneous turbulentic uh, kinetic energy in 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 this deploy we we've done some in acoustic inversion using the ABS, uh, and we saw that there is a sharp gradient uh, near the near the bottom uh, that suggests that it can it can uh, sediment suspend the uh, suspended sediment can uh, stratif may induce stratification and change the the turbulence near the the bottom. So how can we how can we try to how can we represent the same and is this is this happen and and how can we quantify quantify we use an analytical model proposed by styles and glenn in 2000 uh, that consider considers interaction of waves current and sediment self certification that use mainly maclean uh, and the effect of stable certification uh, is uh, included in a stability parameter. Uh, the vertical profile of the turbulent viscosity is divided in three regions, which I show here. These, these three regions, and as I, uh, and they are result of uh, of uh, data analysis uh, and and some numerical computation we've done with the data. In, in the right, you can see a comparison between uh, ne uh, ne neutral and stratified uh, hypothesis, and also with the current and the same and transfer, in order to see how, how it, it affects the same and transfer, at least. As a lower boundary condition, we use Smith and McLean uh, entrainment uh, formulation. In summary, uh, we uh, analyzed some some of the data and and we realized that indeed we have some some uh, 
stability parameter, uh, the stability parameter in, indicates that we have some uh, inhibition of the turbulence uh, transfer of the se of the sediment concentration uh, entrained from the from the bottom to the to the column. And no, okay. Uh, this is just one week of the field data, or the, a week that uh, is. Okay. I think it, it, it. Okay. Okay. This is one week of the field data in the two upper parts. These two panels uh, indicate the east component of the current measured by the wave buoy, the sorry, the ocean buoy and the ADV in the, near the bottom. The third panel indicates uh, the waves. Salinity and water temperature are next. And the three last panel indicate uh, the acoustic uh, backscatter of the AVS and the optical sensor estimation of the sediment concentration in the last in the last panel. So here I'm indicating a major erosive event due to waves, which I'm going to zoom in. Uh, now we can see uh, in this panel, in the fourth panel here, the, um, an estimation of the sediment suspended, uh, the con sediment uh, concentration uh, by, in, in by, uh, by using the ABS the acoustic backscatter sensor. And in the last panel, we see the sediment transport uh, estimated by the, by the analytical model. This, this event here uh, has moderate uh, waves, 1.5 1, 1 meters of uh, significant wave height and currents of 0.4 meters per second, uh, which present a high concentrated layer with concentration from 30 to up to 100 kilograms per cubic meters of sediment concentration, an erosion of, uh, sorry, of two centimeters in in a period of five or five hours, and and. Uh, the, the formation of a layer near the bottom up to 10 centimeters of fluid mud. Uh, in the upper part here, I'm going to show, sorry, I'm going to show these this two instances uh, in, in red dashed line. In the upper part, you can see the, the previous panel uh, as a, as a progression time. The upper panel here indicates this to really this turbulent uh, proxy we I mentioned before uh, using the Hilbert transformation. The second panel uh, shows the strong sediment dynamics in the near in the near uh, bed. Some pulses of high sediment concentration correlated with the shear stress in the in this panel, and there is a, a sharp gradient of uh, sediment concentration uh, near the five five centimeters above the seabed, and and we see uh, how it uh, how this feature of the profile of the sediment or concentration profile uh, inhibits the sediment transfer to the upper layer. At this stage, we, we start to, to develop the, the uh, uh, sh even sharper uh, sediment concentration uh, gradient. The pulses of sediment concentration are also uh, are also correlated with the shear stress. And very high concentration can be seen near the bottom, as I mentioned. The stratification seems to be even more significant uh, 
and we have this this sharp uh, gradient uh, with very concentrated sediment con with very uh, se uh, suspended sediment concentration in the last three to five centimeters. The you know, so to okay okay now conclusion sorry uh, supported by field data and some analytical models now we have a deeper understanding of the interaction between waves currents and sediment dynamics uh, when moderate uh, waves and currents uh, are present there is a high concentrated fluid map layer in this area uh, that can form can be formed near the, the bottom and confirm some previous hypotheses uh, we have in the late 80s that we we have the tools now to try to measure and understand during the mooring the sediment transport measurements uh, were able to explain the siltation, the siltation rates uh, in the access channel of the Montevideo port and to there is a little uh, take home message uh, we want to oh como que no sí. there is a little take home message here uh, self stratification uh, by sediment is important in the hydro and sediment dynamic reduce the turbulent mixing and impacts in the sediment transport wave boundary layer structure and self stratification are the main responsible of a high concentrated fluid map layer uh, in this area. And now I, I want to thank uh, all people uh, that was involved in this research. If you are not very tired, we have time for questions. Uh, I was wondering about something, uh, this night presentation, because an uh, interesting environment. You're talking about uh, viscous sediment, right? The co cohesive sediment. Yeah. Uh, do you have uh, any evidence uh, of wave dissipation due to wavy motion of the bottom? Because in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, there is a a case includes a wind wave as well, are tremendously attenuated because uh, passing in certain areas, there is a lot of viscous sediment, and the viscous sediment really acting as a break on the waves. And uh, do you have anything similar here? Well, we, we, we didn't do any field experiment on that uh, topic. I know uh, that uh, Rodrigo do some assumption on the on the models uh, he used to to propagate waves in in this region, but we we don't we don't have any experiment uh, conclusion in in this area, uh, and and this field uh, experiment was not designed in order to question that particular answer, but I I think maybe we can have some some ideas at least by using some analytical model because not the the data we use uh, did not uh, allow us to to know the the, the water uh, the motion of the of the, the of the water in in that in fact, part i was wondering when you put the tripod on the bottom does it st stay on the on the on the mud or you go inside the mud that no. is the solid it, bottom? It, it, it's we we put it with the crane and it uh, sinks. It sinks at at some point. We 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 were uh, <laughs> yeah yeah we cross fingers <laughs> and I something I I didn't mention the the we did this twice the second. Time we put, of course, we put more ex more instrument because we were we want to measure more, and it sinks a little more than the first one, and that uh, seems to be uh, 
more interesting data because of that, because we were very near the 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 seabed, but above. Okay, thank you. Any other question? You you didn't saw what? Yeah, it was five five third. Yeah, it was a five third, and I I put a uh, um also the I think it was in here here no this was okay this was uh, the five third and this is the the so, sorry the blue curve it's a uh, five third in this in this in this area but we, here we have waves so I, I ah this the this one you you mentioned oh this is the pressure it's not velocity it's it's the the fourth is the pressure so we were not in the mud layer we were uh, thirty centimeters above the seabed. And I show uh, some time, some instance where the fluid mud was about this, above this this measure, like ten centimeters, not 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 more. I think that the ADV is not; it doesn't uh, it, it does not uh, measure well in in the in the mud because of the acoustic attenuation. Mm -hmm. But the ADV measurement went above the mud. They didn't measure with the ADV inside. Inside the, the fluid mud. In the mud, yeah. Okay. Then, thank you very much, Rodrigo. Okay. Yeah. See you tomorrow at nine. And enjoy the, the rest of the day. Um, and the idea for tomorrow after the conference is go to the to the dinner. It's very close to, to here. We can go directly. Of if you want to, to go to the hotel and then go to the dinner, I'm going to remember the, the address by mail. Okay? Thank <laughs> you.